Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman uh, were certainly still on the staff at that point in time, and there was considerable resistance to their departure from the staff. Uh, I had told the president that I would not leave the staff unless they resigned, yet it was not until the 30th that those resignations occurred. In the Senate of the United States, a resolution to establish a select committee of the Senate to conduct an investigation and study of the extent, if any, to which illegal, improper, or unethical activities were engaged in by any persons acting individually or in combination with others in the presidential election of 1972 or any campaign, canvas, or other activity related to it. From Washington, NPAC brings you gavel-to-gavel videotape coverage of today's hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here is NPAC senior correspondent Robert McNeil. Good evening. If the Senate committee expected today to seriously test the credibility of its star witness, John Dean, it failed. The former White House counsel withstood five hours of questioning, and his damning charges against President Nixon remained for another day intact and officially unanswered. The White House remained publicly silent on Dean's sober accusations that the President knew of the Watergate cover-up for eight months, discussed offers of executive clemency to the Watergate Seven, and was aware of payoffs to ensure their silence. Dean said he was fully aware of the gravity of the charges he was making and realized that it was often his word alone against the President's. I am not a sinner seeking a confessional, Dean said. I am here to tell the truth. Whether it is the truth remains unknown. Dean's charges conflict directly on at least six claims of innocence or ignorance made publicly by the president. However, former White House Chief of Staff Bob Haldeman watched Dean on television and told newsmen it would eventually become clear that the president had no involvement in any cover-up. Although John Dean has been the sole witness for two very long days now, the committee is just starting to test his testimony against other sources. So far, as Robin said, the White House has refused to comment on the story. Two lawyers and U.S. District Judge Charles Ritchie have all denied Dean's story of yesterday that the lawyers convinced Judge Ritchie to handle the Democrats' civil suit to the advantage of the White House. Ritchie called that suggestion poppycock. Charles Colson says that Dean's testimony is so, so full of holes that it resembles Swiss cheese. But when asked specifically about Dean's allegation that Colson sought executive clemency guarantees for E. Howard Hunt, Colson says it isn't true, but then adds that it isn't a lie either. Now, the White House has submitted a series of questions it wants the committee to ask Dean, but so far, nobody's used them. Committee member Daniel Inouye of Hawaii, a Democrat, says he thinks the White House questions are worth using. He told NPAC's Peter Kay and other reporters that the questions are in, in a lengthy memorandum that originated with the current White House counsel, Leonard Garment. Apparently no one wants to touch it. I, I see no reason why. I think it's appropriate that uh, this memo properly identified be used in this hearing. You think it's a little more appropriate for a Republican or a Democrat to ask those questions? I think it makes no difference. Have you read those questions submitted by the White House Senator? Yes, I have. Can you give us a general idea of, of what they are? Well, in, in most instances, uh, it would be a rehash of what has been going on. But if you follow the, um, the questioning, it would appear that uh, they would like to prove that Mr. Dean was the brains of it all. In other words, that he was responsible and it didn't go beyond him? And that he gave bad advice. Inouye says that if no one else has put the White House questions to Dean, by the time Inouye gets his turn at bat, that he'll ask them himself with what he calls proper labeling. Watching the session with us today was Stephen Hess, former Nixon aide, author, and currently a Brookings Institution senior fellow specializing in politics and urban affairs. Mr. Hess, what should we look for tonight, do you think, uh, as we watch today's session? Well, in John Dean's second day in the witness chair, no one laid a glove on him. Well, what do you think that was? Uh, what, what would you attribute that to, the fact that uh, Mr. Dean is a great witness or the inabilities of the people who asked him the questions? I think the latter. I think because the individual senators today chose to do their own thing, and so they, they jump from subject to subject, compounded by sloppy cross-examination, poor homework, and lack of follow-up. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hess. Obviously, uh, 
you can see for yourself here in a few minutes, and you may not agree, or you may you may or may not agree. At any rate, we'll be back uh, to discuss uh, this and other aspects with Mr. Hess at the close of tonight's replay, and he will be joined at that time by John Kramer of the Georgetown University Law Faculty here in Washington. Today's testimony came in response to questions by both majority and minority counsel and three senators. Here is NPAC's hour-by-hour hour rundown of the testimony. In the opening hour, John Dean admits that even though he was the White House representative at strategy sessions, he did not try to stop any of Gordon Liddy's wiretap plans. In addition, he says that in March, after he described the details of the cover-up to the president, Mr. Nixon did not try to stop it. In the second hour, Dean says he withheld some information from the prosecutors because he expected President Nixon to come forward with his version of what happened. He says that he drew up a memo listing 15 people implicated in the break-in or cover-up, 10 of them lawyers. In hour number three, Dean tells Senator Weicker that he did implement the first step of a domestic spy plan. Under questioning, he tells of a printout on George McGovern's activities he received from the Secret Service. In the fourth hour, Dean says the president was less than accurate in telling what he knew about the cover-up in April and May of this year. Asked to characterize the Watergate burglary, Dean said it was the opening act of one of America's great tragedies. In the fifth and final hour of the hearing, Dean says he's been the victim of a character assassination, including private investigators interviewing his friends. And Dean says that he decided to tell all he knew about the cover-up when he realized he would be called before a grand jury and he was not capable of perjury. And now to the Senate caucus room and Chairman, Senator Sam Irvin. Question the witness. Mr. Dean, you stated, did you not, that well before the so-called Liddy plan spelled out in meetings on January 27 and February 4, 1972, that there was an atmosphere in the White House conducive to the bugging and break-in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters. Is that true? That is correct. Let me very briefly summarize the key plans and activities which you state in your statement created such an atmosphere. The first, I understand, was an overall intelligence plan developed by the time you had already arrived at the White House in July of 1970 by White House leadership, or including White House leadership, to deal with internal security and domestic dissent, which included such activities as illegal break-in and wiretapping. And these are the papers which I understand you submitted to Judge Sirica and which this committee has received from Judge Sirica. That is correct, and I believe that was indicative of a concern that existed regarding that particular area of, of problem. Then, then there was the so-called plumbers operation set up in the White House in 1971 under Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Krogh, uh, utilizing Mr. Hunt and Mr. Liddy to investigate leaks such as the Pentagon paper leaks, which utilized such tactics as break-ins, photographing, and bugging. And then there was opera Operation Sandwich, recommended by Mr. Caulfield but never finally approved, which had covert features to it such as the use of bag men and wiretapping. Now, generally, is that the context in which you describe the atmosphere uh, that was conducive to such activities as break-ins and wiretapping in the White I, House? I think, Mr. Dash, you have capsulized some of the, the high points of the concerns I expressed yesterday. Well, I'm attempting just to capsulize and not go over your lengthy statement. Therefore, in addition to your testimony about the President and the White House staff members' obsession over demonstrators and leaks. Uh, is this then a brief and fair summary, in a nutshell, of the kind of practices the President, to some extent, and White House officials such as Holden and Ehrlichman had approved or considered to crush internal dissent or obtain political intelligence? I think that this is indicative, Mr. Dash, of the fact that the White House often took it upon itself to obtain information or resolve a problem when it felt that an agency of the government was incapable or unsatisfactory in dealing with the problem, that the uh, White House itself felt that they were quite capable of handling the problem and thereupon would handle the problem. 
Well, therefore, Mr. Dean, when Liddy, Hunt, McCord, and their crew broke into the Watergate in May and June of 1972, this really was not an extraordinary action from the standpoint of the White House, which had approved or engaged in similar missions for a period of at least two years prior to the Watergate, was it? Well, as I believe I described in my statement yesterday, the preceding things that had occurred, in a sense, were precursors. But I think that the fact that the break-in occurred was not as a result of a conscious design as much as an accident of a culmination of many of these elements. I understand that, but recognizing that some of these earlier plans had the approval of such things as break-ins and, and wiretapping and things of that, covert activities, uh, the break-in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters was not extraordinary in context of those plans. Is that, that not is true? correct, sir. And therefore, on the basis of your own statement, would it be fair to say that the true concern of those who approved such tactics in the past, such as Mr. Haldeman Ehrlichman, as you've stated, would not be that, the, that there was a break-in, but that the Committee for the Re-election of President burglars had been caught at it? He said the concern was... Well, the concern really was that they had been caught rather than they'd broken in. I think that is correct. Now, let us examine, Mr. Dean, your denial of your own complicity in the Watergate break-in itself in May and June of 1972. Is it not true that although you expressed amazement at the mind-boggling, as you described it, Liddy plan, presented in a show-and-tell meeting in the Attorney General's office on January 27, 1972, you, along with Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Magruder, did encourage Liddy to scale down this plan and budget, and you didn't tell them to stop the activity. That's correct, and I might add that uh, with hindsight, as I think I indicated in my statement yesterday, I probably should have been much more forceful in trying to stop the plan at that point when I, in fact, myself realized it was something that should not occur. Well, Mr. Dean, after the scaled-down Liddy plan presented in Mitchell's office in February 4, 72, which did not include the activities of mugging, uh, of, uh, uh, kidnapping, or prostitution, but primarily electronic surveillance or break-ins, although you say you disassociated yourself from it, as the White House representative, you did not, in fact, tell Liddy to stop it. That is correct. And although you say that you told Haldeman that the White House should not be involved with the plan, you did not recommend that Haldeman put a stop to it, which you knew he could if he wanted to. Well, again, I must rely on hindsight. Uh, given the circumstances that were existing at the time, I felt that someone wanted this. I knew I didn't want it. I knew I had put uh, those on notice involved that I was going to have no part in it. I had similarly, and with regard to Operation Sandwich, let it die a natural death. I assumed the same thing was going to happen. Quite obviously, it did not happen. But so far as Liddy was concerned, Mr. Dean, your actions were consistent, were they not, with his getting the impression that you were merely establishing deniability for the Attorney General and the White House should the plans go forward. Is that not true? I, I don't know if Mr. Liddy had that impression or not. Uh, Would it be consistent with his having that impression? He could have well had that impression, yes. Now, during January and June of 1972, did you in fact know that Mr. Magruder, who has testified before this committee, was giving Gordon Strawn full reports of the Liddy plan, including the break-in and the fruits of the break-in? Uh, no, I did not. I, I was just, while you were asking that question, I was thinking about your last question still, and I recalled something that Mr. Krogh had told me when I first discussed with him Mr. Liddy going over to the re-election committee. He told me that Gordon Liddy is a man who needs guidance. Uh, Gordon Liddy didn't get any guidance that I can see while he was there from anyone that I know, and that could explain partially the reason that he was sent over to prepare one thing and something else evolved unbeknownst to those who'd sent him over. But, but you didn't give him any guidance yourself? Did you? No, I did not. Now, going back to my next question, 
I think you, you've answered the question that you did not know that between the period of J January to June 1972 that Mr. Magruder, according to his own testimony here, was giving reports to Mr. Gordon Strawn of the Liddy Plan and, in fact, the break-in and the fruits of the break-in. Now, in fact, after the June 17 break-in, and more specifically on June 19, I think your statement indicates that you were told by Mr. Strawn that he destroyed, at the direction of Mr. Haldeman, certain intelligence reports that came from the CRP. Is that not true? That is correct. And so that at that time, you did have some knowledge of Mr. Strawn's knowledge. That is correct. Could you tell the committee exactly what Mr. Strawn's role in the White House was and his activities, responsibilities? Mr. Strawn was placed on Mr. Haldeman's staff to serve as the liaison uh, individual from the White House to the reelection committee and to deal with other members of the White House staff who were working on uh, problems relating to directly to the political phases of the re-election problem. Uh, I was aware of the fact that he was having frequent contact with Mr. Magruder regarding the re-election committee, that he would receive copies of documents that any of us would send regarding election law problems or other people would send uh, to the re-election committee so that he was aware of everything that was going out of the White House as well as coming into the White House from the re-election committee. But how close was his relationship with Mr. Mr. Haldeman? What was his responsibility to Mr. Haldeman? Well, I assume that from the time he went on, it was a, it was a regular reporting relationship. Uh, Mr. Haldeman is an excellent manager of, of people. I recall that uh, one document I submitted to you yesterday of a meeting that occurred in May of 1971 uh, evidence is that when there was a meeting that occurred in Mr. Holloman's office, Mr. Strawn obviously took rather complete notes of the meeting and sent me a copy of the meeting. I was unaware of the fact that he was even taking notes at the meeting. Well, therefore, if Strawn did in fact receive reports from Magruder in the Liddy operation, do you have an opinion as to whether he would have forwarded these reports to Mr. Holloman? I only have an opinion, well, Mr. Dash. Well, uh, what is that opinion? My opinion is that, uh, uh, that he would uh, report everything he knew in some form to Mr. Haldeman. And did you know what Mr. Haldeman's relationships and duties were with the President during the period January to June 1972? Well, I think that everybody who worked at the White House was generally aware of the fact that Mr. Haldeman was the, the virtual link between a number of a large number of the White House staff and the president as to what would go into the president that he would take and summarize and boil down and report to the president regularly all information that was pertinent and important that should come to the president's attention. What was the relationship in matter of time that Mr. Holman had with the president? Was it a daily relationship, a weekly? What? What was his contact with the I president? I would say that, the, that the Mr. Haldeman spent more time with the president than any other member of the White House staff. Now, therefore, do you have an opinion as to whether it w Mr. Haldeman would have reported the information he received from Strawn about the DNC break-in plan and the break-in itself to the president? An opinion based on your knowledge of his relationship to the president. I believe he probably would have reported it. I want to ask you some questions, Mr. Dean, about your handling of cash given to you by Mr. Richard Howard in the amount of $15,200, which you have included in your statement. To your knowledge, this money came from the $350,000 sent to the White House before April 7, 72, from Sloan Safe. Is that not true? That's correct. I didn't know it at the time it was given to me, but I later learned that that was the, the source of the money. Now. To your knowledge, $22,000 had been taken from this amount to pay for advertising, but that only 6800 was in fact used, leaving a balance of 15200 That is correct. How did it come about that you were given this $15,200 in cash? Um, the week after, or during the week immediately following the break-in, Mr. Strawn and Mr. Howard came to my office uh, and said that they had some cash and that they asked me to be the custodian for the cash. They were not terribly explicit at that time, 
Uh, I told Mr. Strawn I would keep the cash and be accountable for the cash. Do you know why they gave it to you rather than put it back in the original pot of the $350,000? No, I do not. I know. What did, what, did, what did you do with the money? I put it in my safe. I think you've already told us in your statement that you took about $4,800, as I understand, from the $15,200 for your wedding, honeymoon, and personal expenses, leaving an IOU personal check in the safe. Uh, Mr. Dean, did you ever repay this amount? I did not repay it until I uh, opened a trustee account when a subsequent check was negotiated uh, to make the, the funds whole at that time, and that was in April of this year. Now, there came a time, did it not, Mr. Dean, when the $350,000 under Holderman's control was needed for payoff money. And you suggested that before any of it was sent back to the committee or Mr. LaRue, that it be made whole again with regard to the $22,000 that had been taken out of it. That's correct. Those discussions uh, began in as early as ju late July, August of 1972, right. about making the funds whole. And wasn't, it your, and wasn't it your suggestion, Mr. Dean, or one that you approved of, that Mr. Stans of the Finance Committee for the re-election of the President should provide this $22,000 from the committee funds to send back over to the White House to make the $350,000 whole. That is correct. Since you had in your safe 15200 from the original pot, why did you not return it and request the stands only the amount paid for the advertisement, which was only $6,800? Well, you have to go back in the time sequence again. There was a request for any and all available cash far before they started seeking the $350,000 cash fund when Mr. Kambach was collecting cash. Uh, Mr. Stans had some money that was used. Uh, they were looking anywhere they could look to find any available cash. It was at this point I knew that I had the, the uh, 15 2 in my safe, and I decided at that time that I was not going to let that money be used for that purpose because I did not want to become further involved in that particular aspect of the cover-up. And you made that decision despite the fact that you had been a key figure in getting Mr. Kalmbach involved in the original payoff. That is correct. Now, in your statement, you've described a number of meetings and activities occurring immediately after the arrest of the CRP burglars in the Democratic National Committee headquarters in Watergate on June 17, 72, and continuing for several months thereafter involving such persons as Mr. Holderman, Mr. Ehrlichman, Mr. Colson, Mr. Mardian, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. LaRue, Mr. Magruder, yourself, and others. Isn't it your testimony that this flurry of activity represented a massive cover-up operation to prevent the prosecutors, the FBI, and the public from learning of the involvement of high White House or CRP officials, either in the Watergate break-in or embarrassing earlier illegal activities of a similar nature, such as the Ellsberg break-in. That is correct, Mr. Ash. And did not this cover-up require a number of strategies, such as perjury and subordination of perjury of a person like Magruder and Porter and others, and false statements to the FBI and the prosecutors, payoffs to the indicted defendants to maintain their silence, limiting the FBI inquiry so they would not stumble on other illegal intelligent activities of the White House. That is correct. And is it not true that you played a role in all of these cover-up activities? That is correct. Did you do these things on your own initiative, Mr. Dean, or at any direction of anybody else? I uh, would have to say, to describe it, that I inherited a situation. The cover-up was in operation when I returned uh, to my office on Monday the 19th. And it just became an instant way of life at that point in time, and I participated in it and uh, engaged in these activities along with the others. I was taking instructions. I from was, whom were you taking instructions? I was taking instructions from Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman. I was taking instructions and suggestions from Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Mardian. Uh, I was a conveyor of 
messages back and forth between each group, and at times I was making suggestions myself. Mr. Dean, I don't think the record is clear from your statement. You held an impressive title, Counsel for the President, I understand had quite a big office. But could you tell us just what, in fact, was your relationship with Mr. Haldeman and Ehrlichman and your position at the White House? Well, I learned after I went to the White House that the title was probably the best part of the job. Uh, the, uh, my reporting relationship was directly to Mr. Haldeman, but because Mr. Ehrlichman had formerly been the counsel, he maintained a, a very active interest in many of the things of the counsel's office, so that most of the work of the counsel's office was really related to uh, technical legal problems, making sure that the I's were crossed and, or the, the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed on, on, on uh, certain documents to uh, examine questions on timing, on, on pocket vetoes, uh, to work with the Department of Justice in making sure that they were preparing given legal positions on issues that were of importance to the, to the White House. I had a number of dealings with uh, the persons who were working on the Nixon Foundation and did some personal work on the President's San Clemente properties and other personal things like that for the President where I was the conduit to the law firm that was handling this for the President. But I would not say that it was a, uh, a policy-making position by any means. And to a large extent, you were in fact reporting to either Mr. Her Ehrlichman or Mr. Haldeman. That is correct. Now, given such a massive cover-up, which you've included in your statement, and that it was underway with the well, approval... Mr. Dash, I might add one thing. There was a, one role that the office had also, and that was what I describe as a firefighting role. For example, after the Lithuanian defector uh, situation came up, Ehrlichman and Haldeman, and, and I assume the President, would set the policy. And after they had finished with their interest in the matter, I was the man who had the sort of the, the cleanup on the details. This happened also, for example, with the Cali case. After the initial flurry, the decisions had all been made. Some of the decisions I didn't fully agree with, but I'd had my, you know, I'd sent memos in. Decisions were made, and then I was the guy who had to answer the 100,000 letters that came in. Uh, so I'd add that footnote. Well, I'd right, taken that into, into the context. Giving such, as I was beginning to state, such a, such a massive cover-up operation that was underway, with the approval and with the direction at times of Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, Mr. Mitchell. Do you have an opinion, and I'm asking at this point, and just an opinion, as to whether the President would have been informed of this cover-up operation from its inception? Mr. Dash, I, I think it's unfair to ask me opinions. Uh, I can surmise the way I know the, the White House operated. I'll say this, that in my statement, I indicated that I had reached a, a conclusion in my own mind when I went to the Attorney General, for example, that this thing might well go right to the President. I would say that that evidence is an opinion, uh, that I was concerned that it did, knowing how the, the White House operated, knowing how the, uh, uh, the reporting of information went up to the President. Well, the question is put to you just on the basis of your knowledge, your intimate knowledge, I take it, of how the White House operated and what Mr. Haldeman's relationship with the President was, as you've already testified. But actually, according to your own statement, in fact, you learned firsthand, did you not, that the President did know of the cover-up when you met with him on September 15, 1972, the day the indictments came down, cutting off the involvement at Liddy. Is that not so? That is correct. Now, when the President told you on September 15th, as you say in your statement, that Bob Haldeman had kept him posted on your handling of the Watergate case and complimented you on the good job you had done and expressed his appreciation on the difficulty of your tasks, did you have any doubt in your mind what the President was talking about? No, I did not. Indeed, Mr. Haldeman not only knew about how you had handled the Watergate case, but in effect helped direct the operation, did he not? which included payoffs to defendants, perjury, and limiting the FBI investigation. I don't believe by September 15th that the uh, $350,000 payment had been involved, but the Kambach payment had been involved, so I'd say yes, that he had uh, 
as well as being aware of the perjury Well, situation. actually, the payoffs began fairly early, not the, yes. not the final ones. That's right. Now, if the president had been kept it, had been kept posted by Mr. Haldeman as to how you were handling the Watergate case, he would have known of his illegal acts and, according to your statement, was in fact congratulating you for your successful performance of these acts. Would that not be true from your point of view? I think that's true. Now, even further, Mr. Dean, you say in your statement that you told the president on that occasion, September the 15th, with regard to the civil suit filed by the Democratic National Committee, that the lawyers for the Committee for the Re-election of the President had been making ex-party contacts with the federal judge handling the case, and the judge was understanding and trying to be accommodating. Now, putting it bluntly, Mr. Dean, were you not telling the President that you understood that the CRP had a, quote, fix, unquote, in with the judge? I don't think, Mr. Dash, I'd use the word fix. I think that I would, I was indicating to the president that the, the lawyers had some influence on the handling of the case and that they could slow down the case uh, so there would not be an embarrassment before the election. When I think of the word fix, I think that that means the outcome of the case is going to be influenced. I don't know that that was the fact because I don't know the specifics and I don't believe that to be the case. Rather, it was a process whereby the, they might get some favorable rulings out of the judge to slow it down before the election. You would soften the word to influence rather than fix? Yes, I would. All right. Now, according to your statement, uh, did the president not say to you on being apprised of this special influence with the judge, well, that's helpful? He said something to that effect. Yes, that's correct. Therefore, Mr. Dean, whatever doubts you may have had prior to September 15th about the president's involvement in the cover-up, did you have any doubts yourself about this after September the 15th? No, I did not. Is it not true, Mr. Dean, that based on the statement you have given this committee, that not only did the president express his approval to you on September 15th of your cover-up activities leading to an indictment of no one higher than Liddy, but after September 15th, the president took an active part in the cover-up? Well, let me briefly summarize, and very briefly, your statements concerning this, and please tell me if this is an accurate summary of what you have stated in your long statement. One, after telling the President on September 15 that you could not assure that the cover-up would not unravel, it in fact did begin to unravel in January 1973 when Hunt pressed for a promise of executive clemency, and that you learned from Mr. Ehrlichman in January and from the President himself on March 13, 1973, that the President, when apprised of Hunt's pressure, authorized giving Hunt assurances concerning executive clemency. Despite your explicit statement in your meeting with the President on February 28, 1973, of your culpability for obstruction of justice, the President, according to your statement, reassured you that you had no legal problems. In your meeting with the President on March 13, when you apprised the President of increasing payoff demands from Mr. Hunt, which you estimated would cost as much as $1 million, the President, according to your statement, responded that that amount of money would be no problem and inquired as to how such payments could be made, leading to a discussion by you in the presence of the President of laundering money and secret drops. And despite your lengthy explanations to the President when you met with him on March 21st concerning the criminal involvement of various White House and CRP officials, including Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, Mr. Colson, yourself, Mr. Gruder, and the increased demands for payoff money requiring more cover-up activities on the part of the White House, the President took no affirmative action to end the cover-up. And that, indeed, the President made according to your statement, specific plans to deal with this select committee of the Senate to prevent it from being effective and sought to further the cover-up by attempting to have Mr. Mitchell acknowledge his guilt in approving the Liddy plan with the hope that this would satisfy 
the various investigating bodies. And finally, when you would not continue to participate in the cover-up, according to your statement, but retained counsel and went to the United States Attorney's Office and began to tell what you knew about the Watergate case, the President sought to protect Mr. Haldeman Ehrlichman, who had been clearly implicated by you, and asked that you submit to him a letter of resignation. Is that a fair summary or brief though it may be in terms of your long statement of the meetings you have with the President and the information you had with him? Yes, sir, it is. Why is it that you waited until April the 15th before you told the prosecutors of your knowledge of the President's involvement? I didn't tell them on, it was after April 15th I did, preceding that time, uh, my lawyer and I had first of all had discussions about matters of executive privilege, attorney-client privilege, and national security matters. We saw there were legal problems, although we had resolved in our own mind that these were not problems as far as preventing necessary uh, disclosures of the contents of some of these conversations. However, I must be very candid that I was hopeful that the President himself would step forward and tell of his involvement in some of these things. Now, Mr. Dean, you opened up your statement when you first began to testify before this committee yesterday by purporting to soften the blow concerning the President by stating that you do not believe the President realized the full implications of his involvement. Now, if you have told the truth before this committee about what the President said to you on September 15th and what you said to him, and as to the subsequent meetings you had with the President, can you honestly believe that the President, as a lawyer and a sophisticated man in politics, was not aware of the full implications of the cover-up activities? Mr. Dash, I think my opening remarks were more directed at the human side of the situation than the legal side of the situation, that he had, uh, didn't realize the implications as far as what this would mean for people he'd worked with for a number of years, people he was very fond of, and I wasn't necessarily referring to the, the full le legal implications of some of his activities. Well, do you have an, a belief as to whether or not he did have knowledge of the implications, the legal implications of this cover-up activity? I can't put myself in the President's mind. Uh, Based on the facts you've given this committee? Based on the facts I've given this committee, I would think the President would certainly have some appreciation of the legal problems involved, yes, indeed. Is this the first time, Mr. Dean, you've told your story about your involvement and the involvement of others, including the President, under oath? That is correct. Concluding, of course, the executive session that you appeared before this committee. That is correct. Now, it is obvious to you, is it not, that your principal assertions, which constitute accusations against the President of the United States, of involvement in the cover-up of the Watergate case, are based almost solely on your own account of either private meetings with the President or meetings with Mr. Haldeman and Ehrlichman where they were present. That's correct. I would add to the fact that I was aware of the fact that often when <clears throat> I was in a meeting with Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman that Mr. Haldeman was taking notes and often those notes uh, or immediately following the meeting uh, those notes were taken with Mr. Haldeman directly into the President's office, but of course I wasn't present at the time in some of those discussions. Do you have any copies or, of those notes? No, sir, I do not. Uh, are you aware of any other records of the content of these meetings which are the focus of your statement? Uh, one of the meetings I had in March, uh, early March of this year, I did prepare notes and some of the notes were taken uh, because I had a number of instructions from the President. And based on those, I did make notes. I'm also aware, not aware, but I was told by the government prosecutors that the president had taped a conversation between himself and, uh, and me, and that uh, as a result of that, there apparently there may be a tape in existence, and I believe that would be the April 15th meeting that would record uh, that conversation. The notes you refer to, have they been submitted to this committee? Uh, I don't believe they have, but they're available. They're, they're in my testimony, of course, the substance of the notes. Would but you, they certainly are available for the committee. Would you submit them as an exhibit to this yes, committee? I'd be happy to. 
Are written or recorded records of such conversations with the President regularly made at such meetings? Not to my knowledge. Officially? No. Regularly? No. I would say this, that uh, often after a presidential meeting, uh, when there's a staff member present, not necessarily staff meetings, but when outsiders come in and there's a staff member present, a, a summary is made of the meeting, but of course these aren't, uh, uh, these were not the types of meetings where summaries would be made. Mr. Dean, you've made serious charges before the committee. Do you have any special motive in making these charges, such as a hope for immunity before the prosecutors? You have already have received immunity before this committee, which is only use immunity, and does not prevent your being prosecuted for any crimes that the prosecutors have evidence against you. Do you have any motive in making these charges against the President based on the fact that this may lead to giving you immunity from the prosecutors? Mr. Dash, I've been asked to give testimony. Uh, that testimony happens to involve the President of the United States. I don't plan to use, I have no motive in giving that testimony to try to obtain immunity from the prosecutors, no, sir. Now, I guess you're fully aware, Mr. Dean, of the gravity of the charges you have made under oath against the highest official of our land, the President of the United States. Yes, I am. And being so aware, do you still stand on your statement? Yes, I do. Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. I might add this, Mr. Dash. I realize it's almost an impossible task if it's one man against the other that I'm up against, and it's not a very pleasant situation, but I can only speak what I know to be the facts, and that's what I'm providing this committee. So the committee's chief counsel, Samuel Dash, continues to pursue that big question, how involved was the president? He also raised questions about Dean's motives and credibility. There will be much more along these lines as the hearings unfold. Public television's coverage will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. As the committee continues its questioning of former White House Counsel John Dean, it is the turn of Republican Counsel Fred Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dean, you have, of course, made some serious accusations with regard to cover-up of criminal activities, and we have heard other testimony about 
the cover-up of certain criminal activities. <clears throat> and, of course, the responsibility for prosecuting those criminal activities did lie with the Department of Justice. I'd like to ask you a few questions based upon some of your testimony yesterday concerning your contact with Mr. Peterson. Uh, did I remember correctly that on the 19th or 20th of June you first uh, had contact with Mr. Peterson about the Watergate break-in investigation? The first time I had contact with Mr. Peterson is when the Attorney General called Mr. Peterson to his office, and that was either on the 19th or the 20th. Did I recall your testimony correctly that you told him that you did not believe the White House, the White House could stand a wide-open investigation? I told him I'd, we discussed the implications of a wide-open investigation and how embarrassing that could be in an election year. That is correct. Well, did he indicate to you in any way that he would carry out anything less than a wide-open investigation of this matter? As I testified yesterday, I don't recall Mr. Peterson saying anything specific I left the meeting with an impression that Mr. Peterson would be fair in an investigation of the White House, and that that interpretation of fairness would mean that we wouldn't have an investigation of everything that had occurred at the White House for four years. That was your interpretation of, of, of the use of the phrase wide open investigation? That is correct. I would think that a wide open investigation would mean a complete, thorough investigation of the, of the charges that were going around at that time. and. Specifically, all of the ramifications of the break-in of the DNC. Uh, do I understand your testimony that you were only concerned that he not go back into the prior four years and bring up unrelated matters? Well, Mr. That had Tom, nothing yeah. to do with this particular incident. I'm, I'm trying to recall a, a meeting that, of course, over a year ago, and the highlights of my recollection at that point, of course, are that uh, we discussed what it would mean if this investigation led all the way to the to the president. I had did you uh, did you discuss pardon me, did you discuss the the possibility of presidential involvement with him? I thought you said yesterday that you th had that in your own mind, but th that you did not discuss that with him at that time. I believe I discussed it with Kleindienst and Kleindienst conveyed my concern to Mr. Peterson, and it's very possible that it was re raised again when Mr. Peterson and I departed from Mr. Kleindienst's office, uh, I do recall the note that the meeting ended on that I hoped that my fears, suspecting the worst, were not true. Did you have the impression when you talked to Mr. Kleindienst and to Mr. Peterson that, that Mr. Ehrlichman uh, was depending upon you to, to take care of the situation or get them to take care of the situation so that uh, the White House would not be hurt? At this point, I was merely a messenger. I was uh, a conveyor of information back and forth, and I was being sent on different assignments to find out information at this point in time. Uh, when I talked to Ehrlichman and he asked me to find out what the Justice Department was doing, uh, he wanted to find out how extensive their investigation was. was. As time evolved, there was frequent criticism of the, of the scope of the investigation by Mr. Ehrlichman. Uh, there was very clearly the concern at the White House that the investigation would come right back into the White House. You testified that you told Mr. Peterson that you had, in fact, delivered certain documents to, to Patrick Gray uh, that you did not discuss with Mr. Silbert or anyone else, that you had delivered them those documents to him and no one else knew about it, I presume, except Mr. Ehrlichman. Do you know what he did after that, whether or not he made inquiry uh, of Mr. Gray, for example, as to whether or not this, in fact, was true? I have heard after the fact, uh, in my discussions with the prosecutors this spring about the matter, that apparently Mr. Peterson went to Mr. Gray and immediately raised it with Mr. Gray. And at that point in time, Mr. Gray denied to Mr. Peterson that he had ever received such documents. So I assume that happened very shortly after I had reported it to Mr. Peterson. And as I testified yesterday also, shortly after I had reported it, Mr. Gray came to me at a luncheon at the Department of Justice and said, uh, hang tight, John, with regard to that matter. <clears throat> you mentioned a telephone call by Mr. Ehrlichman Mr. Peterson about Stans having to go down and testify before the grand jury. 
some to the effect that uh, Silbert uh, was acting like a local prosecutor, Mr. Stan should not be treated this way, and so forth, and used rather abrasive terms of Mr. Peterson. Uh, do you know uh, what Mr. Peterson's response to Mr. Ehrlichman was uh, during that conversation? I, I do not know, but I, I can only speculate that uh, uh, Mr. Peterson isn't the type of man who is uh, easily pushed around. And I don't know what the sum and substance of it was. I subsequently called Mr. Peterson myself after I departed Mr. Ehrlichman's office and apologized for the call. And Peterson didn't seem particularly upset by the fact that he'd received the call. When I talked to him, he was, he was annoyed uh, at Ehrlichman. But I might also add that Mr. Ehrlichman had been sort of riding hard on the Department of Justice for some time. And there was a... Uh, a certain degree of animosity between Ehrlichman and the department. So as far as uh, the reason I'm making these inquiries, uh, his name was mentioned, and I, I think it was rather un, unclear, uh, at least to me anyway, as I understand your, your, your statement now is that based upon your knowledge, you know of no impropriety in conducting his part of the investigation on Mr. Peterson's part. I know of no impropriety. I think he tried to be very fair with the White House in dealing with the White House and the, the fact that we had an investigation going on in a political year that uh, could result in embarrassments on a countless occasions. The, the entire arrangement to have the, uh, the White House staff, for example, appear at the Department of Justice rather than go to the courthouse was merely designed to save the fact that the embarrassment that would arise politically of members of the White House staff appearing at the courthouse all the cameras and pictures and speculation and the like that would run from that. That was avoided by simulating the grand jury situation in Mr. Peterson's conference room. You mentioned also Mr. Ziegler, and of course we all know the statements that he continually made concerning this matter. Who was supplying Mr. Ziegler his information? I would say that basically I supplied uh, a large amount of it. I think that Mr. Ziegler would check on many times with, with uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, sometimes with Mr. Haldeman, and often with the President himself. He would check out a, a given statement. The times I was called, as I say, often, not on a daily basis by any means, but with some frequency, and that was how that Ziegler could, could sort of wade through a story without being factual, but without uh, actually going out and lying on a given matter, how he could hedge and, and bob and weave. And I think that well, the exhibit that, uh, that I submitted is very typical of the type of approach that he would take. He would take an, you know, an offensive approach rather than uh, to really admit a given set of facts because he couldn't, you know, I'd tell him he couldn't uh, admit the facts. Did, I'm, did Mr. Ziegler know the truth? No, he did not. In fact, uh, that was a very, very difficult situation. Mr. Ziegler, on countless occasions, asked me to brief him. I, on several occasions, asked Mr. Ehrlichman if I could brief Ziegler. I was given very specific instructions that I was not to brief Ziegler. In fact, this briefing of other people occurred on a number of occasions. It occurred in connection with uh, Mr. Johnson visiting with, with uh, Wally Johnson. It occurred with regard to Clark McGregor before he went to the, actually while he was at the Republican National Convention, he was very desirous of knowing the facts. He was having intense press inquiry at that point in time. And at one, one time he called me to his room and he said, I have to have the facts. Well, I called Ehrlichman and said, and I'd known Mr. McGregor for a number of years, going back to my time on the House Judiciary Committee, and I felt very awkward. I said, I will have to check this out with Mr. Ehrlichman. I called Ehrlichman. He told me I could not brief uh, McGregor. So as McGregor didn't have the facts when he would make public statements, uh, Ziegler didn't have the facts, and Ziegler was quite annoyed, but I told him I could not give him the facts. Would it be fair to say then that, that uh, on occasion, on numerous occasions, you misinformed Mr. Ziegler as with regard to the true facts of the matter? I wouldn't say misinformed him as much as to tell him uh, how to take the offensive because he could not say a given situation. I can think of one occasion 
uh, where we talked about the uh, secret fund that was at the White House. And he said, how do I handle that? And I said that, well, that's a matter of interpretation. It's a secret to some people, but since we know of it, it obviously is not a secret, so you don't need to say it's a secret fund. Uh, so that's the way that was handled. On, uh, for example, the, the, the leak of the, of the uh, uh, to Time magazine of the story regarding uh, surveillance of White House staff and newsmen. And that one did present a real quandary to me, so I called Ehrlichman for guidance. I was aware it had happened. Ehrlichman said, I asked Ehrlichman for guidance on how to handle it. He said, just flat out deny it. Now, that was a flat-out lie. All right. <clears throat> did you tell him, did you tell Ziegler on occasion uh, that there was no White House involvement? That there was no White House involvement? I told Mr. Ziegler that there was nobody that I knew of who was involved or had prior knowledge of the June 17th break-in. I always held it to very close literal words. That continually got a broader brush. Well, what about, you've, you've testified here yesterday about uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Strawn having told you that Haldeman ordered him to destroy documents. And I believe the con one of the conclusions you drew in your statement was that Haldeman, in fact, must have known uh, about the situation, or he would not have told Strawn to do what he uh, told him to do. I didn't know this. I didn't know Haldeman's involvement for a fact. I do not know it for well, a do, fact do you today, know but I suspect I've been asking opinion this morning. You don't know any more today, then, uh, about that matter, I assume, than when you told Mr. Ziegler what you told him regarding White House involvement. That is correct. That's correct. All right. Mr. Uh, Dean, let me ask you a few questions about uh, your actions after the Watergate incident. And by asking questions about your own personal involvement, I, I hope I'm not... Uh, considered to be badgering you in any way, but I'm sure you realize as one lawyer to another that uh, your actions and motivations are very relevant. In fact, if I were still at the White House, I'd probably be feeding you the questions to ask the person who's sitting here. Well, Mr. Dean, uh, <laughs> and if I were here as I am, I would respond as I have responded that I don't need any questions to be fed to me from anybody. <clears throat> After the uh, break-in, on the 19th, I believe, first of all, that you had a meeting with, you had a mi meeting in Mr. Mitchell's apartment uh, with Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Marty, and Mr. Magruder uh, on the 19th after you'd returned to Washington. Is that correct? As I testified, to the best of my recollection, that was either on the 19th or the 20th. 20th. I arrived at the meeting. The meeting was already in session. Uh, I do not have any recollection of that meeting other than the fact that there was discussion while I was there of sort of the, the, the public relations handling of the matter. That was at the end, it was certainly at the end of, of a day that it occurred. It was either on the 19th or the 20th, and I don't have a clear recollection of which day that was. You didn't discuss the facts as to, uh, as to what had actually happened and who was responsible? Not at that time that I recall. Had no. you previously that day met with Mr. Liddy? Yes, I had. And he had told you that Magruder, I believe, had pushed him? I sat and listened at that meeting more than talking at that meeting, and I don't recall reporting that at that particular point in well, time. Well, I didn't ask you if you no. reported it. I just no. asked you had you not had that oh, yes, conversation. Yes, I had. That yes, day. I had. And in your listening uh, between Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Magruder, of course, you realize that the three of you were the same, three of the same four individuals who sat in on two, two meetings which, in which these matters were discussed, wiretapping, this sort of thing. Uh, was that not sort of, a, sort of a strange feeling you must have had there on that occasion? Uh, didn't, didn't your mind go back to those previous meetings and you wonder whether or not, in fact, Mr. Liddy had been given the go-ahead go sign? That had already occurred to me when I met with Liddy. I'd realized right away what had happened. Uh, I had, before I met with Liddy, I had talk with Magruder. Magruder had told me that this was all Liddy's fault. It was very clear to me then that, that Liddy had proceeded either with or without authorization. It was after I talked to Liddy that I was very clear in my understanding that Liddy had been given an authorization to proceed. 
You never talked to Mr. Mitchell about it? No, sir. What had been your what had been your professional relationship with Mr. Mitchell while you were at the Justice Department? I had a very I would have to say it was sort of a uh, uh, a father son relationship in many ways. Mr. Mitchell was very friendly to me. He was gave me some of the best assignments I thought in the Department of Justice. He uh, counseled me before I went to the White House that I shouldn't go to the White House. He said I ought to stay at the Department of Justice. Um, I liked Mr. Mitchell very much. Were you concerned about his personal involvement after you heard about the, the break-in? I indeed was, but as I say, Mr. Mitchell to this day, uh, there's been only one indication, and that was on a meeting on March 28th, that he's given me any indication that he had any involvement in this thing at all. And that was when I hypothesized to him what I thought had happened, and he said something to the effect, well, yes, it was something like that, but we thought it was going to be two or three times removed from the committee. When you turned over the documents from Hunt Safe to uh, Mr. Gray, I believe you stated that you did not tell him to destroy them, but that they were politically sensitive. That is correct. Is that correct? I think I described them as political dynamite. Did you ever tell him to destroy those documents? No, sir. On any subsequent occasion? Did you not, in fact, call Mr. Gray subsequently and ask him whether or not he had, in fact, destroyed those documents? No. Mr. Gray and I discussed the documents uh, at one of the meetings in his office uh, in, I think, early July or, or sometime of that nature, in which he told me that he had taken the documents to Connecticut and he had them there. And he either indicated to me that he was planning to read them or had read them. I am very unclear on that. At that time, he had mentioned nothing about destruction of the documents. And it was not until after I'd had my meeting in January, early January, with Mr. Peterson, and subsequently met with Mr. Gray, that he told me he had destroyed the documents. Did he say when he had destroyed them? No, he did not. Do you know when he destroyed them from no, any other source? Not. Did you ever call him and ask him if he had read the documents? No, I did not. In your discussions with Mr. Walters, with the CIA, what was the purpose of your discussions with Mr. Walters? Uh, which discussions are you referring I'm to? I'm talking about the June 26, June 27. Uh, were there two or three? Well, to the best of my recollection, I realized right away what had happened. Uh, I had, before I met with Liddy, I had talked with Magruder. Magruder had told me that this was all Liddy's fault. It was very clear to me then that, that Liddy had proceeded either with or without authorization. It was after I talked to Liddy that I was very clear in my understanding that Liddy had been given an authorization to proceed. So you never talked to Mr. Mitchell about it? No, sir. What had been your... What had been your professional relationship with Mr. Mitchell while you were at the Justice Department? I had a very, I would have to say it was sort of a, uh, uh, 
a father-son relationship in many ways. Mr. Mitchell was very friendly to me. He was, gave me some of the best assignments, I thought, in the Department of Justice. He uh, counseled me before I went to the White House that I shouldn't go to the White House. He said I ought to stay at the Department of Justice. Uh, I liked Mr. Mitchell very much. Were you concerned about his personal involvement after you heard about the, the break-in? I indeed was, but as I say, Mr. Mitchell, to this day, uh, there's been any, only one indication, and that was on a meeting on March 28th, that he's given me any indication that he had any involvement in this thing at all. And that was when I hypothesized to him what I thought had happened, and he said something to the effect, well, yes, it was something like that, but we thought it was going to be two or three times removed from the committee. When you turned over the documents from Hunt Safe to uh, Mr. Gray, I believe you stated that you did not tell him to destroy them, but that they were politically sensitive. That is correct. Is that correct? I think I described them as political dynamite. Did you ever tell him to destroy those documents? No, sir. On any subsequent occasion? Did you not, in fact, call Mr. Gray subsequently and ask him whether or not he had, in fact, destroyed those documents? No. Mr. Gray and I discussed the documents uh, at one of the meetings in his office uh, in, I think, early July or, or sometime of that nature, in which he told me that he had taken the documents to Connecticut and he had them there. And he either indicated to me that he was planning to read them or had read them. I am very unclear on that. At that time, he had mentioned nothing about destruction of the documents. And it was not until after I'd had my meeting in January, early January, with Mr. Peterson and subsequently met with Mr. Gray that he told me he had destroyed the documents. Did he say when he had destroyed them? No, he did not. Do you know when he destroyed them from no, any other not. source? Did you ever call him and ask him if he had read the documents? No, I did not. In your discussions with Mr. Walters, the CIA, what was the purpose of your discussions with Mr. Walters? Uh, which discussions are you referring I'm to? I'm talking about the June 26, June 27. Uh, were there two or three? Well, to the best of my recollection, there was a meeting as a result of a, a, of a meeting that had occurred in Mitchell's office in which Mr. M the decision had been made uh, that there was some need for some sort of support. And there was a discussion in Mitchell's office about the fact that the CIA would have the facility to do this and the fact that these were CIA people and the, and the CIA should have an interest in doing this sort of thing. It was from there I went to discuss this with Mr. Ehrlichman. Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman told me he thought it was a good idea that I explore this and that he told me I should talk to uh, General Walters. I told him at that time I didn't know the people of the CIA, I didn't know Helms, I didn't know Walters. He told me, well, you tell Walters to, to call me if you have any problems. So the, the purpose of that meeting was for me to explore if there was any possibility that CIA could be of assistance in dealing with, with these problems. Was it, was it not the purpose of that meeting to get the CIA to help you in the cover-up? Yes, it was. Uh, didn't you state to Mr. Walters that, uh, in fact, witnesses were wobbling and could cause problems? I think I used something of that nature. Didn't you ask him uh, whether or not the CIA could be possibly used to raise bail uh, for some of these defendants? That is correct. I believe you also delivered a message to Mr. Hunt to tell Mr. Liddy, uh, delivered a message to Mr. Hunt through Mr. Liddy to uh, tell him to get out of the country. Is that is that correct? I think as I recounted that yesterday, that there was a meeting in Ehrlichman's office on the evening of the 19th. Uh, earlier I'd met with him, he told me to attend this meeting, and Mr. Colson was present. At, before the meeting really got underway, uh, Mr. Ehrlichman asked, where is Hunt? And I said, I have no idea. Mr. Colson made a similar response that he had no idea. Ehrlichman then told me to call Liddy and tell Hunt to get out of the country. I made the call. 
Subsequently, I began to think about the call I'd made, and I re-raised the wisdom of making such a call. We had a brief discussion about the call. Ehrlich or, or Colson agreed that it was a rather unwise call. Later, Ehrlichman concurred. I then went immediately back to the phone. I'd say this all transpired within a 30-minute time span. I went back to the telephone, recalled Liddy, who was still employed at the re-election committee, and told him to retract the earlier request I'd made for Hunt to leave the country. I had, he told me something to the fact that he didn't know if that was possible, uh, that the, the message had already been sent, uh, and I, to this day, don't know whether the message was retracted or what happened to Mr. Hunt. So to summarize your answer, the answer is yes, you did make the call, and subsequent to that, you had second thoughts about it and tried to retract it. That is correct. That would be correct. Uh, I believe on the 29th you talked to Mr. to Mr. Comback about raising money for the cover-up. You said at that time you told him substantially everything that you knew. I believe that you uh, helped Mr. Magruder in preparing himself for testimony before the grand jury in August. Uh, I assume that you knew that he was going to perjure himself in that grand jury testimony. That is correct. Uh, would you tell us how you obtained the FBI 302s? Well, as I said in my statement yesterday, I'm not terribly clear on when I did actually first receive them. Uh, I've had some preliminary discussions with Mr. Peterson about it, and Mr. Peterson suggested I deal directly with Gray on the matter. Uh, I had some discussions with Gray about it. Initially, as I recall a sequence, there was a summary repair. Or for, I might add this. Mr. Gray offered to me to come over to his office and read the reports. Uh, I might have even looked at some of the reports initially in his office. But it was after I received the uh, July 21st summary of the FBI investigation to date and showed that to Mitchell and Mardian, that they said that they thought that I should uh, permit Mardian and Mitchell said O'Brien and Parkinson as well uh, the right to look at these investigative reports. I discussed this with Ehrlichman and Haldeman. They thought it was a wise idea that I follow what the FBI was doing. That's, th that, that's a different area, Mr. Dean, if you want to elaborate okay. on that a little later. Fine. I'm, I'm interested in this point. But I don't know the precise date that I began receiving but are, the reports. Are you, are you definitely stating that when you inquired of Mr. Peterson that uh, he said just deal directly with Pat Gray on this matter? That is the best of my recollection. Did not Mr. Kleindienst, in fact, tell you that uh, the only way that he would make FBI 302s available was that he would deliver them directly to the president himself if the president asked for them, but he wouldn't give them to you. That's possible, but I don't recall it. I have a, a very friendly relationship with Mr. Kleindienst. Uh, the way you have stated it is certainly not the way Mr. Kleindienst was stated to me. Uh, so I don't. Possible? Would that not be? I, he might have said, uh, uh, you know, if, if we want those, if you want those at the White House, they ought to go to the president. I don't recall any such conversation, frankly. Did you ever tell Mr. Kleindienst that you were reporting on your investigation directly to the president? Did I report that to Kleindienst? That, that you that you told Mr. Kleindienst that you not were reporting. Not until I began reporting to the president did I ever tell the Attorney General that the president had instructed him to do a given thing or asked that he do something. Uh, I'm not talking about what, what the president was telling him to do. I'm asking whether or not in, in June or July of 1972, you told Mr. Kleindienst at that time that you were reporting directly to the president. I believe I told that to Mr. Gray, not Mr. Kleindienst. But you, but you did not tell that to Mr. Kleindienst That's when correct. you were attempting to get FBI material. That is correct. Did you ever call Mr. Sloan uh, and the October of 72 or thereafter, or his attorney, and talk to him about the possibilities of his claiming his Fifth Amendment privileges? Yes, I did. I tried to reach Mr. Sloan. I'd had a call from, uh, as I recall, Mr. Parkinson. There'd been considerable discussion about Mr. Sloan at the White House and at the re-election committee. In fact, that Mr. Sloan uh, at that time seemed to be looking for a confessional of any source he could find and and report everything he knew. Uh, Ehrlichman knew this, for example, before Sloan sought him out. 
Other people at the White House knew this. I think that's one of the reasons that Ehrlichman did not want to talk with Mr. Sloan. Uh, Mr. Sloan came to see me on a number of occasions because I would talk with him. And I reassured him on a number of occasions that I didn't think the fact that he was treasurer would necessarily result in him having to uh, face criminal charges as a result of some of the misappropriations of funds that occurred there. Did you ever tell him or his attorney? Well, I'm getting to that. Uh, based on, I'm trying to give you the preface of why I, I said that. Uh, when Mr. Sloan was headed for Florida to testify in the trial that was going down on down there with regard to Mr. Barker, uh, I, on the request of uh, receiving this information from Parkinson that he was going, tried to reach Mr. Sloan in his attorney's office. And uh, Sloan not being there, as I recall, I asked uh, Mr. Stoner, or Treese, I think it was, uh, Ms. Stoner and Treese, uh, Stoner and, and Sloan had already left, and, and Mr. Treese was there, that uh, uh, was he prepared to have his client take the Fifth Amendment because he'd certainly be a hero in the eyes of people around the White House if he did. All right, Mr. Dean, let, let me move now, if I can, to, to why you've talked about your involvement in the cover-up, why you participated in the cover-up. Uh, in any way, was it because of uh, uh, the fear that you had about your own personal involvement up, in, up until that time? When the, when, when you heard about the break-in at the DNC, what went through your mind? Did you have fear for, for your own personal, uh, in, uh, concerning your own personal involvement in the matter up until that time? Well, when I first heard of the break-in on Sunday the 18th, uh, I frankly thought that it involved Mr. Colson, as I believe I testified. It was on Monday I learned Why? That, why? Well, I was aware of the fact that Mr. Colson had uh, uh, suggested burglaries in the past, uh, specifically the Brookings Institute, and the name Hunt I immediately associated with Colson. What did you learn about the name Hunt? I think I first met Mr. Hunt in August. I'm, I'm sorry. When did you find out that Mr. Hunt was involved in some way in the break-in? On Sunday, I didn't know about the break-in. I knew about the fact that there was a Cuban uh, who had a check written out to Mr. Hunt to some country club in his possession when he was arrested or in uh, some way in connection with the arrest. Did you learn this in your telephone call from California, or did you learn this after you returned to Washington? I learned this after I returned on, on Sunday night, the 18th. So I assume that you were talking about your immediate reaction was that after you returned to Washington and learned about the hunt matter. That's right. And my reaction was that Colson was involved. All right. Could you uh, go so ahead and yeah. regard to yourself? Uh, then on the 19th, when I talked to Magruder, uh, and learned that he had indicated it was Liddy's fault. And after talking to Liddy, uh, I wasn't personally concerned about myself because I knew very well that I hadn't authorized any such thing, that I had not known about anything from February until uh, that time. Well, let, me, let me explore. I don't want to interrupt sure. you. Let, let me explore that point with you. Not necessarily from the standpoint of whether or not you did, in fact, have any culpability up to that time, but what what it might appear to be. Uh, after all, you had, uh, you had introduced Liddy to Mitchell, had you not, I believe, originally. That's how they met. You had, uh, in effect, uh, recommended or sent, anyway, Mr. Liddy over to the committee to reelect. And you've explained all those, how, how these things came about. But I'm talking about from the standpoint of someone investigating the matter from the outside. You sent Mr. Leader to the committee to re-elect. You did attend the January 27 meeting when these matters were discussed. You did attend the February 4 meeting when these matters were discussed. They're, they're very possibly, if, if, if someone talked about these meetings, the, the fact that very possibly a conspiracy of some kind was in the making uh, uh, could, uh, could get out. And, you know, the law of conspiracy, uh, generally, if a person involves himself in a conspiracy and one of his co-conspirators subsequently commits an overt act, uh, you very well may be held responsible for that, for what one of your co-conspirators do. You're a lawyer. I'm sure you realize that. Uh, Liddy did come to you after those meetings in, Mar in February and March to try to 
to solicit your help in getting his plan approved, and you said you turned him off at that time. Uh, Strawn and Magruder did call on you when they were having trouble with uh, uh, Liddy uh, to, uh, to get you to help them uh, with their problems with Liddy. Evidently, Strawn and Magruder and Liddy himself considered that you had some involvement or we, some interest. We, we come back to that at some time when you finish. I'd like to explain that to you. All right, I'm finished. Let me to which I can I'm, talking, I'm talking about all of these things. Oh, Did right. you not, when you heard of this, say to yourself, uh, I'm very possibly involved in this thing, or it looks like I'm very much involved in this thing, therefore I'm going to participate in the cover-up? Well, when I, when I learned, for example, from talking to Mr. Strawn, uh, that he had been instructed to destroy records, that was my greatest concern at that point in time. If it had been merely John Dean, uh, we would have had far fewer problems because I would have been willing to step forward as I did with Ehrlichman, I told him exactly what my involvement was when I was first asked by him what it was. Uh, the stakes were too high for any personal feelings I had regarding myself. I knew I had no criminal problem, and if they wanted to fire me based on the involvement I'd had, fine. Uh, if it meant the re-election of the president, fine. John Dean certainly wouldn't stand uh, in the way of that. People were move, removed from the White House for far less. So what, I, you're, what I, you're saying is that you had no concern for your own welfare, but uh, you just wanted to stay on to, to help out others. Well, as I say, I found myself helping out others uh, uh, without... Uh, I was in the process before I began thinking about the process. Why did you not tell the federal prosecutors when you made first, first made contact with them? Uh, when you had decided that either you or your attorneys, I believe on April 2nd of this year, when your attorney first made contact with federal prosecutors. I'm still not quite sure in my own mind why you didn't re evidently relate to them uh, the nature of the president's involvement or the fact that the president was involved uh, to some extent. Well, of course, it's uh, not my my presence at the meeting, so I'm not aware of what was discussed. My lawyer and I did discuss it. We were aware of the fact that there were attorney-client privilege problems, there was executive privilege, there were national security matters, and I frankly was hopeful at some point when the president returned that I would have a chance to go in and tell the president, this is the way I saw it, this is what I've done, uh, and ask him, based on that, expect him to come forward and explain his involvement uh, the way I thought he would. When did you, when, when were you uh, uh, terminated uh, at the White House, Mr. Dean? Uh, my resignation was requested and accepted on the 30th of April. Without your involvement, I believe? Uh, without my involvement. So from, you had from April 2nd to April 30th, uh, in which to, to do what you were talking about. Go to the there, president and try no, to get him to step no, forward. No, no, let me explain this. Bef I'm talking about the period between April 2nd and April 15th. There were no discussions about the president. From a April 15th uh, on, I began inferentially, because it was impossible to explain things, explaining the highlights of some of the things that involved the president, without Which, getting terribly specific with him, but giving them very broad ideas of some of the areas that uh, were involved. If you were interested in his coming forward, why didn't you tell him that you were talking to the prosecutors or you well, had made some contact with the prosecutors? I had met with him on the 21st, met with him again on the 22nd, he called me on the 23rd. There was nothing, ha I had given him what I thought that was the most dr dramatic way I could tell him what the situation was. Nothing happened as a result of that. He then went to California. When he came back from California, I noted that there was a, a, a well, actually, when I came back from Camp David on the uh, 28th before they went to California, he'd been to Florida in the interim. Uh, there was a very changed attitude about me at that point in time. I was getting signals from, from Haldeman in my meetings with him. Uh, he directed me to come down, really, from Camp David. He said, you just can't hold up up there. I said, I don't want to talk to Mitchell. He said, I think you've got to come back down and talk to Mitchell. It was very clear to me Mr. Haldeman wanted me to come down and talk to Mitchell and Magruder. Uh, I saw a very different 
uh, Bob Holloman and I had dealt with over the last year, that was clear to me that there was a, a new concern, and I had become the concern. And it was that reason I did not turn over the, the report I'd written at Camp David. The whole atmosphere changed after, uh, really after I'd gone to Camp David, and, and probably the, the greatest change occurred in the meeting uh, on the 20, uh, let's see, the 20, afternoon of the 21st or the 22nd, when Ehrlichman, Haldeman, and I met with the president, and I said in front of the president for the first time ever that I thought that I kept disagreeing with everything that was being said because I said that Ehrlichman, Haldeman, and Dean are all indictable. Let's consider your motivations one at a time, if we might. You mentioned, first of all, the attorney-client privilege, which, of course, I assume you're talking about conversations that you would have had with the president. That's correct. But there was an abundance of, of evidence that you could have given uh, which would not have involved attorney-client privilege based on what you told we, us. We were researching it at the well, time. Well, let me give you... And we concluded that there was no attorney-client privilege. I'm talking about what Ehrlichman told you. According to your testimony, Ehrlichman told you that the president had approved executive clemency for Hunt, try to keep his mouth shut. You've testified that Colson told you that the president approved executive clemency for Hunt to keep him quiet. Uh, you've testified that, uh, that Krogh told you that he got his instructions for the Ellsberg psychiatrist break in from the Oval Office. All those in things, none of those things involve communications with the president. It couldn't possibly in involve attorney-client <coughs> privilege, could they? They couldn't involve attorney-client privilege, no, because some of them involved conversations I'd had directly with the president, yes. Some of them did not. Uh, as I say, there was also the executive privilege question. There were national security quest questions. We had resolved that, in fact, these did not apply. Did you tell the prosecutors about the Ellsberg break-in? Yes, I did. So you had resolved that question? No, I didn't tell them the totality of them. What I told them was that they had evidence in their files that they should re-examine because it indicated a break-in. Now, I did this because there is case law that my lawyer told me about. He said, John, you're committing another crime if you don't tell, and you've got to reveal this to them. And based on that case, he said there's an ongoing prosecution. You must give them enough that they can look at their files and make the determination. Dean, is it your testimony that you were not, in effect, bargaining for immunity or seeking immunity from the prosecutors at that time? My lawyers were very definitely discussing immunity with, with the prosecutors at that time. That, uh, and that you failed with the U.S. Attorney's Office in that, in that attempt, did you not? Of course, that, I might add that that's a very proper thing for attorneys to pursue. That's right. All, uh, all but, of phase but the fact one, is they were. What happened is they worked out what my lawyers worked out, what they call a phase one with the... Uh, phase one? Phase one. <laughs> uh, in which I would deal with... Didn't have any better luck than the other phase one. <laughs> I would discuss with the, with the prosecutors everything I could remember, everything I could tell them, and the evidence would not be used against me so they could assess what they wanted to do with that. That was the design of phase one, which I did. All right. And then, uh, then contact was made with Mr. Dash. Mr. Uh, Dash uh, made contact with us. Well... Either way you want to put it. You discussed the matter with Mr. Dash, who, who very properly, of course, seeking the information that any information he could get, talk with you about these matters. Uh, and then uh, after, and for the first time, as far as I know, you correct me if I'm wrong, after that, uh, sometime after that, the story starting appearing, quoting sources close to you, uh, to the effect that you had met with Nixon more than 40 times uh, to discuss... Uh, the, the, the cover-up, that Nixon had substantial knowledge uh, about what the White House officials were doing and all of those things. Now, obviously, what I'm... Uh, I don't want to leave an unfair implication if I'm wrong about this, but the obvious question is whether or not you went to the prosecutors, gave them what you felt like might be enough to get immunity, having failed there, came to this committee and offered a little more in order to get immunity, use immunity, before this committee. Was that or was that not your strategy? I believe that is not correct. And what, uh, at what point uh, does that, 
thesis well, break phase, down. Phase one had virtually uh, gone into abeyance. What happened is we gave. Well, we considered phase two. Uh, <laughs> no, phase. no, no, no. Phase. I'm talking about the, the off-the-record discussions with the prosecutors. Uh, had gone into abeyance by the time Mr. Dash con contacted us because we were giving them so much information so fast that the thing was tumbling so quickly uh, that they were in pursuit of it and it became more and more difficult to meet. There also was the increasing demand for a special prosecutor. Uh, the prosecutors didn't know their own status. Meanwhile, Mr. Dash had, uh, asked to discuss it with my attorney and he said, you're going to be called. You're going to be called soon and I want to know what it's all about. And so he was given the story. Of course, you, you could have claimed your, of course, you, you, you did get immunity from, from this committee, use of immunity. One, one last question, Mr. Dean. Your, the reason I ask this, of course, is, like I say, your, your statement is replete with references about your desire to uncover the cover-up and your desire to, uh, to tell the truth and all these matters. Why? before you were forced out of the White House. And as you say, you started making contact with the prosecutors April 2 of that year. That you had substantial difficulty, evidently, with Mr. Holloman and Ehrlichman and their desire to get Mitchell to take the rap and get them off the hook. Why didn't you resign, call a press conference, and tell the entire truth about the matter if you wanted it to come out, substantially well, before uh, you were forced out of the White House? David. Beg your when I was at Camp David on the, uh, went up on the 23rd, it was on the 25th, uh, I talked to a lawyer and I told him I wanted to take some steps. And he cautioned me, he said, for gosh sake, don't do anything until you do talk to a lawyer. And so it was when I came back from Camp David on the 28th that I again began calling to obtain a criminal lawyer. And he told me, he said, John, he said, I know you want to get the truth out. And that was the first thing we told the prosecutors. But he said, you don't have to run into machine guns to do it. That you, should, you have a constitution, you can protect your rights, and you can go forward. And if I'm going to represent you, I'm going to represent you the best way I know as a member of the bar. And I'll give you the best counsel I can. And I've tried to follow his counsel and simultaneously get the truth out. All right, fine. Just one uh, small matter. I, I don't want to leave any emphasis from the story that... Uh, I quoted a minute ago concerning your meetings with Mr. Dash. Uh, uh, I don't know the source, and this is not the proper time to find out the source. The only thing I'm sure of is that uh, it was not Mr. Dash, so I just want to put that on the record. Uh, I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Senator Talmadge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dean, you realize, of course, that you've made very strong charges against the President of the United States. It involves him in criminal offenses, do you not? Yes, sir, I do. What makes you think that your credibility is greater than that of the President who denies what you have said? Well, Senator, I have been asked to come up here and tell the truth. I've told it exactly the way I know it. Uh, I don't say that I... You know, you're asking me a public relations question, really, in a sense, why I would have greater cred credibility than the President of the United States. I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling it uh, just as I know it. Now, you're testifying, I believe, under use of immunity that this committee has granted to you. That is correct. You would not be here testifying today had we not granted that use of immunity, would you? Probably be before the prosecutors downtown. Now, you refused to testify before the grand jury, I believe, did you not? That is correct. You pled the Fifth Amendment there. That is correct. You have been bargaining with them for immunity which has not yet been granted. Is that an accurate statement? That is correct, Senator. Now, there's been various uh, reports in the press. I know nothing whatever about their credence. Did you see an article in one of the Washington papers that you were kicked out of a law firm here for violation of the canon of, of ethics? I did, sir. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, I would. Uh, I, uh, to explain that the best I can, is that I learned about that uh, sometime after it had occurred. And that was when I had left, I had been on the, uh, on the Hill working with the House Judiciary Committee. I had gone to a newly formed commission that was working on the revision of the federal criminal laws, and the Civil Service ran a normal 
civil service type examination. As a result of that, they went to a former employer. The employer indicated that he had dismissed me for unethical reasons. The person who was the deputy director of the commission brought this to my attention and said, Do you, is this true? And I said, I'm flabbergasted to see this. I called a friend who had been in the firm at the time, who was another lawyer. I asked him if he would go to the person who had made the charge and see if he could find out what in the world this is all about. I explained to him the entire set of facts and circumstances that had occurred. As a result of, of uh, this man going to see the former partner who had dismissed me, uh, the statement was retracted in my civil service record. And also, I should note that one of the reasons that I was prepared to go to the Ethics Committee at that point in time, because I was operating on the advice of counsel when I was involved in this investment while I was still at this law firm, and I believe we had really a question of personalities rather than a question of ethics involved. I would be happy to submit to the committee for its record uh, the letter of counsel that I was operating on at the time this incident occurred, that I had sought legal advice as to whether this was proper or improper, because I did not want to engage in it if it was improper. If you will submit that to the record, we would appreciate it. I judge from your statement that that was an unfair an unfounded attack on your professional ethics. I would suggest you read it. All right. Would you, read would, the would you like me to read the letter? This is a letter to the, to the man who investigated the matter. It's from uh, Mr. Earl Stanley of the, of the firm of Dow, Lonis, and Alberson. Dear Mr. Taptich, this will confirm and supplement my recent conversation with you concerning events preceding and to some degree surrounding the resignation in early February 1966 of Mr. John Dean from the law firm of Welsh and Morgan, Washington, D.C. As you know, Mr. Boyd Fellows approached me in October 1965 about the possibility of representing an applicant for a construction permit for a new television broadcast station in St. Louis, Missouri. At that time, Mr. Fellows was, in essence, considering various law firms in Washington as communications counsel for a group which he was putting together to apply for a St. Louis television authorization. I had known Mr. Fellows for some time before he approached me, and as a result of our initial contact, I told him that I would be pleased to represent his group and to assist them in any way I could in filing and prosecuting their application to the Federal Communications Commission. At that time, Mr. Fellows' plans appeared to be very much in the preliminary stages. No corporation had been organized, specific program plans had not been formulated, and few, if any, of the other necessary investigations or work preliminary to the preparation of an application had been completed. At our initial conference, Mr. Fellows pointed out that he was then employed as a television management expert at Welsh and Morgan, and that his name had appeared on the applications for television authorizations which had been filed by that firm, including one in St. Louis, Missouri. It was my understanding that the firm of Welsh and Morgan would probably eventually own approximately 30% of that St. Louis television operation, consistent with a pattern followed by the firm in connection with other television authorizations. I told Mr. Fellows that insofar as he was concerned, there was no problem of ethics involved since he was not a practicing attorney. My recollection is that Mr. Fellows had already made known his plans and proposals to one or more of the partners of Welsh and Morgan. I did advise Mr. Fellows that when, if shortly before the application for the group was filed, due to commission requirements, he would have to sever connections with the other St. Louis television group. At our conference in October, Mr. Fellows also discussed with me the possibility of Mr. Dean becoming a part of the group. Mr. Dean was then a recent associate at Welsh and Morgan, but according to my recollection was contemplating the possibility of a change in position. I was told that Mr. Dean's participation in the group was to be largely that of an investor, that he did not desire, plan, or feel qualified to advise the applicant corporation in any way as to the preparation of its application, and that I would be relied on for such advice and guidance. I advised Mr. Fellows that, in my opinion, it would not be unethical or improper in any respect for Mr. Dean to become part of the group, recognizing that if, if and when the application was filed at the commission, he should plan to resign from Welsh and Morgan because that firm's interest in another St. Louis group. The subject of Mr. Dean's participation in the St. Louis group was also mentioned at a luncheon meeting which I had with Mr. Fellows and Mr. Dean in November of 1965 at Costin's Restaurant in Washington, D.C. 
My recollection of the details is quite vague, but I am certain that I told Mr. Dean the same thing that I had earlier told Mr. Fellows. I might say in concluding that I've always regarded Mr. John Dean as an extremely honorable, conscientious, careful, and able man. His honesty and integrity, in my opinion, are both beyond question. His care and his conduct and connected with his participation in his application for television authorization in St. Louis demonstrate these very qualifications. As to what occurred between Mr. Dean and Mr. Welsh of Welsh and Morgan at the time Mr. Resine, Dean resigned in February of 1966, I have no personal knowledge. I do know that at the time the application of Mr. Fellows Group, Greater St. Louis Television, Inc., was filed in March 66, Mr. Dean was no longer an associate with Welsh and Morgan. Uh, the above is according to the best of my recollection and knowledge. If you have any questions or need for further details, please let me know. With kindest regards, cordially, Earl R. Stanley. I believe you testified that you met with the President in March of this year, informing fully about your participation and the participation of others in the cover-up of the Watergate incident. And at that time, as I recall, you told the President that both you, Mr. Ehrlichman, and Mr. Haldeman were indictable. Is that correct? That was in an afternoon meeting uh, when I met with him, which I believe was on the afternoon of the 21st. Was anyone there besides you and the President? Uh, initially, Mr. Ziegler was in, well, the meeting in the morning, uh, it was only the President and I initially. At the end of the conversation, he called Mr. Haldeman in to request that Mr. Haldeman get a hold of Mr. Mitchell to get Mr. Mitchell down there for a meeting the next day. Uh, in the afternoon, Mr. Ziegler was in the office for a very short period of time and then left as the meeting commenced with uh, Ehrlichman, Haldeman, the President, and myself. So was there was no other, other persons than those involved. What was the President's reaction when you told him about the complicity of the individuals in the White House? Well, I felt I had not gotten uh, the message that I was trying to convey through to the President. And I think that uh, subsequent meeting that afternoon and the meeting the next day with Mitchell, uh, with the President, uh, indicated to me that there was more concern about this committee and its hearings uh, than doing anything affirmative about what I told the President. In fact, the strategy was then developing that uh, John Mitchell should step forward and if he did, that there would be lack of concern and interest in the post-activities as opposed to the pre-activities, and hopefully they would all go away. What did the President say when you told him about these individuals? About which individuals, Senator? About you and Ehrlichman and Haldeman all being subject to indictment. Uh, I don't recall the President's reaction as much as I recall Mr. Ehrlichman's reaction when he expressed his pleasure. There was some, it was a general discussion and I was, I was just amazed at the discussion going on, and I just kept shaking my head because the president would say to me, do you agree with this? And I would say, no, I don't. And finally I said, the reason I don't agree with this is because I think that, that Mr. Holloman, Mr. Ehrlichman, and I are indictable for obstruction of justice. Did the president seem surprised when you gave him this information? No, sir, he did not. I believe at the same time he discussed with you that he should not have talked with Mr. Colson about executive clemency, did he not? No, sir, that was a, that was a meeting uh, that occurred on two times. On March 13th, uh, when he'd asked me where the pressure was coming from from the money, he told me about the fact that Colson had come to see him uh, despite Ehrlichman's instructions that he not do so, and he had expressed annoyance at that occasion. And on March, on April 15th of this year, at the, at the very end of our conversation, I remember very vividly the president getting up out of his chair, walking behind the chair to the corner, and in a very, very audible, just almost an audible tone, turned to me and said, I was probably foolish to talk to Colson about clemency for Hunt, wasn't I? With the declarative statement. Now to turn to another matter. Do you have any idea why it was you that Mr. Ehrlichman asked to check into the break-in affair immediately after the Watergate entrance? Uh, I would only assume because that I was, had become the White House firefighter by that time, and I was uh, 
given assignments of this nature, whether it is, I say, to be the Lithuanian defector or I, any conflict of interest problem that came up, I investigated a lot of those. Uh, I dealt with all of the uh, presidential appointees before they were appointed to clear them for conflict problems or any problems that came up. Uh, any improprieties that had come to our attention were sent to my office so we could investigate them and find out if they would be embarrassing to the president. So it was very natural that he would, of course, come to me. Did you really believe Mr. Liddy when he told you that no one in the White House was involved? Well, given the nature of my statement and in, in reflecting back, at that time he did not even mention to me Hunt's involvement. Uh, and how much Mr. Liddy would know about White House involvement in this, I don't know. I think that he would only have uh, uh, probably hearsay knowledge uh, from Mr. Magruder and his dealings with Mr. Magruder as to who in the White House would or would not be involved. I don't know what dealings he had with the White House other than the dealings he had with me. Let's see if I have the sequence on the immediate aftermath of the break-in correct. Now, immediately upon your return to Washington after the break-in in June, you saw Mr. Liddy, whom you knew had presented massive intelligence plans to Mr. Mitchell. Is that correct? Well, sir, now I'll give you the, the sequence. As I arrived back on Sunday night, the 18th, I was informed by my assistant uh, that McCord had been arrested, uh, one of the individuals arrested, and that one of the Cubans had a check for Mr. Hunt. Uh, the next morning, I had a conversation with Mr. Caulfield, who repeated the same thing to me. I then had a call from uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, or I had a call from Mr. Magruder, who told me that this whole thing is Liddy's fault and I should look into it. Uh, I then had a call with Mr. Ehrlichman, who I reported to him uh, that this was had been told me, and he said, I think you ought to meet with Liddy. I then met with Mr. Liddy about noon, and he gave me his report. It was in that afternoon that Mr. Strawn came into my office and told me uh, that he had been instructed by Mr. Haldeman to destroy documents. You knew, of course, that Mr. Liddy had presented massive intelligence plans to Mr. Mitchell. I believe you were there on two occasions. Yes, I was. And then you testified that Mr. Strawn told Senator, you... Senator, I might correct that. They were massive on the first occasion and a very tailored-down version on the second. And I must say I was very late in attending the second meeting, and the meeting was short-ended after I arrived. Each meeting was scaled down further. Yes, sir. Intelligent plan. Now, then Mr. Strawn told you that Mr. Haldeman ordered him to go through Mr. Haldeman's files and destroy materials which included documents relating to wiretap information from the Democratic National Committee. Is that correct? That is correct. Then you told Mr. Ehrlichman about the meetings with Liddy and Mitchell and about your subsequent conversations with Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman's reaction in a meeting which Mr. Colson attended was to tell you to get Liddy to have him tell Hunt to get out of the country. Is that correct? Well, you're tying two meetings together, Senator. I might straighten that out for you. The meeting I reported to Ehrlichman was in mid-afternoon, and Mr. Colson was not present. I was reporting my meeting with Liddy at that point. Uh, I did not discuss with him the, the, the facts that Strawn had brought to my attention because I just assumed that he was aware from his conversations uh, with Mr. Haldeman that that, in fact, had occurred. Uh, he told me to come back to a meeting later that evening with Colson. He said he was aware of the fact that Colson wanted to meet with him and I should be present at that meeting. And then shortly thereafter, Mr. Ehrlichman told you to throw the contents of Hunt safe in the river. Is that correct? That is correct. Now? Well, he told me, it was to, he told me to throw the briefcase in the river and he told me to shred the documents. Yes. Now, after all of those facts occurred and were available to you, why didn't you, as counsel to the president, go to him at that time and tell him what was happening? Senator, I didn't have access to the president. I never was presumptuous enough to, to try to pound on the door and get in because I knew that just didn't work that way. I know of efforts of other White House staff to get in. I've seen, for example, one of the reporters who's sitting in this room, I believe, Mr. Mollenhoff, some memorandums he tried to send in to the president, and they're just blocked when you try to send information in. You mean you were counsel to the President of the United States and you couldn't get access to him if you wanted to? Is that your testimony? 
No, sir, I, I didn't. I thought it would be presumptuous of me to, to try because I felt I was told my re reporting channel was through Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman, and I was reporting everything I knew to them. Seems like to me, after finding evidence of a conspiracy of this magnitude, it was incumbent upon you as counselor to the president to make every possible effort to see that he got that information at that time. Senator, I was participating in the cover-up at that time. Another question. <laughs> when you met with Attorney General Kleindeist on the 19th and 20th of June, I believe, there you told him you had no idea there would be a break-in at Democratic National Committee headquarters. Did you tell him about the meetings of January the 27th and February the 4th, 1972, with Mr. Liddy and Mr. Magruder and Mitchell during Buggins, uh, when Buggins were considered? No, sir, I did, I did not. Why didn't you tell him at that time? Because I knew that would put him in a position that uh, he would have to pursue his investigation that way. And Mr. Kleinings had told me when we talked generally in very broad generalities about the thing, that he said he would never sit in the Attorney General's office and prosecute Mr. Mitchell. And I didn't want to put this on Mr. Kleinings at this point in time. In other words, you were still participating in the cover-up at well, that meeting time. meeting that occurred the 19th or 20th. Yes. Why were you chosen to tell Mr. Combeck that Mr. Mitchell, Ehrlichman, and Haldeman wanted him to raise money to pay for the silence of the Watergate defendants? Well, I became the courier of good and bad news between the committee concerning what each quarter was doing concerning the cover-up. I think that occurred for this reason. One, uh, Mr. Mitchell uh, had known me and trusted me with this type of information, and Haldeman and Ehrlichman knew and trusted me. There was a, particularly after this, this reporting requirement, uh, or, or requirement, this, this reporting uh, scheme developed very early on. Uh, Ehrlichman and Mitchell had, a, I would have to say, a rather strained relationship. And this made it convenient to avoid some of those strains. And there was also a, a, a long-standing uh, competition between Mr. Mitchell and certain Pearsons in the White House, so that uh, this made it convenient. They didn't want to deal with one another, so I was the convenient vehicle to deal with. Did you think it was part of an effort to make you the fall guy in the plan? I didn't raise the, the fall guy. It made it very easy for them to protect themselves, to say that uh, this was all Dean if anything ever went wrong. I was aware of that, but I didn't begin to think about that until the August 29th statement. And at that time, I began discussing it with people uh, because I was right square in the middle of the cover-up, and now my name was being put out in front of the whole thing as clearing everybody from complicity. And I said, this may be a natural. I'd seen it happen before. I'd seen uh, situations like this occur where people who had not uh, actually done something take the blame for it to avoid embarrassing others higher up. And I felt there was a real possibility. Why have you always assumed that it was a presidential decision to keep Mr. Magruder on at the committee to re-elect the president? Well, I assume that because for two reasons. First of all, it was very clear by the time uh, Mr. Magruder or this, these discussions came up that the strategy was developing that the matter could stop at Mr. Liddy, uh, that they could hold it there. Then there could be no links into the White House through Mr. Magruder, and nobody at the top of the reelection committee would be damaged. Uh, Mr. Magruder was the deputy director. Uh, he was involved. I reported the fact he was involved. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, who I didn't know was involved or not, uh, they were asking me whether I thought he should leave or stay in the campaign. I cannot conceive of a discussion of these factors uh, not coming up in a conversation with the president about what was happening over to the re-election committee. Now, it's presumptuous, uh, or it's a presumption on my part, but uh, given the, uh, you know, this is the number one and two man at the re-election committee. You testified that you always suspected that Mr. Colson was far more knowledgeable than he protested. What led you to that conclusion? Well, the, the fact that uh, 
Mr. Magruder had told me of numbers of con or the fact that his staff had contacted him uh, regarding implementing the plan, the fact that Mr. Hunt had a very close relationship with Mr. Colson, that the memos that I found in Hunt's safe indicated that Hunt had a practice of reporting regularly to Mr. Colson on things that occurred, and I found it very hard to believe that Mr. Mr. Uh, Hunt and Mr. Liddy would walk into Mr. Colson's office and tell them that they just had some security plan or something like that, uh, and then turn and persuade Colson on a call like that or on a statement like that to call Mr. Magruder and to have his staff subsequently follow up with additional calls and tell him to get that plan going. Now, you testified that you had to report to the president through Mr. Haldeman or through Mr. Ehrlichman. Were you closer to the president on the Watergate than in any other area? Uh, do you mean when I did begin reporting to yes. him? Yes, sir. Can you account for that? Well, I can only tell you what the president told me. Uh, he told me that uh, this matter was taking up too much attention of Mr. Haldeman and Ehrlichman, which indeed it was very consuming for everybody that was involved in it. Uh, no one could leave the store very long for fear that uh, something would go astray. So it was something that everyone had to stay on top of. The, the trial was over. We were moving into the Senate phase. We had a grand plan that had been laid out of a weekend of some 12 to 14 hour meetings. Uh, the president, I assume, thought now that the plans have been laid, the policies have been made, uh, have Mr. Dean report to me and uh, I'll deal with him directly on the matter. Did Mr. Haldeman have direct access to the president? Indeed he did, sir. Mr. Ehrlichman? Yes, he did. Mr. Colson? Yes, he did. Mr. Mitchell? I don't believe that Mr. Mitchell had any dealings with the president, to my knowledge, other than one or two social visits in Florida with him from the time he left the campaign until uh, the meeting that occurred on June 22nd. I know they had sort of a, a good chat about what everyone had been doing at that time, very social chat at the end of the meeting. I was asked by the president to make arrangements so Mr. Mitchell could use his outer office in the executive office building, and while I was doing that, they were having a chat about what was happening amongst some of the the partners. I know also that the president stopped in the, his old law firm at one time, but I think these were strictly social dealings. That was March the 22nd, I believe, rather than June the 22nd. Yes, excuse me, March 22nd. Mr. Kornbach had immediate access to the president. No, sir. He did not. Not to my knowledge. I think the president periodically called Mr. Kornbach when he had some specific item he wanted to take up regarding the residents in California. Uh, I was often a conveyor of information to Mr. Kambach for the president, and these, these uh, requests would come to me from Haldeman or Ehrlichman. They dealt with the, the personal side of the president's business. Uh, I think that uh, I, don't, I don't know of uh, other than social gatherings where you know, White House dinners or the like where Mr. Kambach might have been present. I know that uh, his partner, Mr. DeMarco, and I would always take the tax return in to be signed, and those would be rather mechanical sessions. So I can't say that uh, Mr. Kambach had access to the president, no. What was Mr. Mitchell's relationship to the president? The same, was it the same over the entire period that you were at the White House? Well, I don't really know. I know that. Mr. Mitchell and the President had frequent contact. I can recall while I was at the Department of Justice and I would be in the, in the Attorney General's office and uh, uh, the President would call him. I know that Mr. Mitchell would have no hesitation to pick up the phone and call Mr. or call the President. Uh, I know that uh, Mr. Mitchell attended a number of meetings uh, with the President, private meetings on a regular basis while he was still Attorney General. <coughs> I, was told, I was told also that they had a number of evening meetings and some planning for the campaign as they moved toward the campaign. And I often thought back to a comment that I was told when I was first interviewed in, in the Pierre Hotel to come to the, to the um, 
to the Department of Justice that uh, Kleindienst told me that uh, uh, this Attorney General will probably be as close to this President as uh, Robert Kennedy was to President Kennedy. And throughout your statement, you indicated that you met with or were ordered to work for either Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Ehrlichman. What was the relationship between you and these advisors? Well, I would report to them or get assignments from them. What was their relationship between themselves? I think that uh, Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Haldeman have a relationship that goes back a number of years from, from college days. They were, they were good friends. Uh, they were very close. They, they worked very well together. I think that, uh, uh, of course, that Mr. Ehrlichman was dealt more with substantive matters, whereas Mr. Haldeman dealt with procedural matters at the White House. I think that Mr. Haldeman from time to time would make substantive suggestions, but he would restrain himself because of the mere mechanics of keeping uh, an operation of the dimensions of a presidency going. Did they keep each other informed as to what they were doing? I would assume they did, yes. Yeah. I, I, no, I would say, you know, on, a, on selected areas. I you, wouldn't say that Mr. Ehrlichman would tell everything to Mr. Holloman that he was planning on a given area of domestic policy. He would direct, he'd go directly to the president with that. Do you have a copy of your exhibit number 26 before you? I do not have the I'll exhibit I'll ask department. the staff to please hand you one. It's an interesting document. I'd like to hear your comment on it. He's got that he has. You have it now. You note that it's on White House stationery, dated the 2nd of January, 1973. It's very brief and to the point. To John Dean, from Charles Colson. Now what in the hell do I do? Yes, sir. Tell us the significance of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, attached to that, that was a very small uh, memorandum or notepad up in the corner attached to the letter that is, is the second part of the exhibit. Uh, it's a letter from Howard Hunt to Mr. Colson. Uh, this came to me uh, while I was, to my attention, when I was on a telephone conversation with Mr. Colson after having just returned from California. I'd had a conversation with Mr. O'Brien on the evening of the 2nd of January concerning Mr. Hunt's status and his, his desire to plead guilty and get assurances for executive clemency. I had a call the next morning from Mr. O'Brien on the same subject. I had a call from Mr. Colson, Colson, who told me that Mr. Bittman was trying to reach him. Uh, he asked me if I had seen this letter, and I said I had not, and while we were talking, I dug the letter out of my mail. Uh, as a result of this letter and our conversation, he asked me, he was uh, indicating that he didn't, he still wanted to keep an arm's length from Mr. Hunt. Uh, he had, throughout the matter, tried to keep an arm's length from Mr. Hunt. I told him I would have to talk to Mr. Ehrlichman before I could make any suggestion. I went to Ehrlichman, told him the situation, and uh, Mr. Ehrlichman told Mr. Colson that he thought he ought to meet with Mr. Bittman, and subsequently they did meet. Now, will you look at exhibit number 43, which you inserted in your testimony yesterday? It's also an interesting document. As I recall your testimony as you presented it yesterday, it's a list of all of the people that you thought had violated the law and uh, what the laws may be that they violated. Is that correct? That is correct. Let's start with the top of the list. Now, that's in your own handwriting, is it not? That is correct. And this is a copy thereof. That is correct. What is the significance of the uh, letters that the top left-hand part of that sheet. That's the, the list is broken down into two parts. 
Senator. One says pre and the other is post. This was By pre, you mean prior to the Watergate break-in. That is correct. The planning and execution of those events. Is that, that is what correct. You, and you list in that category Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Magruder, and Mr. Strawn. Is that, that is correct. correct. Now you have a star by Mr. Mitchell's name. No star by Mr. Magruder. Well, let me understand. Let me ex maybe if I explain the whole sure. list, uh, it would save some questions for you. Uh, I have listed for pre Mitchell, Magruder, Stan or Strawn, Post, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Dean, Larue, Mardian, O'Brien, Parkinson, Colson, Bittman, Kambach, Tony. Uh, I have that's the word source. I'll explain that in a minute. Stands. Now, beside uh, several of the names, after I did the list, I said uh, it had made, just my first reaction was that there certainly are an awful lot of lawyers involved here. So I put a little asterisk beside each lawyer, which was Mitchell, Strawn, Ehrlichman, Dean, Mardian, O'Brien, Parkinson, Colson, Bittman, and Kambach. And then I put, as we were discussing the development of the list, the evidence that I knew sort of firsthand or had reason to believe that others had firsthand uh, evidence of that I thought that a very strong case might be made against. The ones that I was not as sure about were, were ones I put a question mark on. This was just something I was working out in my own mind in a discussion I'd had with my lawyer as a result of discussions he'd also had with some of the prosecutors. Any significance to the star? Uh, those They're are all lawyers? No, I, I, that was just a, a reaction myself to the fact that uh, how in God's name could so many lawyers get involved in something like this? And what do the check marks indicate on the left-hand side of the paper? I don't know. Now, you have uh, parentheses there and some other things there. I presume, what, what is that language on the right? That, that was because I'd had earlier discussions with Ehrlichman and Haldeman about this, and they asked me, what, you know, what uh, is the obstruction of justice? So I dug out the obstruction of justice statutes, which are sections uh, 371, which I believe is the conspiracy statute, and 1503, and put uh, the, the sanctions beside them, five years and $10,000, and five years and $5,000 for potential obstruction of justice. When I took this list to Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman uh, said, well, I may have to dig. He said, I don't think this sounds like an obstruction of justice. And he, I said, well, you may want to look at the statute. And I said, but particularly read the annotations to the statute because I think you'll find some case law which indicates that obstruction of justice is as broad as the imagination of man to obstruct justice. <clears throat> Well, your significance, then, was that those gentlemen had violated those statutes and were guilty of those particular offenses which carried either a five-year sentence of $10,000 or five years and 5000 Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Dean. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. The subcommittee will stay in stand in recess to 2 o'clock. At this point in time... The two counsel and Senator Talmadge have set the pattern for questioning John Dean. They are checking his testimony, and they are testing his credibility, and that will continue. After the luncheon recess, public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
I had a call the next morning from Mr. O'Brien on the same subject. I had a call from Mr. Colson, Colson who told me that Mr. Bittman was trying to reach him. Uh, he asked me if I'd seen this letter, and I said I had not, and while we were talking, I dug the letter out of my mail. Uh, as a result of this letter and our conversation, he asked me, he was uh, indicating that he didn't, he still wanted to keep an arm's length from Mr. Hunt. Uh, he had, throughout the matter, tried to keep an arm's length from Mr. Hunt. I told him I would have to talk to Mr. Ehrlichman before I could make any suggestion. I went to Ehrlichman, told him the situation, and uh, Mr. Ehrlichman told Mr. Colson he thought he ought to meet with Mr. Bittman, and subsequently they did meet. Now, will you look at exhibit number 43, which you inserted in your testimony yesterday. That's also an interesting document. As I recall your testimony as you presented it yesterday, it's a list of all of the people that you thought had violated the law and uh, what the laws may be that they violated. Is that correct? That is correct. Let's start with the top of the list. Now, that's in your own handwriting, is it not? That is correct. This is a copy thereof. That is correct. What is the significance of the uh, letters at the top left-hand part of that sheet? That the, the list is broken down into two parts. Senator, one says pre, and the other is post. This was By pre, you mean prior to the Watergate break-in? That is correct. The planning and execution of those events. Is that, that is what correct. You, and you list in that category Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Magruder, and Mr. Strawn. Is that, that is correct. correct. Now you have a star by Mr. Mitchell's name. No star by Mr. Magruder. Well, let me understand. Let me ex maybe if I explain the whole sure. list, uh, it would save some questions for you. Uh, I have listed for pre Mitchell, Magruder, Stan or Strawn, Post, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Dean, Larue, Mardian, O'Brien, Parkinson, Colson, Bittman, Kambach, Tony. Uh, I have, that's the word source, I'll explain that in a minute, stands. Now, beside uh, several of the names, after I did the list, I said, uh, it had made, just my first reaction was, that there certainly are an awful lot of lawyers involved here. So I put a little asterisk beside each lawyer, which was Mitchell, Strawn, Ehrlichman, Dean, Mardian, O'Brien, Parkinson, Colson, Bittman, and Kambach. <laughs> and then I put as we were discussing the development of the list, the evidence that I knew sort of firsthand or had reason to believe that others had firsthand uh, evidence of that I thought that a very strong case might be made against. The ones that I was not as sure about were, were ones I put a question mark on. This was just something I was working out in my own mind in a discussion I'd had with my lawyer as a result of discussions he'd also had with some of the prosecutors. Any significance to the star? Uh, those They're are all lawyers? No, I, I, that was just a, a reaction myself to the fact that uh, how in God's name could so many lawyers get involved in something like this? And what do the check marks indicate on the left-hand side of the paper? I don't know. Now, you have... Uh, Parentheses there and some other things there. I presume, what, what is that language on the right? That, that was because I'd had earlier discussions with Ehrlichman and Haldeman about this, and they asked me, what, you know, what uh, is the obstruction of justice? So I dug out the obstruction of justice statutes, which are sections uh, 371, which I believe is the conspiracy statute, and 1503, and put uh, the, the, the sanctions beside them, five years and $10,000 and five years and $5,000 for potential obstruction of justice. When I took this list to Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman uh, said, well, I may have to dig. He said, I don't think this sounds like an obstruction of justice. And I said, well, you may want to look at the statute. And I said, but particularly 
read the annotations to the statute because I think you'll find some case law which indicates that obstruction of justice is as broad as the imagination of man to obstruct justice. So your significance, then, was that those gentlemen had violated those statutes and were guilty of those particular offenses which carried either a five-year sentence of $10,000 or five years and 5000 Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Dean. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. The subcommittee will stay in re stand in recess to 2 o'clock. At this point in time, the two counsel and Senator Talmadge have set the pattern for questioning John Dean. They are checking his testimony, and they are testing his credibility, and that will continue. After the luncheon recess, public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, Correspondent Jim Lehrer. As the committee is called back to order, it is Senator Lowell Weicker's turn. Uh, the committee will come to order. Senator Weicker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dean, I'd like to, if possible, completely change gears uh, from the testimony which you gave this morning and go right back to the beginning uh, of your statement which you made yesterday. And I'm going to, in order that uh, we can put this in its proper context, because it is so completely different from much of what was discussed this morning and at a later date yesterday, I'm going to uh, read the early portions of uh, your statement in order that I might set the framework framework for the questions uh, uh, which I'm going to ask. It was when I joined the, and this is quoting from your statement of yesterday, it was when I joined the White House staff in July of 1970 that I became fully aware of the extent of concern at the White House regarding demonstrator, demonstrations and intelligence information relating to demonstrators. It was approximately one month after I arrived at the White House that I was informed about the project that had been going on before I arrived to restructure the government's intelligence gathering capacities vis-a-vis -vis demonstrators and domestic radicals. The revised domestic intelligence plan was submitted in a document for the President. The committee has in its possession a copy of that document and certain related memoranda pursuant to the order of Judge Sirica. 
Uh, I want to inform the chairman and members of the committee so there's no apprehension here. I do not intend to go into the memorandum of 1970. I understand that uh, uh, there are uh, matters contained therein which the chairman uh, is handling at the present time. So it's yes. not my intent to go into that document itself. After I was told of the presidentially approved plan that called for bugging, burglarizing, mail covers, and the like, I was instructed by Haldeman to see what I could do to get the plan implemented. I thought the plan was totally uncalled for and justified. I talked with Mitchell about the plan, and he said he knew there was a great desire at the White House to see the plan implemented, but he agreed fully with FBI Director Hoover, who opposed the plan with one exception. He thought that an interagency evaluation committee might be useful because it was not good to have the FBI standing alone without the information of other intelligence agencies. And the sharing of information is always good and avoids duplication. After my conversation with Mitchell, I wrote a memorandum requesting that the evaluation committee be established and the restraints could be removed later. I told Haldeman that the only way to proceed was one step at a time, and this could be an important first step. He agreed. The Interagency Evaluation Committee, IEC, was created, as I recall, in early 1971. I requested that Jack Caulfield, who had been assigned to my office to serve as the White House liaison to the IEC, and when Mr. Caulfield left the White House, Mr. David Wilson and my staff served as liaison. I am unaware of the IEC ever having engaged in any illegal assignments, and certainly no such assignment was ever requested by my office. The reports from the IEC, or summaries of the reports, were forwarded to Haldeman and sometimes Ehrlichman. In addition to the intelligence reports from the IEC, my office also received regular intelligence reports regarding demonstrators and radical groups from the FBI and on some occasions from the CIA. A member of my staff would review the material to determine if it should be forwarded to Mr. Haldeman, that is, for bringing to the President's attention, or sent it to another member of the staff who might have an interest in the contents of the report. And then you give uh, several examples relative to Mr. Garment and to Mr. Kissinger. Now. Uh, on page 14 of your testimony, or rather at the bottom of page 13, you refer to another incident that occurred. It was not until almost a year or more later that I learned the reason for Mardian's trip to see the President. Mr. Mardian later told me in a social conversation that he had gone to see the President to get instructions regarding the disposition of wiretap logs that related to newsmen and White House staffers who were suspected of leaking. These logs had been in possession of Mr. William Sullivan, an assistant director of the FBI, and were, per Mr. Mardian's instructions, from the President, given to Ehrlichman. I had occasion to raise a question about these logs with Ehrlichman during the fall of 1972, and he flatly denied to me that he had the logs. I did not tell him at that time. I had been told by Marty, and he had them. And about February 22nd or 23rd of this year, Time Magazine notified the White House it was going to print a story that the White House had undertaken wiretaps of newsmen and White House staff and requested a response. The White House press office notified me of this inquiry. I called Mr. Mark Felt at the FBI to ask him first what the facts were and secondly how such a story could leak. Mr. Felt told me that it was true that Mr. Sullivan knew all the facts, that he had no idea how it leaked. I then called Mr. Sullivan and requested that he drop by my office, which he did. He explained that after much haggling that the wiretaps were installed, but as I recall, Mr. Sullivan said they did not have the blessing of Director Hoover. Mr. Sullivan explained to me that all but one set of the logs had been destroyed and all the internal FBI records relating to the wiretaps except one set had been destroyed and all the material had been delivered to Mr. Mardian. After Mr. Sullivan departed, I called Mr. Mitchell, who told me he also had an inquiry from Time Magazine and denied to Time Magazine any knowledge of the matter. I did not press him further as to what he did know. I then called Mr. Ehrlichman and told him about the forthcoming story. I told him of my conversations with Felt, Sullivan, and Mitchell. I also told him I knew he had the logs because Mr. Martin had told me. This time he admitted they were in his safe. I asked him how Mr. Ziegler should handle it. He said Mr. Ziegler should flatly deny it, period. I thanked him, called Mr. Ziegler, and so advised him. Now, Mr. Dean, this sets the general framework uh, uh, as to the areas of, of uh, my inquiry this afternoon. Um, and the first, the first question that arises uh, is that in, during the course of questioning uh, by this committee, Mr. McCord stated that he went to the uh, Internal Security Division and obtained uh, from him, uh, Mr. John Martin and Mr. Joel Lisker uh, information, uh, which he then 
brought back to the committee to re-elect the president and disseminated among the various members of the committee to re-elect. Uh, my first question to you is based upon a visit which I made shortly after Mr. McCord's testimony to the Internal Security Division and in talks which I had with Mr. Martin uh, and Mr. Uh, Kevin Maroney. Uh, and it relates to the fact as to whether or not you know who authorized who authorized the release of that information by Messrs. Martin and Lisker at the Internal Security Division? Uh, Senator, I have only a general awareness of this area, and to the best of my recollection, and uh, uh, I don't know, I don't recall who told me this, but this was an arrangement that was worked out by Mr. Martian before he departed uh, the Department of Justice to join the re-election committee. In other words, the arrangement of releasing information from the Internal Security Division to McCord was authorized by Marty. And this never came to your attention as being authorized by anybody in the White House. I, I don't recall that uh, it did. It's uh, uh, my office did have dealings, as I have said, with the uh, Internal Security Division. I don't recall specifically uh, this subject coming up. I recall subsequent conversations uh, in which Mr. Martian told me that uh, he had made an arrangement uh, of some sort after it was initially uh, arrived at. But, of course, and at this moment in time, Mr. Martian is over at the committee to re-elect the president. Mr. Olson is at the head of the Internal Security Division. That's correct. And did your office have any dealings with Mr. Olson? No. I, well, I had, I had dealings with him, but they were on uh, departmental matters where uh, the practice had evolved that when the department was going to release in a uh, uh, major case, uh, electronically obtained evidence under a court order, uh, they would notify the White House of this procedure. Could you amplify on that? I'm, I'm not so sure uh, I understand. When, when, a, when a major case was going on and a defendant would call for whether or not there was any electronic uh, surveillance of his conversations at any time, and the government made a decision to release this information, uh, if it was a very political or sensitive case, this matter would be brought to the attention of the, of the White House, and Mr. Olson would generally inform me that he was going to do this. And can you give me some specific examples as to cases that involve that kind of release of information? Well, if I'm trying to, trying to think. It was, it was some of the more celebrated cases uh, in connection with anti-war demonstrators. And I cannot recall with any specificity. And uh, having not had an opportunity to go back through my files, uh, it's, it's rather difficult to uh, remember this off the top. Is it a fact, uh, Mr. Dean, that uh, Mr. Olson and Kevin Maroney uh, came to your office, at least on one occasion, maybe there are others that, that you know that we can uh, discuss, uh, to give you information relative to the law on foreign contributions? Yes, they did. Well, I, I, recall, uh, I recall a conversation with them both about it. I don't recall whether it was in my office or telephonic uh, in which I raised the subject. I had always assumed that foreign contributions were prohibited under the law. I had been asked by Mr. Stans at one point uh, who had received a memorandum from Mr. Liddy when he was serving as counsel of the Finance Committee indicating that this was a proper contribution to receive. Uh, I had occasion to talk to uh, Mr. Olson and Mr. Uh, Maroney about this, and they had reached another conclusion. They felt it was not on their reading of the Foreign Agents Registration Act that uh, unless the, the individual was an agent, in fact, and not a principal, that uh, such a contribution was not violative of the, of the federal law. 
Why, why would you seek such information from the Internal Security Division of the Justice Department? Because they had jurisdiction over that area of the law. And what were your contacts or any other contacts that you had with the Internal Security Division? Do you feel that any information was supplied uh, to your office from the Internal Security Division that might have had some sort of political impact? Well, I think some of the, some of the reports that the uh, IEC were prepared uh, had political implications to them, but those did not go outside of the White House. Now, I would have to review those reports, and I have not done that either, uh, regarding demonstrations and, and the like. I did, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, after I had talked to, to Mr. Haldeman about what my office should be doing uh, regarding the forthcoming election, I called Mr. Wells, who was then the head of the IEC over. Mr. Caulfield brought him over and told him that uh, the White House was very anxious to have the best intelligence possible uh, regarding the potentials of demonstrations during the uh, forthcoming campaign. And so that uh, you maintained a liaison with the, uh, with the IEC? I would say that of all my contacts with the Justice Department, my most infrequent contacts were with the Internal Security Division. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I have in my hand here um, a position report on the Internal Security Division a position report as of April the 15th, 1972. Uh, it's the same report which already has been uh, brought to the attention of the committee, which I submitted to uh, Mr. McCord uh, for him to identify those individuals with which he had contact, specifically Mr. Martin and Mr. Lisker. Uh, in this uh, position report dated April 15th, 1972, under the offices, Office of Analysis and Planning, there are listed uh, Bernard Wells, Executive Director of the IDIU, and two assistants, James McGrath and, and Joyce Webb. Again, in the interviews which I had, at the Internal Security Division after Mr. McCord's testimony, it was explained to me quite openly that, in fact, this Office of Analysis and Planning and this position of director of the IDIU were a cover uh, for the IEC. Now, this report is dated April of 72. I'll be glad to have you take a look at it. Does this in any way relate to recommendations uh, which you had made at an earlier date? Well, uh, now, I, the, ID, ID, the IDIU was a unit that was in existence right. at one point in time in the, in the Justice Department. Uh, it was basically a newspaper clipping operation to follow what the demonstrators were doing. As I understand, they subscribed to the, the magazines and publications of the, of the New Left try to just analyze from those publications what they were doing as well as anything else they could <clears throat> could pick up. Uh, when the decision was made to establish the IEC, uh, the IDIU unit was virtually defunct at that time. And as I recall, there was discussion about the fact that the IDIU did exist and that it could very easily be the explanation for the IEC, which was not to, to be a publicly known uh, intelligence evaluation group, and this was the, uh, the decision to put the I, IDIU cover over the IEC. Uh, now, as I recall also, the initial person that was placed in charge of the IEC was Mr. Doherty. Uh, who had been at the Internal Security uh, Division for quite some time, but was planning on, on retiring at some point. Uh, there were also suggestions that other, somebody else uh, might come in and head this unit up. Well, I, don't, I appreciate 
I appreciate your answer, and you've answered my question. Okay. If we can just track this in sure. logical time sequence, that's all. Uh, uh, so it, it is true, in other words, that the, the concept of the IEC does sit there uh, uh, covered by the Office's analysis planning uh, uh, the position of IDIU. Is that correct? That is correct. And was this the subject of a letter which you wrote John Mitchell? I believe in the documents that I turned over uh, to the uh, to the court initially, there was a memorandum in there that was based on a conversation that Mitchell and I had had to had as to how to establish uh, this very small segment of a rather large and dramatic plan. Now, whether that was in that document or not, I cannot recall. I have not reviewed those documents virtually since the time they were written. Uh, so you're asking me to recall something that's about three years old, and I'm not uh, terribly fresh in my recollection on it. But in other words, when I show you a position report that is dated April 15th of 1972, which in effect has in the position report a unit, which both of us have identified as the IEC, under the cover of the IDIU, this was the recommendation made back in the summer of 1970. Is that correct? I think that's an accurate statement to uh, the best so of my I'm recollection. I'm not talking about illegal activity. No, no, I understand else. exactly what you're Just talking about. Just the setting up of the unit as recommended in September of 1970, it does still exist in the offices of analysis and planning. I've got to get rid of that word, office of analysis and planning. Um, uh, section uh, IDIU, is that correct? Uh, to the best of my recollection, it is, Senator, but as I say, I, I uh, would have to check documents in my own office to remember the accuracy of that, and that, uh, that's generally the way I recall it occurring, yes. The uh, first step, then, was taken insofar as setting up the structure. Was that the first step? Yes. Right. I think the, uh, the step, the first step, was the decision to take a very small part of the plan, uh, the only part of the plan that was not illegal, uh, and begin right. with that. And that was, then there was a series of correspondence, and I believe I had some meetings with Mr. Mitchell about this in his office, and we discussed some of these concepts. Do you have any ideas to when those meetings took place? Well, they would have occurred about the time that uh, uh, my initial memorandum went over, uh, either preceding it and some that followed it. Uh, there was still resistance at this point in time on, on the, uh, the part of the FBI as to its participation in the unit. And it was as a result of this uh, resistance by the FBI that Mr. Haldeman told me to talk to Mr. Mitchell about it. And Mr. Haldeman also said, as I recall, that he was willing to come over and talk to Mr. Mitchell himself about it if I had any problem. Mr. Chairman? You wish to use one of these documents? I would very specifically like to use the document, Mr. Chairman, which is the letter uh, uh, sent by uh, uh, Mr. Dean to Mr. Mitchell. Yes, uh, yes uh, I might state for the record that on yesterday, Senator Baker and myself, by authority of the unanimous vote of, of the committee, sent the following letter to the White House. The uh, June the 25th, 1973, the President of the White House, Washington, D.C., dear Mr. President, 
A former White House employee, John W. Dean III, delivered to His Honor Judge John J. Sirico, Chief Judge of the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, certain documents. Judge Sirico subsequently ordered copies of these documents delivered to the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. These documents may be briefly described as follows. First, a document which is entitled Special Report Interagency Committee Intelligence, which constitutes a review of the systems by which foreign and domestic intelligence is collected by the FBI, CIA, DIA, and NSA. This document is 43 pages long and is signed by the then heads of the four intelligence gathering agencies. Second, a document entitled Recommendations, which relates to operational restraints on intelligence collection. This document was apparently prepared in June 1970, but does not bear the date of the month on which it was finalized. Third, a memorandum from H.R. Haldeman to Tom Charles Huston, dated July 14, 1970. Fourth, a memorandum from Tom, from Tom Charles Huston to H.R. Haldeman, dated August 7, 1970, which relates to domestic intelligence. Five, a memorandum from Tom Charles Huston to H.R. Haldeman, dated August 7, 1970, which is entitled Domestic Intelligence Review. Six, a memorandum from John Dean to the Attorney General relating to the agencies, to the Interagency Domestic Intelligence Unit, dated September 18, 1970, which bears a notation that it was returned to John W. Dean by the Attorney General's office on March 3, 1972. All of these documents are marked top secret except the memorandum from Tom Charles Huston to H.R. Haldeman dated August 7, 1970, which is marked confidential. The committee agrees that the first number document relates in substantial part to foreign intelligence and ought not to be disclosed. It believes, however, that all of the, por all of the portions of the other documents which relate to domestic intelligence or internal security should be released at the hearings. And for this reason, the committee has unanimously authorized and directed us as chairman and vice chairman to, to ask you forthwith to declassify them. In addition, the committee has authorized and directed us to request that you declassify two additional documents, which have been printed in the New York Times and the Washington Post, <laughs> insofar as they relate to domestic intelligence and internal security. These additional documents are as follows. First, a decision memorandum dated July the 15th, 1970, bearing the title Decision Memorandum of the White House, Washington. Second, a document entitled Organization and Operations of the Interagency Group on Domestic Intelligence and Internal Security. The committee desires to interrogate witnesses concerning these documents and for this reason respectfully request that you forthwith declassify them. Sincerely yours, Sam Jerevin, Jr. Chairman, Howard H. Baker, Jr., Vice Chairman. This is going to the record. On this morning, I received the following letter. The White House, Washington, June the 26, 1973. Dear Senator Irvin, in a telephone conversation this morning with Mr. Rufus Edmiston of your staff, Fred Buzart and I stated that the Senate Select Committee should use its discretion with respect to the utilization of the documents referred to in your letter to the President dated June the 25th, 1973. It is our understanding that the agencies having responsibilities in the foreign intelligence areas have provided extensive advice to the Senate on these documents. In this connection, Mr. Edmiston stated that the committee intended to use, utilize only those portions relating to domestic intelligence activities and would not make public any material referring to any foreign intelligence activities or capabilities. Mr. Edmiston asked that I confirm this conversation to you and in writing during the recess luncheon, which I am pleased to do, sincerely, Leonard Garment. This will also go in the record. Now, as I understand it, uh, Senator Weicker, you desire to uh, interrogate the witness concerning a, a commu uh, the communication.
I understand you wish to interrogate the witness about one of, the, of these documents, and I would suggest that uh, in order to have the thing uh, in consecutive order that we ask the witness if he can testify rather than have him identify all of the copies of the documents referred to in this letter. Here's number eight. I, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, Senator Weicker is referring to the memorandum that I wrote yes. to the Attorney Just General. Just before we do, I'd like to, to give you copies of these uh, papers. I would like very much to see them to refresh and my recollection might, on the documents. Uh, might give copies of uh, two other documents which are not classified. One is uh, a letter, a memo from H.R. Holliman to H.R. Holliman from Tom Charles Huston. <laughs> Dated August the 25th, 1970, referring to SACB appropriations, and a letter date, a memo to H.R. Holliman from Tom Charles Huston, dated September the 10th, 1970, neither of which is classified. Yes, yes, I've never seen, seen them before. In other words, what I want, uh, uh, preliminary to Senator White continuing his examination, I want to identify all the documents and all of them admitted to the record. And, uh, and the, yes. In other words, I request the question that uh, be asked of Mr. Dean is uh, whether or not, not he can identify these documents as having been documents which he did copies of documents which he delivered to Judge Sirica and which Judge Sirica ought to deliver to this committee. Senator, just out of an abundance of caution, I would like to advise the chairman and the vice chairman that although his lawyers participated in the delivery of the documents to Judge Sirica, it was done by Mr. Dean placing the documents in a safe deposit box and the keys then be de being delivered to the court. And the documents never came into our possession, nor did we see them. Mr. Chairman, do I understand Mr. Shafter to be saying that in an abundance of precaution, he wishes to indicate that he and Mr. McCandless have not previously received possession of these documents? That's right. I think it would be appropriate, Mr. Chairman, if you concur to state that on behalf of the committee, we think it's desirable and I think essential for counsel to be able to confer now with Mr. Dean on uh, these documents on our authority. I, I agree with you, absolutely. Thank you. The committee will uh, will uh, take a recess or stand at ease anyway until uh, the attorneys can and Mr. Dean can confer about these documents. To protect their client, John Dean's attorneys have interrupted the proceedings at this point. Dean took the documents from his White House safe and gave them to Judge John Sirica. The judge gave one copy of, to the federal prosecutors and one to the Senate committee. The attorneys want to keep Dean from revealing any government secrets in violation of the law. Public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. As we go back to the hearing, Senator Irvin is separating the documents, some to be kept secret, others to become part of the committee record. Everyone take the seats, please. Identify those uh, documents. Number, I believe, they're numbered uh, two. copies with uh, certain deletions of, of uh, matters relating to foreign intelligence as being uh, the documents you delivered, the copies of the documents you delivered to Judge Sirica? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. Now, there's one other document. I'm going to ask for Mr. George Murphy, Deputy Director of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, who has had custody of these documents since they were delivered it by Judge Sirica's order to this committee to show you a, a, another document which is not included among those copies. Can you identify that document handed you by Mr. Murphy? As being one of the documents you delivered to, to Judge Sirica? This is a copy of the original. Copy of it. That's correct. Yes. Now you can, uh, is that, uh, does that have some identification mark? Uh, yes, it's, it's a special report, Interagency Committee on Intelligence Ad Hoc, dated uh, June 1970, with the chairman indicated J. Edgar Hoover with a classification on it. You can return that to Mr. Murphy now. It has top secret comment yes. classification on it. And um, I, I won't take this occasion to thank Mr. Murphy, the Deputy Director of the Atom Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, for acting as custodian of these documents since they were delivered to us by Judge Sirica, and for the great help which he has given to the committee in re respect to the contents of the document, in respect to their uh, uh, sensitive nature, and, and uh, we can't thank you too much, Mr. Murphy. And I'm going to ask you to re retain, uh, re uh, retain jurisdiction of the, the originals of these documents, and also we have no copy of that first document there. Thank you very much, Mr. Murphy. And it is, uh, the committee is anxious to avoid uh, disclosing any matters that affect national security, which uh, is uh, which uh, are matters uh, defined as matters relating to national defense or our relations of our nation with other nations. And uh, for this reason, uh, we will not uh, make this first document public. Mr. Chairman, would I say a word in Yes. I, too, would like to join in thanking Mr. Murphy, who, in addition to being the deputy director of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy staff, is the security officer for the Joint Committee. I'm a member of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, and while we're going about our bread and butter thanks, I'd like to thank Congressman Mel Price, who is chairman of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, for consenting, as did the rest of the committee, to this additional burden on the staff of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy to assure that the storage of these documents was done in accordance with the requirements of the law. 
Now, one other question, then I'll turn it back to uh, the sons of the wife. How did you get possession of these documents, and including the one that the Mr. Murphy was retained custody of? Uh, the documents were originally in the possession of Mr. Tom Houston, uh, who had been assigned, I believe, directly by the president to work on this project. Uh, when I came on the White House staff, Mr. Houston was placed on my staff and was on my staff uh, for some time. I had a general awareness of the fact that he was working on this project, but none of the specifics. Uh, at the time Mr. Houston was departing the staff, he turned over uh, the documents to me that I had possession of. Some of the documents uh, that are contained and I maintained in the file, I had never seen before uh, the time he turned them over to me. Uh, the only I had seen the basic document uh, shortly after I joined the White House staff when Mr. Haldeman told me that Mr. Houston had been working to get the plan implemented, but uh, uh, there were some difficulties in implementation. Uh, that is basically how I came in contact with the matter. Have you had the, the physical cost, the phys physical cost custody of these papers since that time? That, well, and I had them until I took them and placed them in a safety deposit box under an instruction of Senator Mansfield that anything that might have any bearing on this entire matter should be preserved. Senator Weicker, you may resume your examination this point. I thought it was Thank wise you, to bring all of the, all of the documents and evidence that uh, we think ought to be put there. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, Mr. Dean, would you be good enough then to read to the committee the memorandum uh, from you to Mr. Mitchell, which I believe, now I've got to rely on my memory of uh, several months' time, or months' time since I've seen these things, uh, uh, dated September of 1970, is that correct? September 18th. September 18th. 1970. <laughs> memorandum for the Attorney General. Pursuant to our conversation yesterday, September 17, 1970, I suggest the following procedures to commence our domestic intelligence operation as quickly as possible. One, interagency domestic intelligence unit. A key to the entire operation will be the creation of an interagency intelligence unit for both operational and evaluation purposes. Obviously, the selection of persons to this unit will be of vital importance to the success of the mission. As we discussed, the selection of the personnel for this unit is an appropriate first step for several reasons. First, effective coordination of the different agencies must be developed at an early stage through the establishment of the unit. Second, Hoover has indicated a strong opposition to the creation of such a unit, and to bring the FBI fully on board, this seems an appropriate first step to guarantee their proper and full participation in the program. Third, the unit can serve to make appropriate recommendations for the types of intelligence that should be immediately pursued by the various agencies. In regard to this third point, I believe we agreed that it would be inappropriate to have any blanket removal of the restrictions. Rather, the most appropriate procedure would be to decide on the type of intelligence we need based on an assessment of the recommendations of this unit and then to proceed to remove restraints as necessary to obtain such intelligence. To proceed to create the inter interagency intelligence unit, particularly the evaluation group or committee, I recommend that we request the names of four nominees from each of the intelligence agencies involved. While the precise composition of the unit may vary as we gain experience, I think that two members should be appointed initially from each agency in addition to your personal representative who should also be involved in this proceeding. Because of the interagency aspects of this request, it would probably be, probably be best if the request came from the White House. If you, ag if you agree, I will make such a request of the agency heads. However, I feel it is essential that you work this out with Hoover before I have any dealings with him directly. Second, housing. We discussed the appropriate housing of this operation, and upon reflection, I believe that rather than, the White, than a White House staffer looking for suitable space, 
that a professional intelligence person should be assigned the task of locating such space. Accordingly, I would suggest a request be made that Mr. Hoover assign an agent to this task. In connection with the housing problem, I think serious consideration must be given to the appropriate Justice Department cover for a domestic intelligence operation. We discussed yesterday using IDIU as, as a cover, and as I indicated, I believe that it is a most appropriate cover. I believe that it is generally felt that the IDIU is already a far more extensive intelli intelligence operation than has been mentioned publicly, and that the IDIU operation cover would eliminate the problem of discovering a new intelligence operation in the Department of Justice. However, I have reservations about the personnel in the IDIU and its present operation activities and would suggest that they neither be given they either be given a minor function within the new intelligence operation or that the staff be completely removed. I have had only incidental dealings with the personnel other than Jim Devine and cannot speak to their discretion and loyalty for such an operation. I do not believe that Jim Devine is capable of any major position within the new intelligence operation. However, I do believe that he could help perpetuate the cover, and he has evidenced the loyalty to you, the deputy, and other key people in the Department of Justice, despite his strong links with prior administrations. I would defer to your judgment, of course, on any recommendation regarding Jim Devine's continued presence in such an intelligence operation. Three, assistant to the Attorney General. We also discussed the need for you to have a right-hand man to assist in running this operation. It would seem that what is needed is a man with administrative skills, a sensitivity to the implications of the current radical and, and subversive movements within the United States, and preferably some background in intelligence work. To maintain the cover, I would think it appropriate for the man to have a law degree and that he would be a part of the Department of Justice. You suggested the po possibility of using a prosecutor who had experience with cases of this type. Accordingly, I have spoken with Harlington Wood to ask him to submit the names of five assistant U.S. attorneys who have had experience in dealing with demonstrations or riot-type cases and who are mature individuals that might be appropriately given a sensitive assignment in the Department of Justice. I did not discuss the matter in any further detail with Wood other than to, to request the submission of some nominees. I would also like to suggest that we request the names from the various intelligence agencies involved for personnel that might be appropriately involved in this activity and who might serve as your assistant. In summary, I recommend the following immediate action. One, you meet with Hoover, explain what must be done, and request his nominees for the interagency unit. Two, you request that Hoover assign an agent to the task of locating appropriate housing for the operation. Three, I request the other involved intelligence agencies submit nominees for the interagency unit. Four, I request from the agencies the names of appropriate personnel for assignment to the operation. Finally, I would like to, I would suggest that you call weekly meetings to monitor the problems as they emerge and to make certain that we are moving this program to, into implementation as quickly as possible. Note at the signed and a note at the bottom. Bob Holloman has suggested to me that if you would like him to join you in meeting with Hoover, he will be happy to do so. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Now, this, in other words, refers to that statement uh, or that portion of your statement of yesterday where you say, I wrote a memorandum requesting that the evaluation committee be established and the restraints could be removed later. I told Haldeman that the only way to proceed was one step at a time, and this could be an important first step he agreed. That is correct. Uh, I might footnote that with, with the remark that I was quite aware of a great interest in the, in the matter, and after uh, some discussions with Mr. Houston, who still had a, uh, a hope that the entire plan would be adopted, I had reached the conclusion that there was no way the whole plan was going to be adopted, and that the only thing that was essential was the uh, IEC, and that this would satisfy everybody that we were at least doing something to solve the problem, and this was a first step that uh, seemed to solve or to resolve that, uh, that pressure with everybody. So after uh, 
this memorandum was written, you then proceeded to uh, set up the IEC insofar as the, the structure, the placing of it uh, in the Internal Security Division. Is that correct? I think what happened is, uh, and I'm not uh, terribly familiar with the mechanics of how this actually did occur, I, I believe that Mr. Mitchell did have a conversation with Mr. Hoover and reached some agreement as to their participation. I don't, uh, I don't know how the decision was made to place it in the internal security unit, but I did learn of that at some point because they told me they had space that they had set aside in the internal security unit's office, which was separate and apart from the uh, Department of Justice, and the main Department of Justice. And I'd learned that uh, Mr. Doherty would be sort of the man uh, that would be heading the operation initially. May I ask you this question in relation to Mr. Doherty? Was there a discussion at any time of this unit's first head being Mr. Morell Sharp? Uh, yes, there was. Mr. Ehrlichman was aware of this as well. And uh, Judge Sharp, uh, who had, was a friend of Mr. Ehrlichman's, apparently had been, as I recall, uh, he was an elective judge, and he either hadn't been reelected or something of that nature. An appointment had run out, and he was uh, not currently sitting on the bench anywhere. And Mr. Ehrlichman thought that this would be an excellent thing for him to do and invited him to come to Washington. And we had a number of meetings on it. And the more he looked at it, uh, uh, the less he decided he wanted to get involved at it. And so that the uh, first head was Mr. John Doherty? I believe that is correct. Did you hold any discussions in your office with Mr. Sharp or Mr. Doherty uh, relative to the IEC? I'm sure probably with, with both individuals, yes. And, then, I, and, 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 what, and what other persons would have been present at those meetings? Well, I can't recall anybody else being present when I talked to, uh, to Judge Sharp. Um, I know that I, I do recall that when he decided he wasn't interested because, uh, one, he felt he didn't know much about this field and he'd have a whole education to uh, become acquainted with it. I think he spent a couple of weeks looking into the matter. I think he learned that it was going to be some sort of, uh, you know, it was going to be a, a secret operation that he would be running in the Department of Justice, and he wanted to be able to explain just what he was doing to people back with, with people back home, and he didn't want to have to say, I uh, can't tell you what I'm doing in Washington. And we had a number of discussions about other assignments for him, and, I, and he did some very valuable legal work for my office uh, in connection with some trade matters that had come to my office for resolution. Now, Mr. Dean, then Mr. Doherty was its first head, and he was succeeded by who? I believe by Mr. Wells. By Mr. Bernard Wells? Yes. All right. So from the time of your memorandum to the time of your talk with Haldeman uh, to the setting up of the mechanics of the operation, the administrative details of the operation, to this moment in time, does it come to, as any surprise to you, uh, the document which I'll uh, pass over to you, that uh, listed under the Offices of Analysis and Planning in the Internal Security Division of the Justice Department as of April 15, 1972, is uh, a listing of Bernard Wells, Executive Director, IDIU, uh, and with uh, Mr. James McGrath and Joyce Webb listed under that. Is this basically then the plan that uh, was suggested in your memorandum uh, to John Mitchell? The, the ink marks and the scribblings are mine, or my staff. Uh, I can't glean an awful lot from this, uh, this chart, but I there's guess no, there's, there's no mention of IEC there, is there? No, there's not. And uh, the documents that all came to me were very clearly from the, they were marked IEC on them when they came over. And they came over from Mr. Wells? They came over from Mr. Wells, and... Uh, and would you read to the committee what Mr. Wells has listed as in that document before you? Uh, Executive Director, IDIU. Thank you very much, Frank, down that time. Back. 
Now, you've also stated that, uh, to the best of your knowledge, no uh, illegal, illegal activities were conducted by the IEC. Um, I'd like to get into the matter of your contacts. Well, let me ask one. Let me ask one question before we go on to and, and your contacts with uh, the Internal Security Division. Uh, statements have been made that there was a rescission by the president of the 1970 plan. Why all this business? Well, as I said, at one point, I I don't know uh, about the rescission. Uh, that's something that I don't know. I knew that there was a, uh, a squabble going on between principally Mr. Houston uh, and uh, representing the White House and the FBI. Uh, Mr. Houston uh, talked to me on a number of occasions about the matter. I knew that Mr. Mitchell, when I talked with him about it, both telephonically and when I met with him, was opposed to the, the grand plan that's in that, that manual. And uh, I think what uh, Mitchell and I decided was the best course was to do the minimum amount possible uh, that might satisfy people that something was being done, and that was to create the IEC. Now, it is possible, then, that one of two things might have happened. Either there could have been a rescission by the president, the word of which rescission you never received. Well, That's I, a possibility. Isn't I it? note that there are memoranda in here that follow uh, the date of the memorandum I sent and memorandum I had not seen. And I recall that Mr. Houston was still trying to do something about this uh, even after I sent that memorandum. Yeah, but let me just so I, 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 to answer your, your question, uh, it's very possible uh, that I would not have been aware of, in fact, I wasn't aware at all of a rescission. It is also possible there was no rescission. And I wasn't aware in full of an approval. Uh, that I was, had a general awareness that, you know, I was said, I was told, see what you can do to get this plan implemented. But insofar as your first-hand knowledge is what it, and that's all I'm interested yes, in, sir. you did implement the first step of the plan. That is correct. All right. Now, w could you tell this committee in your, your own words of any other contacts that you had with the Internal Security uh, Division um, insofar as, as information that
Well, as I said, at one point, I, I don't know uh, about the rescission. Uh, that's something that I don't know. I knew that there was a, uh, a squabble going on between principally Mr. Houston uh, and uh, representing the White House and the FBI. Uh, Mr. Houston uh, talked to me on a number of occasions about the matter. I knew that Mr. Mitchell, when I talked with him about it, both telephonically and when I met with him, was opposed to the, the grand plan that's in that, that manual. And uh, I think what uh, Mitchell and I decided was the best course was to do the minimum amount possible uh, that might satisfy people that something was being done, and that was to create the IEC. Now, it is possible, then, that one of two things might have happened. Either there could have been a rescission by the president, the word of which rescission you never received. Well, That's I, a possibility, isn't I it? I note that there are memoranda in here that follow uh, the date of the memorandum I sent and memorandum I had not seen. And I recall that Mr. Houston was still trying to do something about this uh, even after I sent that memorandum. Yeah, but let me just... So I, I, to answer your, your question, uh, it's very possible uh, that I would not have been aware of, in fact, I wasn't aware at all, of a rescission. It is also possible there was no rescission. And I wasn't aware in full of an approval. Uh, that I was had a general awareness that, you know, I was said, I was told, see what you can do to get this plan implemented. But insofar as your first-hand knowledge is what, it, and that's all I'm interested yes, in, sir. you did implement the first step of the plan. That is correct. All right. Now, w could you tell this committee in your, your own words of any other contacts that you had with the Internal Security uh, Division um, insofar as, as information that, that could, be, could have a political value? Did you have any contacts with the Internal Security Division yourself? Uh, as I mentioned in my statement, there was a continual request for information regarding demonstrations, and particularly information that would embarrass individuals in connection with their relationship with demonstrators or demonstration leaders. Uh, the principal liaison. Outside of the area of demonstrations, did any information come to you from the Internal Security Division which could have had a political value? I'm, I'm sure it could have, uh, but I've, without looking into my files, it's impossible for me to remember what it might be. Did you have any direct contact with Division 5 of the FBI? Division 5 of the That's FBI. Right, that was Mr. Sullivan's division. Uh, I knew Mr. Sullivan, but I don't recall having any contact with him when he was at the Internal Security Division. All right. With the CIA? Uh, no. With the Metropolitan Police? I talked to them. In connection with demonstrations, I had a number of conversations with the uh, Metropolitan Police. In fact, I had on my telephone, I had a number of private lines that would go directly to command posts uh, that were concerned with dealing with demonstrations. There was one that went to the Defense Department. There was one that went to the Justice Department, to the what I should call the old IDIU unit, which did become operational uh, at demonstration time. I had contact a telephone line to the Mayor's command post and one to the Secret Service command post. So I. During demonstrations, I did receive information from all these places. Well, to get over this particular area of inquiry, because I don't want to prolong it, insofar as Division 5 or the CIA, the Metropolitan Police, military intelligence... I am not aware of the term Did Division you receive five. any information from these entities, which was of a political nature? And I don't consider information on demonstrations to be of a political nature. It's something that should be applied to... Uh, to all sides, but that could be useful politically. Senator, I, I would like to be able to tell you I uh, could recall, but I cannot recall, and what the answer might be to resolve the question is uh, uh, that the committee might want to go through my files 
and see what's in there. And that would answer the question because I have not destroyed any documents and anything I receive would be there. And my files, of course, are still uh, locked up in the basement of the White House. All right. Let's move on to your comment on page 14, where you refer to your conversation with Mr. Mardian. It was not until almost a year or more later that I learned the reason for Mardian's trip to see the president. Mr. Mardian later told me in a social conversation that he'd gone to see the president to get instructions regarding the disposition of wiretap logs that related to newsmen and White House staffers who were suspected of leaking. Now, would you give us a substance of your, can you, can you expand on the conversation which you had with Robert Mardian at that time? To the best of my recollection, the, the conversation was a very, very minor part of a, a much, a very rambling conversation when I recalled the, uh, the fact that we had gone to San Clemente together and had gone to visit a friend of his in San Clemente uh, and spent some time together. I was out there for one purpose, that was to turn off a burglary of the Brookings Institute uh, he told me that uh, he couldn't tell me what he was out there for. I recall he went down to San Clemente at the same time I did, and I waited for him to have his meeting. Uh, he did not tell me after the meeting what had occurred. And then it was in recounting uh, the fact that uh, our visit with this friend of his out in California when I finally asked him, I said, well, what in the world were you doing out in California? And he said, well, there were some wiretaps, uh, and I had, uh, I'd gotten the logs from, from Sullivan, and I had to get instructions on what to do with them, and I was told to give them to Ehrlichman. It was a very fleeting conversation, but it, uh, uh, it stuck in my memory. All right. You then say, have in your statement the sense I had occasion to raise a question about these logs with Ehrlichman during the fall of 1972. What was that occasion? I tried to recall that as I was preparing my statement, and something did occur in which I asked Ehrlichman directly uh, about the logs, and I cannot recall specifically what it was. Again, it wasn't something that was of, of the moment of the Time magazine inquiry, but it was a, a reference to something about uh, uh, newsmen. There had been on the rumor mill at the White House for some time this, uh, uh, this fact that there, the White House had instructed a surveillance of White House staff members and newsmen in dealing with leaks. And I asked Ehrlichman about it. I said, uh, I said uh, do you have the logs? And he said, no. Uh, and I let it drop at that. Even though at that moment in time, I knew he you had were the under the impression from a talk with Mr. Marty and that you did have the lie. Yes. That he did. I beg your pardon, that he had the lie. Yes, sir. Then comes February 22nd or 23rd of this year, and uh, to paraphrase your, your testimony, I gather you were placed in the position of trying to find out about the leaks of the FBI relative to a potential Time magazine story. That and so that you interviewed yourself, Mr. Sullivan. That's correct. All right, would you describe to the committee, then, the, the nature of that interview? Uh, after I learned of the inquiry, I called Mr. Mark Sullivan, uh, or Mark Felt, to ask him, uh, first of all, if in fact it were true, because I'd never had a confirmation from anyone. I uh, thought I ought to get a direct confirmation. He told me, uh, uh, do you really want to know? And I said, yes, I think I should know. And he told me that, uh, yes, it had occurred, uh, and said that uh, uh, Bill Sullivan has all the facts on this. He was involved in it and knows all those facts. I then asked, uh, I asked uh, Felt if he knew how it had leaked, and he said he didn't have any idea. I then called Sullivan and told him that I, I asked him if he could come to my office. And he did come to my office, and I said that, uh, I had this inquiry from the press office regarding this, and I had some information that, in fact, it had happened, and I wondered what the facts were. And Mr. Sullivan then recounted the fact that uh, he had uh, been involved in this and told me that he had, at one point, 
gotten the most trusted people in the Washington field office to undertake the function that uh, subsequently he had, uh, when Director Hoover was trying to get copies of the, uh, the logs, uh, that he had either before that time or uh, contemporaneously with this time, he had told the, uh, the Washington field office people to destroy all of the other logs. So it ended up that there was one set of logs and related memorandum that were in the custody of Sullivan. And there was some removal of these per someone's instructions, and I don't have all these details because Sullivan didn't give them to me, uh, and give them to Mardian. And Mardian had possession of them, apparently, at the time he went to the West Coast to get instructions as to what he was to do with them. Mr. Dean, let me be very clear here so we try to put this story together. You, you are informed earlier... As I say, in 72, by Mr. Marty, and that he has in his possession the logs of the Kissinger Taps. Is that correct? That is correct. No, yeah. not that he has them, that he had that turned them over. That he, 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 had he received them, them, and he had turned them over to Mr. Ehrlich. That's right. And then in 1973, in an interview with Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan indicates to you that, in fact, the taps were accomplished by the Washington field office of the FBI, that uh, they had a set of the logs and the taps. He had a set of the logs and taps. Or the logs and the summaries. I beg your pardon, yes. the logs and the summaries. That, that uh, Sullivan had them? No, mm -hmm. Sullivan told me that he had turned them over to Mardian. Now, one of the other, at the time that I, the Time Magazine inquiry came in, uh, there was also an effort to determine how this had leaked, and that was one of the, that was very much a part of the conversation I had with Sullivan as to how this could leak. And I recall discussing with Sullivan also who else knew about this, and he told me that he thought that Hoover had told, and he mentioned the name of the person, and I cannot recall it at this time, uh, and this person, in turn, had mentioned it, he understood, to Governor Rockefeller, and Governor Rockefeller had, in turn, told Dr. Kissinger. Uh, also, in dealing with, with Mr. Felt, I'd ask him if he had any idea how it had leaked, because there was concern as to what the source of the story was, as well as uh, the like. Did Mr. Sullivan indicate to you that summaries of the logs had gone to several persons in the White House? When, when I was dealing with Sullivan, uh, he didn't seem to know the final disposition of the logs, and we didn't discuss whether the logs had gone over to the, the White House uh, at that time, during the time that they were, the, the wiretaps were being taken. Mr. Dean, uh I'm not talking about the final disposition of the logs and the summaries, but rather where the summaries of the logs went to at the time that they were being done. No, sir, Sullivan did not tell me where they had gone to the best out. I have no recollection of that, and I think I would have remembered it. Let me be very careful on this point. He indicated to you that, number one, according to the testimony that you set down here, the best of your recollection, that Mr. Hoover disapproved of these particular set of taps. Is that correct? That is the impression I had. Uh, I had been told some time before, uh, after Mr. Mardian left the uh, Department of Justice and went to the reelection committee, that something had to be done for Bill Sullivan. Now, he always worked on an assumption that I knew that Sullivan had done some very important thing for the White House. I was never clear on exactly what it was that Mr. Sullivan had done that the White House uh, owed him some favor for. But I can recall on repeated occasions this coming up, and also it came up with respect to a man by the name of Mr. Brennan, who was with the FBI. I w was somewhat on the periphery of this and was never quite clear and. Uh, the best I can do now is I'm just trying to put together the tidbits of knowledge that I did have. 
Well, you interviewed Mr. Sullivan yourself as to I did, his indeed. involvement in the Kissinger Tap situation. Yes, I did. And I just want to make sure that uh, as to as to what it is that uh, I think if if you were talk were to talk to Mr. Sullivan, that he would recall I was most interested in how it had leaked, because Mr. Felt had told me, in fact, it had happened. Uh, I was, of course, aware of the the uh, the taps occurring because of the information that Martian had given me, and I don't recall exactly when Martian had told me this. Um, but I was really collecting a whole series of tidbits of information. Uh, as much information that the White House did come to me was through tidbits. My immediate focus at the time I was dealing with Sullivan was how in the world we were going to deal with the story that was in Time magazine. And after I collected the information I was able to collect as to who did know, I called Ehrlichman and told him the facts, and he said, deny it. Did he tell you who prepared the summaries of the logs? No, sir, he did not. Did Mr. Sullivan um, indicate to move away from the Kissinger Taps? I, I, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, one point that I'd like to make clear here is that I've had a rather lengthy discussion uh, with Mr. Sullivan uh, on the subject matter which is being discussed here now. Uh, I don't think it would be uh, fair for me to state what the substance of that conversation was. I'd much prefer to have it from Mr. Sullivan, and I would hope that uh, uh, very close into when we are through with this particular witness, we will give Mr. Sullivan the opportunity to uh, explain his particular role in this matter. The uh, talk with Mr. Sullivan or in your contacts with him, was he ever requested to prepare a memorandum uh, relative to uh, FBI involvement in, uh, with other uh, uh, presidents insofar as the political aspects were concerned? Yes, he was. As I mentioned that in my statement, uh, when I had mentioned to the president the fact I had met with Mr. Sullivan and he had alluded to uh, other activities by the FBI over the preceding years, uh, the president was very interested and asked me to obtain the information from Mr. Sullivan. And on several times, I asked Mr. Sullivan if he could put this into documentary form. He said he could. Uh, he himself uh, typed out a memorandum that contained uh, his best recollections of some of the political uses that had been made of the, uh, of the FBI by preceding administrations. Uh, that was originally one of my submissions to the uh, committee, and it is, it's a classified document by Mr. Sullivan himself, who told me it was going to have to be declassified before it could be turned over, but by, putting, by the reference to it in my statement, I meant to call it to the attention of the committee, and, it's, and the committee is certainly welcome to have that document. All right. Is there any is there any other use that you made uh, or the White House made uh, of the FBI uh, on matters such as that that come to your that, that come to your recollection now? I can recall again after the fact getting involved in a situation that involved a FBI investigation that was made of uh, Mr. Daniel Shore and. Uh, when I learned about that after the fact, I was told that uh, what had happened is that uh, Mr. Higby, had, who was Mr. Haldeman's assistant, had received a request from Mr. Haldeman when he was traveling with the president to direct the FBI to do an investigation of Mr. Shore. Uh, Mr. Hoover uh, proceeded with the investigation, but to the dismay of, of uh, the White House, uh, he did a sort of a full field, wide open investigation. And this became very apparent. So this put the White House in a, in a rather scrambling position to explain what had happened. Uh, the long and short of the explanation was that Mr. Malik, who at the time knew nothing about this, uh, said that uh, Mr. Shore was being considered for a post and that this was a part of a preliminary investigation uh, in consideration of Mr. Shore for a uh, presidential appointment, and I believe in the environmental field. All right. Any other instances that you recollect as to the use of the FBI by the White House in, along these lines? 
<clears throat> let me let me be let me give you a, a broad yes. range. You just might mark these down so that we don't have to go over each one. And this type of situation uh, that either involved the FBI or the Internal Revenue Service, CIA, military intelligence, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Secret Service. Well, let me start from the bottom of the list back. Uh, I'm, I do recall, and I mentioned in my statement, a, a rather broad reference to the fact that uh, intelligence came from surprising sources sometimes. At one point, uh, one of the top officials at the, at the Secret Service brought me a small intelligence printout regarding Senator McGovern and just left it with me and said, I thought this might be of interest to you. Uh, it had to do with Mr. Mc Senator McGovern attending a fundraising uh, function, I believe, in Philadelphia. And apparently there were, some, there were some references in the intelligence statement to the fact that uh, either communist money or communist, former communist supporters were going to attend the fundraiser. Uh, I took the document to Mr. Colson. I said, are you interested in this? I assume it was given to me not to, uh, to bury in my files. And, but I said, I don't think you can reveal the source of the information. He said, I'm very interested in it. He took it and later told me he had made arrangements to have it published. Now, with regard to ATF, Mr. Caulfield was at uh, ATF after he left the... Uh, the, uh, the White House and going by way of the re-election committee and from time to time he would send over tidbits of information regarding individuals. Uh, uh, some of this might be reflected in my file because I cannot recall ever doing anything with this information other than filing it. Uh, the CIA, I don't recall myself receiving anything that we might call politically embarrassing information from the CIA about any individual. Uh, the memorandum I received from the CIA were, were straight uh, classified documents regarding the activities of some anti-war demonstrators or people uh, uh, traveling to Hanoi and things of this nature. Also, uh, foreign funding of uh, domestic radical groups and things of this nature, which I would forward generally to uh, Dr. Kissinger or General Haig. Uh, with regard to uh, the FBI, I've mentioned that IRS, uh, I think that you will find in either uh, Exhibit 5 or possibly maybe 6 uh, reference to some use of the Internal Revenue Service. And uh, requesting information uh, or dealing with situations with regard to the Internal Revenue Service. I'm also aware of the fact that after an article was published on Mr. Rebozo, I got instructions that uh, one of the authors of that article uh, uh, should have some problems. I didn't know how to deal directly with the situation. I discussed it with Mr. Caulfield. I was reluctant to call Mr. Walters, who was the head of the uh, Internal Revenue Service, and suggest uh, that he do anything about this. Mr. Caulfield apparently had friends in the Internal Revenue Service, and I believe he told me he was able to accomplish an audit on the individual. What the consequence of the audit was, I don't know. Who is the individual? I do not recall for certain. It was one of the, I think it was one of the Newsday persons who worked on a rather extensive article on Mr. Rebozo. All right. Are there any other instances that, of which you have first-hand knowledge in this in this? As I say, if I were to, to go, if I were to spend uh, a week or so in my files, I could probably uh, chapter and verse everything that had come to my office in this regard. But I, uh, I'm trying to come off the top and and tell you what I, I can recall off the top. I would hope, I would hope, uh, Mr. Dean, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that uh, Mr. Dean would do just that to uh, refresh his recollection as to whether there is anything further that uh, he has been unable to come uh, forth with at well, this I, time. It, the White House is, has made an arrangement whereby I can go to my files, but I must say it's a rather awkward arrangement. Uh, there are some five... Uh, 
file cabinets that are all safes and there is no desk in the room to work and I must work under the supervision of, an, of a Secret Service agent and there's no place to sit down uh, with any comfort and write so it's a little difficult to get in there and, and do anything and hopefully if I were to do that we could make arrangements so I could get in and, and uh, spend the time that would be necessary to go through the files. Now, Mr. Chairman, the other thing is, is yes. of course, I have to do this all by handwriting because I'm not allowed to make any copies of anything in my files. I see. Then just to briefly review, and this will end my questioning, and I, I apologize to the committee for taking so much time, because it's a subject that I confess I don't have every last bit of information on, and it's a difficult one to piece together. But I think it's a very important part of the story to be told. And I think it's become clear here this afternoon that another step has been taken, another step further along the road from the testimony which Mr. McCord gave, whereupon he was receiving information from the Internal Security Division, to the next step where, at least insofar as the structure of the plan of 1970, which plan included bugging, burglarizing, mail covers, breaking and entering and the like, insofar as the, the uh, mechanics or the, uh, the administration uh, was concerned that the first step uh, was taken. Uh, and also that uh, even though that particular unit uh, did not involve itself in any illegal activity, certainly the security arms of the United States government uh, were, uh, in various instances which you've recited, uh, utilized uh, uh, for purposes uh, not intended. Uh, would that be a fair summation of what we're talking about here? Well, uh I'm not quite sure of the end of your summation there. I wonder if you could repeat that you said security arms were used. That's for correct. Even though the IEC, even though the IEC itself did not engage in any uh, illegal activities, uh, uh, do you consider the matters which you've spoken of, whether it be an FBI investigation of an individual or an IRS audit, do you consider that to be uh, legal and proper activities by those security arms? Well, as I say, I don't know of the IEC itself preparing political I material. Uh, I do, of course, know, and as I have submitted in documents, uh, other agencies were involved in seeking politically embarrassing information on individuals who were thought to be enemies of the White House. I might also add that uh, in my possession is a rather uh, very much down the lines of what you're talking about is a memorandum that was requested by me to prepare a means to attack the enemies of the White House. Uh, there was also maintained what was called an enemies list, which was rather extensive and continually being updated. I'm, I'm not going to ask uh, who was on it. Huh? <laughs> I'm afraid you might answer. Uh, uh, I wonder, uh, does the, are these documents that are in the possession of the, uh, of the committee? Uh, no, but I'd be happy to submit them to the committee. They didn't uh, uh, fit within the uh, request that I had with counsel as to the documents he wished to have produced. But if the committee does wish them, I'll be happy to submit yeah, them. Mr. Chairman, I think the committee would like very much to have a copy of that memorandum. All right, sir. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Dean, you mentioned uh, in yesterday's testimony about the uh, briefings that were being given to Mr. Ziegler prior to his making public statements with respect to this situation involving uh, the break-in at Watergate. <coughs> Now, will you please give me a little more information as to the intensity or the extent of these briefings? I think that the intensity would depend upon the subject matter at a given point in time. Uh, the one I have pointed out was the October 10th uh, situation when the Segretti story began breaking. Uh, I was not always present when Mr. Ziegler was being prepared but was often asked questions by him on how to handle a given question or, or the like. When stories started leaking uh, in various areas, it was at that point in time I was particularly asked, uh, uh, what can we expect next? Uh, at one point in time, I recall that when Mr. Baldwin's testimony 
uh, was printed in the L.A. Times, I read the uh, FBI interview of Mr. Baldwin to see if, in fact, everything that he had told the Times had yet been printed, and we talked about that. Uh, often, Mr. Moore was present when I was with Mr. Ziegler and preparing him for his, his morning briefing. Uh, often, he would check with Mr. Uh, Haldeman if the story related directly to him, or uh, frequently with Mr. Ehrlichman. Mr. Dean, I'm referring specifically to the briefings that Mr. Ziegler received with respect to uh, the responses which he made about White House involvement in the Watergate affair. Well, as I say, the, the, uh, I believe I cataloged many of those in my statement. Now, some of those occurred before Mr. Ziegler and I had even talked about the matter. But who uh, would ordinarily brief him? Would it be Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Ehrlichman, or who would approve his statements? It would be Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, or the President. I noticed that uh, the President also made some statements. Who briefed the President prior to his making these statements with respect to inquiries about the Watergate and the White House involvement? What would happen, or what occurs before a presidential uh, press conference is a briefing book is prepared, and a number of people contribute to that briefing book as to uh, anticipated questions. The people who are familiar with the press and the anticipated questions the press might ask will send around to various members of the staff suggested questions and ask for their suggested answers. Uh, these often go to several people. Uh, oftentimes, the Watergate questions would come to me. Uh, Oftentimes, they would come to Dick Moore as well. And each person, in fact, Dick Moore and I would often sit down and work them out together and then take them to Mr. Buchanan, uh, who was compiling this briefing book. Would you say that you participated in most of the briefings where the president made uh, positive statements about uh, the Watergate affair? I would say I either contributed to the briefing book or I later, when I began meeting with the president in March, had direct conversations with him when he asked me about a reaction to a particular question. And now let's go into the statements made by the President. I have copies here. On August 29, 1972, the President made this statement, and I quote, In addition to that, within our own staff, under my direction, counsel to the President, Mr. Dean, has conducted a complete investigation of all leads which might involve any present members of the White House staff or anybody in the government. I can say categorically that his investigation indicates that no one in the White House staff, no one in this administration presently employed, was involved in this very bizarre incident. Now, did you participate in that? No, sir, not at all. I was totally unaware of it and uh, do not know who did prepare that for the president. Was the president telling the truth when he made that statement? Well, as I said in my statement yesterday, I would have counseled the president against the statement, uh, and I cited the reasons I would have counseled the president against the statement because of the knowledge I had as to the fact that documents have been destroyed uh, that were incriminating to Mr. Haldeman, the fact that uh, I had suspicions about other people's involvement. Uh, as I said yesterday also, if that were to be a, a literal statement as to somebody being involved in the very particular incident which occurred on June 17th, which the way it reads does not indicate that, but if it orig originally was designed to do that, that would have been a true statement. Otherwise, I think it was a little broad. Now, on, on October 5th, 1972, the President made this statement. Shall we, uh, are we in recess? Yes, please. All right, uh, I'll come back. All right, sir.
as Senator Montoya is shifting the questioning from domestic intelligence back to the president's role, the committee is broken for a floor vote. In a moment, he will resume his examination of former White House counsel John Dean. Public television's coverage of the Watergate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. As we go back now, Senator Montoya is asking how the president got his information on Watergate. Senator, you might proceed with interrogation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dean, now I ask you about the press conference of October 5th, 1972, held by the President. And I quote from his uh, press conference as follows. Incidentally, I conducted the investigation of the his case. I know that is a very unpopular subject to raise in some quarters, but I conducted it. It was successful. The FBI did a magnificent job, but that investigation involving the security of this country was basically a Sunday school exercise compared to the amount of effort that was put into this, meaning the Watergate. I agreed with the amount of effort that was put into it. I wanted every lead carried out to the end because I wanted to be sure that no member of the White House staff and no man or woman in a position of major responsibility in the Committee for Re-Election had anything to do with this kind of reprehensible activity. Now, would you say that the President was correct in, in making those statements at that time? I can say this, Senator. I certainly did not brief him uh, or prepare anything for the briefing book that would uh, uh, have led him to make that statement. Uh, and I can also say that uh, once the indictments were handed down, uh, it became the what I would have to call the PR technique of the White House to say that, well, everybody in the White House is clean. And this was repeated by Mr. Ziegler and in turn used by the president. Well, would you agree with his appraisal that uh his job in his case was a Sunday school exercise compared with this effort? Well, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with his effort. Uh, 
it's true that the FBI investigation was extensive, but it obviously was not complete. Now, on March 2nd, 1973, the President made another statement. I will simply say with regard to the Watergate case that what I have said previously, that the investigation conducted by Mr. Dean, the White House counsel, in which, incidentally, he had ac access to the FBI records on this particular matter, because I directed him to conduct this investigation, indicates that no one in the White House staff at the time he conducted the investigation, that was last July and August, was involved or had knowledge of the Watergate matter. Now, is that a correct statement? As I, uh, as I testified yesterday, that came up, I believe, in my meeting uh, preceding his press conference. Did you say that, the, that was March 17th, the date on that? On March the 2nd, 1973. March, correct. On March the 1st, when I met with him, uh, he was very annoyed at the fact that Gray was making comments about uh, Dean sitting in on the FBI investigations and things of this nature were coming up. Uh, it was his assessment that there was nothing wrong with this. He told me that. Uh, these were thoughts that he himself uh, raised, and as I testified yesterday, I told him I did not feel, or I did not feel at the time he was raising this, that I could tell him that he couldn't use my name further for the Dean, so-called Dean report. Uh, I was quite aware of the fact that he must be aware of the fact that uh, I had not conducted such an investigation for him because he'd never received a report from me on it. All right, now, on April 17th, 1973, the President said this, I condemn any attempts to cover up in this case, no matter who is involved. Do you believe he was telling the truth on that date? No, sir. Will you state why? Well, because by that time, he knew the full implications of the case, and uh, Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman uh, were certainly still on the staff at that point in time, and there was considerable resistance to their departure from the staff. Uh, I had told the President that I would not leave the staff unless they resigned, yet it was not until the 30th that those resignations occurred. Now, on April 30th, he made this statement. We must maintain the integrity of the White House, and that integrity must be real, not transparent. There can be no whitewash at the White House. Is that a correct statement? Well, I'd like to make this comment regarding the April 30th speech. Uh, as I testified yesterday, after I issued my statement uh, that I would not be a scapegoat, I had virtually no contact with members of the staff. However, I did have occasion to talk to Len Garman. And when the President went off to Camp David to prepare his, his major address, which is the one you're referring to, I told Mr. Garman, uh, I said, I have no way to get this message through to the President at this point in time. However, I'd ask you one thing, Len. I said, would you please tell the President, in your own words, to do not give a cosmetic speech. And I asked him, that if he would do what he could to get the president to lay out the facts as the president could have laid them out at that time. Do you know whether he followed through on that? He did not follow through on that. Mm -hmm. Now, on, April, on May the 22nd, 1973, the president made this statement. With regard to the specific allegations that have been made, I can and do state categorically, one, I had no prior knowledge of the Watergate operation. I took no part in, nor was I aware of, any subsequent efforts that may have been made to cover up Watergate. Three, at no time did I authorize any offer of executive clemency for the Watergate defendants nor did I know of any such offer. Four, I did not know until the time of my own investigation of any effort to provide the Watergate defendants with funds. Five, 
At no time did I attempt, or did I authorize others to attempt, to implicate the CIA in the Watergate matter. Six, it was not until the time of my own investigation that I learned of the break-in in the office of Mr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist, and I specifically authorized the furnishing of this information to Judge Byrne. Seven, I neither authorized nor encouraged subordinates to engage in illegal or improper campaign tactics. Now, will you respond as to the correctness of this particular statement by the President? In its totality or point by point? Uh, point by point, if you can, or you might uh, start out by responding to it in totality. Well, in totality, I think that there are less than accurate statements in the uh, statement. Let me take it point by point. I do not know... I have no first-hand knowledge if the President had prior knowledge of the Watergate operation with regard to point one. I believe the President was aware of an effort to cover up the Watergate with regard to point two. All right, will you state the uh, particulars? As far as, as far as I know, the first time I had first-hand knowledge that he was aware of this was on September 15th. Uh, when I met with him shortly after the indictments. That was in, on September 15, 1972. That is correct. All right. Now, what specific knowledge did he have at that time? Well, what I, knowledge was imparted to him? As I have testified earlier, I was aware of the fact that Mr. Haldeman frequently took notes when I was reporting to him and would immediately leave from my reporting session to go to the president's office with these notes. Uh, there were occasions when, uh, before this date, when I would meet with him, when there would be a call from the president, and Mr. Holloman would indicate that Mr. Dean is, is uh, giving a report on information he has uh, and would delay until that report was completed. So I assumed that most of what I was reporting was being reported to the president. Uh, when he talked to me on the 15th, uh, it's very easy to tell uh, if you're talking on the same wavelength with a man. And there was certainly no doubt in my mind that we were talking on the same wavelength about the fact that it had been successful in keeping it out of the White House because the fact that it had been uh, held, the indictments had been held at the Liddy level and gone no higher. And certainly this statement was issued on May 22nd uh, of 1973 and on March 21st, uh, I certainly told the President everything I knew at that point in time. And also I would indicate that some of the conversations I had with him in February uh, again indicated that, uh, to me, that he understood what was happening. He had complimented me again on the first meeting on the 27th on my handling of the matter during the campaign. And uh, I can't imagine him complimenting me if he didn't understand what he was complimenting me on. Well, as a matter of fact, on February the 17th or 27th, 1973, the uh, president directed that uh, you report to him regarding all Watergate matters, did he not? That is correct. And who did he give these instructions to? He gave them directly to me. And did you relay them to Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman? No, he told me that I should not deal with Haldeman and Ehrlichman. He told, them, told me that the Watergate matter was consuming too much of their time and taking them away from their normal duties and that henceforth uh, I should report to him. I should put this in the cast this in the light of the fact that he'd been involved in a number of presidential decisions which are reflected in some of the agenda that I have submitted to the committee. And... Uh, uh, he saw very clearly that it was going to require a lot more of their time. Why would the president be so concerned about Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman spending so much time away from their normal duties on Watergate if uh, his people were not involved and he had no knowledge of any involvement on the part of his people or anyone in the White House? Well, sir, I happen to believe that he did have knowledge. And uh, would you say that because he had this knowledge, he was expressing concern about 
the time expended by Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Haldeman on this, uh, on this affair? I would think that uh, by that time I had earned my stripes, so to speak, as capable of handling the cover-up on my own and that I need, no longer needed to have uh, the daily reporting with Ehrlichman and Haldeman as to what I should do and how I should handle things. And that was the reason for the, uh, it, the request that I report directly to him and get guidance from him. In other words, it, it was your feeling, as we say in the West, that you had earned your spurs. Yes, sir. All right. Now, on September 15th... Uh, I, do you want me to complete the, the points on here? Yes, if you yes. will. I'm sorry. On number... Uh, number four. On point number four, uh, he indicated his own investigation started on the 21st. Uh, I had a conversation with the president on the 13th myself in which he mentioned the fact that he had talked to Colson and Ehrlichman regarding clemency for Mr. Hunt. And also, prior to that, I was aware of the fact that Mr. Colson told me in January, uh, January 4th or 5th, that he had talked to the president. Ehrlichman told me he had talked to the president, and that message was in turn relayed to Mr. Bittman and then relayed to Mr. Hunt. Uh, subsequent to that, on April 15th, the president again repeated the fact that he had talked to Mr. Uh, Colson about clemency for Mr. Hunt. So I don't think that is quite an accurate statement. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, you did relay some uh, information to, uh, uh, was it Caulfield, so that he could in turn relay such information to Mr. McCord about uh, clemency? That is correct. And when was this? That was in uh, roughly January 10th, as I recall the date was. And uh, did you not tell Mr. Caulfield at that time that uh, this promise of immunity was coming from somebody at a very high level at the White House? Yes, I did. But uh, Mr. Caulfield, when we talked about it specifically, and it was not at that time, uh, asked, he told me that he thought that the only thing that would turn Mr. McCord around was a direct request from the president and I told him that he could not do that because I had no such request from the president, although I did have the general assurance that clemency would be, since it had been given to Mr. Hunt, should also apply to others. What motivated you to tell Mr. Caulfield that he in turn tell Mr. McCord that the promise of immunity was coming from the very top at the White House? Because of Mr. Caulfield's concern that it would take a statement of that nature to... Uh, persuade Mr. McCord as to the authenticity and the sincerity of the offer of clemency. What authority did you have or what background uh, did you uh, muster in justification for making this statement to Mr. Caulfield? On the 5th, as I recall it was, of January, after Mr. Colson had talked with Mr. Bittman, he, kept, he called a meeting in Mr. Ehrlichman's office and reported how he had handled uh, the offer of clemency, the assurances of clemency, to Mr. Hunt. At that meeting, I said to Mr. Ehrlichman, I said, the word will get out to the others that this offer has been made, and do, can I assume that this also applies to the others? Uh, and he said, yes, of course you can. Uh, it was from that, and then when Mr. Mitchell asked me to uh, make sure that, that Mr. McCord had the same assurances, that I took my action. Well, did Mr. Mitchell indicate to you that he had assurances from the White House at the time? No, but he was quite aware of the fact that the assurances had been, had given, had been given from uh, the president uh, as a result of conversations that he'd had with me and with uh, Mr. O'Brien, who was aware of the procedure that had occurred. Now, how did Mr. O'Brien know about these assurances? Who had communicated these assurances to him? I had informed him of the procedure that had gone on, and he was aware of the fact that Colson had given assurances to Mr. Pittman, who in turn had given them to Mr. Hunt. And did Mr. Colson communicate these assurances also, or uh, uh, the content of these assurances to Mr. Mitchell so that he could in turn endorse what you were doing? Uh, I don't believe Mr. Colson talked to Mr. Mitchell at all about it, no, sir. Well, how, uh, uh, in other words, uh, Mr. Mitchell knew because he had heard from you 
that these assurances had been given. Is that, that, is that it? Correct. That is correct. Now, on point number five, uh, I don't know what happened in the first meeting that Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman had with Director Helms and General Walters. I was not given a specific report of what occurred at that meeting, so I cannot testify with any first hand on that. And uh, uh, I only know what I have, when in scanning the newspaper, some of the things I've subsequently learned about that. So I have no first hand knowledge on that. You didn't work on uh, the uh, arrangements to try to get CIA to come into the picture and uh, mollify the impact? This was subsequent to the uh, meeting that Haldeman and Ehrlichman had with the CIA when I first met with them, and I was doing this per Mr. Ehrlichman's instructions that he thought it was a very good thing that I explore with the CIA if they would provide some assistance. Now, on point number seven, or, or excuse me, on point number six, I... Uh, I made some references, as I recall, uh, to this with the president uh, uh, in, in a meeting in March, but my only knowledge of presidential knowledge in there is hearsay, and that is what Mr. Krogh told me in a meeting in my office on either the 28th or 29th of March of this year, in, when, in which we were talking about the fact that this matter might come out I told him about the documents that I had been unable to retrieve from the Department of Justice, and I'd ask him, knowing that Mr. Krogh, I didn't believe, would do anything like this without higher authorization, whether Mr. Ehrlichman had authorized it. He told me, no, he hadn't, that his instructions had come right out of the Oval Office. I was startled by the comment, and I said to him, you've got to be kidding, and he repeated the same comment to me again. So I don't know about the, I say I only have hearsay knowledge of, of that matter as to whether that is a correct or incorrect statement. Now what about number seven? Number seven is as follows. I neither authorize nor encourage subordinates to engage in illegal or improper campaign tactics. I have no first-hand knowledge of that at all. I only know about what I testified with regard to Mr. Segretti, uh, that the fact that, that was authorized by Mr. Haldeman, and in turn funded by Mr. Kambach. Now let us go into Mr. Ziegler's uh, press statements. On June the 20th, 1972, he made this statement which appeared in the Washington Post. He told reporters in Florida who were with the president that he would not comment on a third-rate burglary attempt. Now, would you agree with me that that was not a third-rate burglary attempt? I would agree it was not a third-rate burglary attempt, and I have no idea what the source of this story was. How would you characterize the Watergate burglary? <laughs> that's a very, very, that's probably the most difficult question that's been asked yet. Uh, <laughs> I would, uh, I guess I'd have to say that it was probably the opening act of one of America's great tragedies. Well, you answered it very well. Now, on October 17th, 1972, uh, Mr. Ziegler's statement appeared in the New York Times. He told reporters as follows. It goes without saying that this administration does not condone sabotage or espionage or the surveillance of individuals or source stories that make broad, sweeping charges about the character of individuals. He also said, and I quote, I am not going to comment on stories based on hearsay or where innuendo or character assassination is involved. I am not going to dignify that with a comment. End of quotes. Now, would you say that uh, the administration was engaged in uh, 
techniques such as were condemned in this statement by Mr. Ziegler at the time and uh, during the campaign of 1972? I would say that these things did occur. I would also say, as I believe I mentioned in either an earlier question uh, with Mr. Thompson, that the degree of Mr. Ziegler's briefing varied. Uh, at times, he was told enough that he could handle the story. I also believe I testified that I thought it would take me probably another 200 pages of testimony to explain all those briefings. I have not had an opportunity to go back through all of Ziegler's briefings to determine, for example, I, I could spot very easily which briefing I helped him on and which I didn't. Uh, but I haven't done that, Senator. Well, then, uh, do I understand you to say that... Uh, there are briefing papers for every press conference by Mr. Ziegler and for every press conference by the President available at the White House? Yes, sir. Every time Mr. Ziegler gives a briefing, it is recorded uh, in, uh, by, a, by a court reporter type situation, and that is kept in record form. And those are distributed to various members of the White House staff, but again, uh, I have not had access to, to get back to these. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask uh, you and counsel to subpoena these briefings, the briefing papers, so that uh, they'll be, become available to this committee. Yes, uh, Senator Mentora, we are in the process of getting them. Uh, and did you also state that uh, the President received news summaries periodically? Uh, with respect to commentaries about him from the news media or other media? Uh, the president received a daily news summary that was composed of basically the wire service stories from the preceding evening. I don't know what time the cutoff was, generally about 12 or 1 o'clock at night, and then it was produced so it would be on his desk in the morning summarizing all of the preceding day's news. Are these also filed in the archives of the White House? Uh, yes, they are. I might make a comment with regard to those, that uh, the, the news summaries were really a, uh, a source of a lot of ac action uh, by White House staff. When the president read the news summaries, he would make notations on the news summaries, and in turn, those would be transcribed into action memorandum for various members of the staff to follow up on. The, reading the news summary would prompt the president to take certain action. And uh, these are, of course, kept in the, in the possession of the White House. I would like to make a similar request with respect to these new summaries, Mr. Chairman. Oh. Now, the, uh, going back to Mr. Ziegler, on October 16, 1972, a statement appeared in the New York Times on October 17. The statement uh, reads as follows. The opposition has been making charges which have not been substantiated. Would you say that uh, this is correct? I think that probably at that time they had not been substantiated, no. So it uh, probably is correct. On October 25th, 1972, another statement by Mr. Ziegler appeared in the Washington Post, where he termed uh, the reports, the Post reports, quote, a blatant effort of, at character assassination that I do not think has been witnessed in the political process in some time. Yes. Uh, what was the date on that, please? Uh, a, uh, October the 25th, 1972. Uh, we'll just have to go and vote. Fine. Senator Montoya apparently wants to compare John Dean's testimony, President Nixon's remarks, and documents the President was receiving about the Watergate. The committee recessed at this point for another...
Mr. Thompson that the degree of Mr. Ziegler's briefing varied. Uh, at times, he was told enough that he could handle the story. I also believe I testified that I thought it would take me probably another 200 pages of testimony to explain all those briefings. I have not had an opportunity to go back through all of Ziegler's briefings to determine, for example, I, I could spot very easily which briefing I helped him on and which I didn't. Uh, but I haven't done that, Senator. Well, then, uh, do I understand you to say that uh, there are briefing papers for every press conference by Mr. Ziegler and for every press conference by the President available at the White House? Yes, sir. Every time Mr. Ziegler gives a briefing, it is recorded uh, in, uh, by, a, by a court reporter type situation, and that is kept in record form, and those are distributed to various members of the White House staff, but again, uh, I have not had access to, to get back to these. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask uh, you and counsel to subpoena these briefings, the briefing papers, so that uh, they'll be, become available to this committee. Yes, uh, Senator Montoya, we are in the process of getting them. Uh, and did you also state that uh, the President received news summaries periodically? Uh, with respect to commentaries about him from the news media or other media? Uh, the President received a daily news summary that was composed of basically the wire service stories from the preceding evening. I don't know what time the cutoff was, generally about 12 or 1 o'clock at night, and then it was produced so it would be on his desk in the morning summarizing all of the preceding day's news. Are these also filed in the archives of the White House? Uh, yes, they are. I might make a comment with regard to those, that uh, the, the news summaries were really a, uh, a source of a lot of ac action uh, by White House staff. When the President read the news summaries, he would make notations on the news summaries, and in turn those would be transcribed into action memorandum for various members of the staff to follow up on. The, reading the news summary would prompt the President to take certain action. And uh, these are, of course, kept in the, in the possession of the White House. I would like to make a similar request with respect to these new summaries, Mr. Chairman. Oh. Now, the, uh, going back to Mr. Ziegler, on October 16, 1972, a statement appeared in the New York Times on October 17. The statement uh, reads as follows. The opposition has been making charges which have not been substantiated. Would you say that uh, this is correct? I think that probably at that time they had not been substantiated, no. So it uh, probably is correct. On October 25th, 1972, another statement by Mr. Ziegler appeared in the Washington Post, where he termed uh, the reports, the Post reports, quote, a blatant effort of, at character assassination that I do not think has been witnessed in the political process in some time. Yes. Uh, what was the date on that, please? Uh, eight, uh, October the 25th, 1972. Uh, we'll just have to go and vote. Fine. Senator Montoya apparently wants to compare John Dean's testimony, President Nixon's remarks, and documents the President was receiving about the Watergate. The committee recessed at this point for another vote on the Senate floor. Public television's complete coverage of Watergate hearings continues after station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. New Mexico Senator Joseph Montoya now continues his question to former presidential counsel John Dean. Before the little recess, uh, I was reading you and uh, a quotation from a press statement delivered by Mr. Ziegler, which appeared in the Post, to the effect that uh, he reported and termed a blatant effort at character assassination that I do not think has been witnessed in the political process in some time, referring to uh, the uh, Washington Post reports. Now, what do you have? What comment do you have to say about that? What uh, do you think about that? Senator, it's hard for me to... What was the date on that again? That was October 25th, 1972. It's hard for me to relate to specifically which story he was referring to. This was about the time that, the, as I recall, the Segretti stories were, were evolving. It started on October 10th. Uh, finally, it reached the point of directly tying in Mr. Haldeman on source stories, and I can only assume that this is the... The, uh, the, the, the reaction? The, to the reaction to that story, yes. On April 18, 1973, uh, in the Washington Post appeared this statement. Mr. Ziegler met with reporters and said that all previous White House statements about the bugging were inoperative. Ziegler emphasized the president's statement today is the operative statement. Now, can you tell us what motivated Mr. Ziegler to uh, make this statement? What transpired prior to the making of this statement at the White House, if you know? Well, I believe what transpired, uh, as you compare that statement to the chronology of my testimony, you'll see that that was the weekend that the Attorney General and Mr. Peterson reported to the President uh, the direction that the grand jury was headed in and the fact that uh, I had been to the prosecutors had been revealed and the fact that I had told the prosecutors the involvement of others in this matter, including those at the White House. Uh, it was as a result of that and the President's statement of the 17th, when he went out to explain and further elaborate on the president's statement that he made the inoperative uh, comment. Then let us get back to Mr. Mitchell, <clears throat> by whom you uh, felt a uh, father-son relationship, and perhaps justifiably so. Uh, what uh, were the reasons for you going to Mr. Mitchell's office at the time that uh, Mr. Liddy first presented his plan, and then subsequently on February the 4th, when uh, there was a scaling down of the initial plan? Who sent you there, and what was your mission? Well, I was called by, there was a meeting called by Mr. Magruder, my secretary informed me of the fact that the meeting had been scheduled. I didn't know the substance of the meeting, so I called Mr. Magruder to ask him what the substance of the meeting was going to be, and he told me that Mr. Liddy was going to present his intelligence plan at that point. Well, did you have any instructions from Mr. Ehrlichman or uh, Mr. Haldeman to attend those meetings? Well, very early on, uh, the preceding year, it had been my role to make sure that the re-election committee had a capacity to deal with demonstrators. Uh, when I had first talked to Mr. Liddy about his job, I had explained that one of the responsibilities of his job would be to deal with demonstrators in the security system and particularly with regard to the convention. 
when he was interviewed by Mr. Mitchell on November 24th, I think you'll find in the exhibits a copy of the, uh, the agenda that Mr. Liddy prepared regarding his job. Therein you'll find a one-line and a rather lengthy agenda that he would have something to do with intelligence. And that was discussed at that meeting that he would prepare an intelligence plan for dealing with demonstrators. Subsequently, when he met, uh, when Mr. Liddy met with Mr. Uh, Magruder on December 8th, he also said that he would develop appropriate plans for dealing with demonstrators. So it was quite logical. I assume that Magruder felt that given the fact that my, one of my White House responsibilities was to deal with demonstrators, demonstrators and be aware of demonstration intelligence, that I would be interested in seeing what Mr. Liddy's plan was. So I, in turn, was invited. Well, would you say that uh, your presence there was a follow-up of interest uh, emanating first from the initial memorandum that you sent Mr. Mitchell about uh, the uh, interagency group? No, sir. I wouldn't say there was any relationship between that memorandum and, and the Liddy meeting at all. Now, at that uh, initial meeting, I understand from your testimony, Mr. Liddy discussed uh, possible targets and mentioned the uh, DNC, Democratic National Headquarters, the Fontainebleau Hotel, and uh, Mr. Larry O'Brien. Now, in what context uh, were th these three targets mentioned? Well, as I said, I cannot recall for certain whether targets were discussed at the first meeting or the second meeting. Uh, I, have a, I am not able to separate uh, the meetings as to that discussion. I know that I arrived very late at the second meeting, and I was only there a, a very brief while before I injected myself into the meeting. Well, I, I don't think that's relevant because the dates are too close. No. But in what context, when you heard it, uh, were these uh, targets uh, discussed? For political intelligence. And uh, was a possible break-in into the Democratic headquarters discussed at that time? Not a break-in, just that these would be targets for political intelligence. Well, uh, wouldn't you assume that uh, that would involve a break-in or I filtering, that, yes, or sir, filtering I, of documents? Yes, sir, I think that's true. I uh, uh, was aware of the fact that frequently a campaign technique was used to put friendly people... Uh, to one cause in the campaign headquarters of another. Uh, it wasn't all spelled out at that point in time, other than the fact these would be targets for political intelligence. Well, wouldn't you say that this was uh, coming very close to a discussion of uh, what later became known as Watergate? I would, yes. All right. Now, you indicated that uh, Mr. Mitchell and the President met frequently to discuss campaign plans. Where did they meet? I only have that on hearsay, Senator. Uh, it was just one of those things that was rumored that Mr. Mitchell and the President and Mr. Haldeman and sometimes Mr. Connolly and the like would get together in the evening and discuss general tactics. I think uh, everybody in the country knows that they met. I know. It, it's, uh, I have no specific knowledge. I never attended any of the meetings. But you knew about it. That's right. Now, do you know whether, whether or not the president met with the Mitchells at their home? I have no idea, Senator. Uh, do you know whether or not Mrs. Mitchell was ever present at any of these meetings, be they at, Mrs., at the Mitchells' home, at the White House, or uh, Key Biscayne, or San Clemente? Uh, I believe she did accompany the Attorney General, but I could not tell you uh, with any specificity that she attended any of the meetings with the President uh, when the Attorney General was having these discussions with the President. I'm very concerned, uh, Mr. Dean, about the uh, truth that might come out of these hearings and uh, whether or not uh, your uh, credibility will be sustained by uh, uh, the American people, or whether or not the president will be sustained or tarnished. And that's why I'm asking you these specific questions about uh, the 
reliability of press statements by the President, by Mr. Siegler, and uh, by statements that you've made in your testimony of yesterday. Now, I just might add that uh, I have one ally only, and that's the truth as I know it, and I can speak it, and I realize the implications when I talk about the President, uh, but my one ally is the truth. Now, I have uh, read press comments, and uh, I have become fully cognizant of different efforts which have been made to discredit your testimony before this committee in recent days, one of which was the release of information dealing with uh, your obtaining $4,800 from the cash fund. The other was the leaking out by sources unknown with respect to an allegation in the report that you had applied in concert with others for a television license while you were working for a law firm. Now, this has been uh, rebutted this morning, and uh, I will not go into the authenticity of this. But did it ever occur to you that uh, you had gone through a complete checkup before you were employed by the Department of Justice, and before you were employed by the White House, and that this information necessarily had to turn in your folder or dossier collected by the FBI, and that you had to either explain it or the dossier explained whatever allegation was made with respect to the TV license per se. I'm well aware of that because when I was first interviewed by Mr. Haldeman, uh, he had a copy of my FBI report from the Justice Department, and I gathered from his review of the FBI report that this material was in the FBI report. Uh, he asked me for some comments on it. I told him about the fact that I thought it involved more personalities than anything else, that I had been prepared to take it to an ethics committee at the time, that I'd had a lawyer friend who had been at the firm at the time check it out, uh, that I had been operating on the advice of a very senior and distinguished member of the communications bar, and that I thought it was really matter, a matter of personalities more than, than facts, and that I had not pursued the matter because it had been retracted later, and I was satisfied with that. So this was reviewed, and this uh, obviously was investigated by the FBI before I went to the Justice Department originally, and then subsequently to the, uh, to the White House. So apparently this was picked out of context and uh, released by someone. Do you have any conjecture about that? I didn't understand your question, Senator. So apparently the uh, allegation that uh, you had... Uh, applied for a TV license in conjunction with others while you were uh, employed in a law firm that was handling almost a similar application, uh, you apparently, uh, uh, this allegation was apparently picked out of context from your file by someone. That is correct. I understand that uh, it was leaked by someone to a member of the press and in turn reported in the... Who do you think leaked it? What is your opinion? Well, that would be highly speculative. At that point in time, uh, uh, I don't know. I've heard of subsequent efforts to discredit me and uh, a rather concerted attack to discredit me. Have you felt that they were serious efforts? Well, I'm quite aware of the fact that there are a number of investigators that have been privately retained to uh, visit friends, visit stores I deal with. Uh, it's run the gamut. Uh, places where I bank, uh, every conceivable inch of my life has been gone over, Senator. Now, uh, t tell me more about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not about your life, but about the efforts made by the White House. <laughs> well, I, I have learned this from, from people who have said... Uh, who've called to try to get verification on stories and the like. Uh, I can tell you the absurdity of some of the stories. For example, I borrowed a friend's car, a friend of my wife's, uh, one of her girlfriends. 
I drove that car for several days. Uh, my wife went off to Florida with some friends of hers for a couple of days. The next thing that was on the rumor mill was that I had left my wife and was living with some beautiful foreign woman. Uh, that went around for a while. It wasn't printed, but it's been gossiped. Uh, I've been charged with being afraid to... Pardon? I've been charged with being afraid to go to jail for reasons of homosexuality. Uh, that was attributed directly to one of my lawyers. Now, the story is absurd, but it's, again, a typical character assassination technique. Uh, there have been efforts to say that I received $100,000 uh, of missing campaign money. Uh, there is no truth to that whatsoever, and there's no conceivable way they'll ever substantiate a story like that. Uh, every neighbor has been probed. Uh, as I say, some of this has been press inquiry and quite legitimate press inquiry. Other of it has been by privately hired investigators. Now, how long did you know Mr. Liddy before he was hired by the committee to re-elect the president? I didn't know Mr. Liddy until I had, I may have met him once while I was at the Department of Justice at a rather large meeting uh, when I uh, was in the Deputy Attorney General's office. Uh, there was a program called Operation Intercept, which I was not directly involved in. It was a drug program, and I understand that Mr. Liddy was involved in that. And when I did meet him once at the White House, he had referred to the fact that I'd met him earlier. I don't recall that. The first time I ever talked to Mr. Liddy was in, uh, let's see, I guess it was late October when I began talking to Krogh about whether he was interested or not in uh, the, the general counsel position at the re-election committee. I was unaware of his activities for the, with the plumber's unit. I had uh, only known that he had been in a dispute with his employer at the uh, Treasury Department, Mr. Rossides, and there had been quite a fiery uh, exchange between the White House and the Treasury Department and the like for the White House intervening in this dispute and hiring Mr. Liddy and bringing him to the White House. And this I had gotten from Mr. Caulfield, who had friends in the Treasury Department. Now, when was the first time that you knew about Mr. Liddy and Mr. Hunt working together? I don't believe I really realized that until uh, after the break-in. It just it didn't occur to me that the fact they were both in the plumber's unit. I was unaware of the fact, for example, that Mr. Hunt spent most of his time as a consultant at the White House working for the plumbers. Now, I may have been told, uh, but it didn't, didn't uh, occur to me. I learned, I believe it was in... April or May of 1972, I'd heard the rumor about the break-in at the Ellsberg's uh, psychiatrist's office, and I'd heard that Hunt and Liddy had been involved in this. Uh, so it was much after the fact of their actual working together that I learned of the fact they had worked together. Well, had you seen them around the White House uh, talking together on or about uh, March or February of 1972? No, sir, I, I cannot say I did. Now, when uh, <clears throat> when you were uh, having discussions with Mr. Liddy at the CRP, uh, did he ever tell you about uh, his activities other than being chief counsel for the CRP? Well, as I recall our initial dealings after he went over there, uh, my responsibility with him was to get him very aware of the election laws. He had not had any experience in this area. I informed my staff that they should cooperate with him and assist him. Uh, I made my files available. We had a new election law to deal with, to interpret, to understand. Regulations were being issued by the uh, GAO, and we had a number of discussions on those. Uh, I also encouraged him because he frequently told me that there was more work than one man could, could handle to get himself some volunteer lawyers, and I suggested some names of lawyers who I thought might be of assistance to him. Well, I'm not speaking of his duties as chief counsel, 
Were you aware that he was performing other duties? I think that the, the only time I was aware, uh, I was unaware of his developing his plan. No, sir, and that's been always one of the great mysteries to me, is what happened from the time he went over there, uh, I guess it must have been December 10th, because as I recall, it was one or two days after Mr. Uh, Magruder had interviewed him that he went to work, what happened between December 10th and January 27th were my conception of what his responsibilities were and possibly his own or others' conception uh, dramatically changed. There was nothing in my conversations with him that indicated anything other than the fact that he was going to have a plan for dealing with uh, demonstrators and convention security. Well, uh, weren't you uh, <clears throat> kind of curious as to what had happened to the scale-down plan which involved the expenditure of $250,000 and which was discussed by Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Magruder, yourself, and Mr. Liddy? You mean between the meeting on the 27th and the 4th? Uh, February the, the 4th. Four, February the 4th. Well, when I, after the meeting on the 27th, I was frankly very surprised uh, given the precedent that had been followed before with Operation Sandwich, that Mr. Mitchell even reconsidered the matter, and I think that he expected when, when the meeting was reconvened that it was going to be something totally different than it was. And it was when I came in that meeting late, and it was the same type of discussion going on, that I interjected myself and terminated the meeting. When uh, were you first aware that the scaled-down plan had been approved by Mr. Mitchell? As I, I think I testified, I have never asked Mr. Mitchell directly whether he approved the plan or not. Mr. Magruder, yes, after June 19th, uh, when I was having conversations with Mr. Magruder, he indicated to me that Mr. Mitchell uh, had authorized the plan that he indicated also that, uh, that the White House was recipient of the information, and he indicated at that time that there had been pressure from the White House to get the plan moving. But I was, it, was never, it was never very clear as to exactly what had happened. Well, did uh, you have any conversations with Mr. Strawn, who was the emissary or liaison between the CRP and Mr. Haldeman or Ehrlichman? Uh, yes, that raises the point that came up in the questioning that Mr. Thompson was, was going through this morning. At one point, uh, Mr. Strawn called me and told me that Mr. Magruder and Mr. Liddy had had a serious falling out. Uh, I believe Mr. Magruder raised the fact with me that he just could not work with Liddy. Uh, Strawn got in the middle of it and called me, and he said, what should I do? And I said, I have no idea, but I would suggest now that Bob Mardian is over there, that there are personality problems and personnel problems, that Mr. Mardian handle it. And that was my recommendation to Mr. Strawn. And it was only later that I heard that he had been moved from the uh, re-election committee to the finance committee. Uh, have you become aware since the uh, break-in that uh, Mr. Magruder was uh, transmitting memoranda through Mr. Strawn to... Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Haldeman? Uh, not to Mr. Ehrlichman. I was aware uh, from a conversation I had with Mr. Strawn on the 19th that he had destroyed documents that indicated that he was transmitting this information back to the White House. And uh, why would uh, Mr. Haldeman destroy these documents if he, did, if he was not aware and still professes unawareness of anyone at the White House being involved in the Watergate uh, aff affair prior to June 17th? Well, as I think I've said before, Senator, publicly, it's inch by inch that the truth is coming out. And would you say that uh, in view of the uh, correlation of events, in view of uh, Mr. Strawn's missions between the CRP and Mr. Haldeman, in view of the admission by Mr. Jeb Magruder that he was uh, sending this memoranda to Mr. Haldeman as well as to Mr. Ehrlichman about uh, all these things, that Mr. Haldeman as well as Mr. Ehrlichman were fully aware 
of what Mr. Liddy's role was with respect to collecting intelligence and with respect to the possible plan of breaking into the DNC, the McGovern headquarters, or uh, the O'Brien suite at uh, Miami during the Democratic Convention. Um, you've brought a, that's a rather broad conclusion. Uh, but I would say this, that I think that anything that was transmitted to Mr. Strawn, Mr. Strawn was a very good, thorough, capable staff man. Anything of any import that came to his attention, he would regularly report to Mr. Haldeman. And I can only assume that material that came to Mr. Strawn was reported on to Mr. Haldeman. Well, I can only assume from your testimony and what has... Uh been adduced before this committee heretofore by other witnesses that Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman were very precise in the missions that they undertook and in exacting performance by those to whom they made assignments uh, of missions. Wouldn't you say that that's a correct statement? Yes, sir, I would. Uh, and in view of that, is it... Uh, uh, is it your supposition that there was no way that Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Ehrlichman could plead ignorance of any part of the involvement on the part of the CRP, Mr. Liddy, or any other personnel connected with the CRP in the uh, planning before the Watergate incident on the burglary at the Watergate? Well, I'd have to separate out for a moment Mr. Haldeman from Mr. Ehrlichman. Mr. Strawn reported directly to Mr. To, to Mr. Haldeman. He did not report to Mr. Ehrlichman. Uh, anything that Mr. Ehrlichman would know about this would have to have come from conversations with Mr. Haldeman. So I, would on, I can only say that under the reporting arrangement, that information that did come to Mr. Strawn, knowing Strawn being very thorough, particularly in information I reported to him, always seemed to get to Mr. Haldeman. Uh, that any major information that came to him was reported, but only can I say that if Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman had had conversations about it, would Mr. Ehrlichman know about this? They were very close, weren't they? They were good friends, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Would you say they uh, conversed uh, very warmly, very frankly with each other? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Then did you uh, call Mr. Caulfield in January of 1972, when you authorized him to uh, deliver a message to McCord, and did you ask him at that time to say to McCord, and I quote, a year is a long time. Your wife and family will be taken care of. You will be rehabilitated with employment when this is over, end of quote. Did you say that? Yes, I did. That is a result of a conversation in which uh, I, he was in the West Coast and I was in my office. I called him. He transcribed the gist of what I was saying, read it back to me later. That is virtually what it was that uh, uh, I said to him, and I told him, fine, and that's what he should report. Now, when you discussed the uh, cover-up with respect to Watergate, at San Clemente, did these meetings take place at the home of the president? No, sir. Uh, San Clemente is a general term for a situation where the president's residence is located at one place, and then right adjoining that, there is a compound of office space. Well, I mean the uh, compound. All right. The, the first meeting took place, the morning meeting on the, on the 10th, began in Mr. Ehrlichman's office. Uh, this is what I described as we were assessing the various members of this committee. Uh, it was from there we went to lunch. We had lunch at the uh, staff mess and we talked on. We then adjourned because not, nothing was happening. It was a very loose and floating meeting with generalities and there were interruptions because Mr. Haldeman had calls and Mr. Ehrlichman had calls. It wasn't until we went back down south to La Costa and met later 
in Mr. Haldeman's, and I think he was being shared by Mr. Ehrlichman, a, a large villa, a suite with rooms on each side. We met in the living room area, and there we discussed for, for many hours the situation, and we met there again the next day and discussed this matter for many days. Now, give me the, give me the dates of those meetings. They were on the 10th and the 11th of February. And uh, give me substan substantially the conversations that took place with respect to the cover-up. And uh, the individuals to whom you might ascribe these conversations. Well, the thrust of the, uh, the thrust of the conversations were after some general discussion there evolved theories on how to deal with this committee. Uh, in other words, that there would be a public posture of cooperation and privately we would make it as difficult as possible to get investigative materials and witnesses. Uh, there would be an effort to discredit the committee by painting it very partisan through a behind-the-scenes media effort. Uh, there was also discussion of how to, to make sure that there were raised uh, also the problems that the Democratic Party might have been engaged in, but at that point in time, there was nothing specific to raise. We were hoping to find things. In fact, at one point in the conversation, uh, it was suggested we hire private investigators. Mr. Haldeman suggested this. Uh, I raised the fact that this is more political surveillance, and that's the last thing in the world we need. Then uh, I think I tried to recount most of this in my testimony. I'll be happy to do it all again for you if you'd like me to. Do you know whether or not uh, since the uh, Watergate entry, uh, do you know whether or not the CRP, the White House, or anyone else under auspices of the uh, CRP uh, was hired to uh, conduct the gathering of more intelligence or invasions of, uh, or to engage in the invasions of the right of privacy of individuals? I only know of the fact that that's been done with regard to me, and I don't believe it's been done by those entities. Mm -hmm. It might be indirectly, but I have no first-hand knowledge of that. Do you know whether or not uh, <clears throat> there were any other buggings other than the ones which you have mentioned? or any eavesdropping through electronic devices? No, sir. I think I have mentioned those that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. In what respects did you discuss the possible uh, blocking or impeding of the Senate investigation at the White House? at any time? Well, as I say, as a result of the Lacosta meetings, uh, there were set in motion a host of follow-up activities. Uh, I think some of the agenda that you see in my submissions uh, for meetings indicate the thrust of things that were developing at the, uh, at the Lacosta meeting. I think most of that, in particular, some of those agenda are very self-explanatory as to the, the, the tactics and the, and the thoughts as to how to deal with the situation. Now, when you uh, informed uh, Liddy to get Hunt out of the country, who had instructed you to do this? This was... And what conversation actually took place prior to your informing Mr. Liddy to get Hunt out of the country. This, this occurred on Monday, the 19th of June in 1972. It was a late afternoon meeting in Mr. Ehrlichman's office with Mr. Colson. The uh, first question before the meeting got down to any, any substance was raised by Mr. Ehrlichman as to where Mr. Hunt was. He asked me, and I said I had no idea. He asked Mr. Colson, and Mr. Colson made a similar comment. I was then asked by Mr. Ehrlichman to call Mr. Liddy and tell Mr. Liddy to tell Mr. Hunt to get out of the country. I did that. It was a short time thereafter that I began to think about the wisdom of having made that call and re-raised it. 
there was a brief discussion between Ehrlichman and myself, and uh, finally Mr. Colson uh, entered the discussion, and he said he also thought it was a very unwise idea. Ehrlichman concurred. This all took place within about oh, a 15, 20-minute span, and I was asked to call Mr. Liddy back and retract the instruction. I did that. Uh, Liddy said to me he didn't know if it was possible because the message had already been passed, and I have no further knowledge of whether, in fact, uh, Hunt did leave the country or not as a result of that. When was the first uh, real meeting to organize the cover-up, and who was present at that first meeting? I think that the, the cover-up is somewhat uh, uh, similar to the, the, the planning of this whole thing. It just sort of happened. I know that when I came back uh, from out of the country, there had already been significant events which had occurred. The cover-up was already be had begun and was, in fact, uh, in place and was going. What information did you have with respect to the involvement of any officials in the White House on that initial stage of the cover-up? Well, it was on Monday the 19th that I was gaining information. Uh, I think the first, the first uh, very revealing information was that Mr. Strawn had destroyed files uh, at Mr. Uh, Holloman's suggestion. I also, in that, that morning, I'd had a call from Ehrlichman who asked me to find out what Mr. Colson's involvement was in this matter. Now, did you advise the president or Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Ehrlichman about the, the authority that might exist under law for the covert activity that was to ensue as a result of the organization of the plumbers? I wasn't involved in the establishment of the plumbers, uh, and it was somewhat by accident that I was talking with Bud Krogh who I'd known well and was partially responsible for my coming to the White House, as a matter of fact, uh, when I realized that a plumber's unit or whatever the, the proper name was for it was being established. At that time, he told me that uh, they had a, an operation that was seeking to determine major leaks. Uh, he invited me down to see the unit. He said, we have a, a new sensor security system and uh, you might be interested in seeing it. So I went down and looked at it and uh, saw their scrambler phone, and that was about the extent of it. Now, who, who devised the shelter of executive privilege as part of the cover-up? Well, the, uh, I wouldn't say that there was a, a, a conscious decision at any point in time to uh, use executive privilege as a part of the cover-up. It was always... Uh, in existence with regard to White House staff because no one, uh, uh, the President's policy was he didn't want the staff coming up. It began to take a very uh, severe focus during the, uh, first of all, during the Patman hearings, that if push had gotten to shove in those hearings, that privilege would have been declared on uh, Timmons and myself. You mean to tell me that you and Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman didn't discuss the use of executive privilege. Yes, sir. I, I was getting. I was getting to that. Uh, it was in. It was in. That was the first time it occurred when there was some discussion of it. That was with regard to the Patman hearings uh, in late September, early October. That was the only congressional uh, problem that arose. It was during the Gray hearings when my name moved to the forefront that we began discussing using or, or litigating with Dean the issue of executive privilege possibly being the strongest. And these were in discussions I had with the President, whereas if we were litigating the matter with Mr. Dean, uh, there would be no other witnesses from the White House who would have to appear because uh, uh, he'd have the perfect reason that uh, uh, this matter is under litigation. Five minutes to a vote. Senator Montoya has interrupted his questioning of John Dean as the committee takes a break for one more vote on the Senate floor. Public television's complete coverage of the Watergate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service.
From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. Democrat Joseph Montoya continues his interrogation of former White House counsel John Dean. Mr. Dean, I only have three or four questions to ask of you. I want to clear this matter up with respect to uh, Mr. Mitchell. On pages 200, 225 and 226 of your statement, you mentioned that uh, there was a move afoot at the White House to try to get Mr. Mitchell to accept the blame for the entire affair. Now, can you tell me who the prime mover uh, of this attempt was at the White House? It's very difficult for me to say who the prime mover was. At the time uh, this first was discussed was after I had reported to the President on the 21st uh, what I thought were the implications of this entire matter. And subsequently, I had a meeting with Haldeman and Ehrlichman, uh, and then another meeting with the President. It was early discussion. I recall one particular incident that occurred outside of the President's office before he went into a meeting in which I said that there are two options. One is that everything pre and post is going to have to be laid out, or secondly, the, the White House is going to have to surround itself with wagons and start protecting itself. And it was in subsequent discussions in, with the President when it was evolving that the, I was arguing that both pre and post had to be disclosed, but there was evolving the, the thought at that point in time uh, that if we merely deal with the pre-situation, that the post might go away. I didn't believe that. And it was really when uh, the presidential party came back from California that early discussions uh, of this concept had evolved into a firm policy. As I also mentioned, that there was a meeting on the 22nd where Mr. Mitchell came down. Uh, I had assumed at that time that Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Haldeman were going to do something uh, to try to bring Mr. Mitchell forward on this issue because of the earlier discussions that had been held. To the contrary, the discussion really revolved around, first of all, Mr. Ehrlichman asked, uh, uh, has the uh, hunt problem been taken care of, the demands that he was making? And Mr. Mitchell reported that didn't seem to be any problem. There were general discussions, again, about the uh, status of the uh, White House vis-a-vis -vis this committee on executive privilege. Went to a meeting that afternoon with the president, and it was a, a repeat of the same thing that uh, had occurred on several previous occasions. And so I really can't say in, uh, that policy evolved until after uh, they returned from California. I recall on the 13th... Didn't you indicate that uh, there, wa there had been some discussion in California about making Mr. Mitchell the full guy? Well, I don't know that. I wasn't in California. When on the, I'm aware of another situation where Mr. Colson uh, and Mr. Shapiro came to meet with uh, Mr. Ehrlichman and then possibly Mr. Haldeman. I wasn't present, but I did hear them both discussing it on the, on the afternoon of the 13th. Uh, in which Mr. Colson had laid out the theory that Mr. Mitchell should be uh, smoked out and this might resolve the whole problem. Did you hear any discussions uh, by Mr. Haldeman or Mr. Ehrlichman uh, with respect to the same thing? Uh, yes, I did. In fact, during that conversation, uh, uh, Mr. Ehrlichman was on the telephone with the president at, that, at one point in time, I recall, and it was... Uh, it had been planned that Mr. Mitchell would come down that Saturday, uh, Saturday who, who, the 14th. Who arranged for Mr. Mitchell to come down? I believe that Mr. Haldeman called him. I'm not sure of that, though. Now, in view of your strong feelings for Mr. Mitchell, 
Why didn't you apprise him of this move by the White House? I had already gone to the prosecutors by this time uh, and was in discussions with the prosecutors and was trying to uh, avoid any situation that, that would further involve me, but yet I wasn't revealing to, to Mr. Holloman and Mr. Ehrlichman that, in fact, I was having discussions with the government about the entire situation. And I, I, it occurred to me at one time when, when I learned that uh, Mr. O'Brien was going to California to meet with Mr. Ehrlichman uh, at a suggestion of Mr. Mitchell that he do so, uh, that, that this could well be a set-up situation. But I did not apprise him of it because I myself was dealing with the government and uh, uh, I had stopped the cover-up as far as I was concerned. I was no longer involved in it. Now, were you aware all throughout uh, your dealings with respect to this affair of the implications that uh, you might uh, be chargeable with a violation of law for obstructing justice? Yes, I was. I don't know when I first began to think about it, uh, but I did uh, certainly think about it from time to time, and I can call discussing it directly uh, after the election with Mr. Haldeman. We had a discussion about a written dean report. Uh, he asked me what would happen if all the facts were laid out. I told him what would happen, and I said that uh, I thought that ultimately a reconvened grand jury, which would occur if the facts were, were laid out, would end up in potential indictments of Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Dean. Well, uh, let me ask you this question. How do you expect us to resolve the truth in this matter when you state one story and you've testified here and made yourself subject to cross-examination and the president states another story and he does not appear before this committee. I'm not implying that he should. Now, how do you expect us to resolve this? Can well, you give us any information as to how we might resolve it? Mr. Chairman, I, I think this. I strongly believe that the truth always emerges. I don't know if it'll be during these hearings. I don't know if it'll be as a result of the further activities of the special prosecutor. I don't know if it'll be through the processes of history, but the truth will out someday. As far as any issue of fact, and I'm not suggesting this with the president, of any individual where I have a difference of opinion or a different statement of the fact with that individual, this has occurred once uh, in my early meetings with the prosecutors. I am quite willing to submit myself to a polygraph test on any issue of fact with any individual who says that what I'm saying is less than truthful. What uh, really made you uh, change and start coming up and coming out with the truth of this matter as you have related it? What motivated you? Well, I think that uh, it was after the first of the year uh, that I had serious reservations as to whether the cover-up could continue. Uh, I must say that from June 19th on, I've not had a very pleasant day in my life. This has been a haunting situation for me. Uh, as early as September, uh, when I began talking with my now wife about getting married, I told her that somewhere down the road, it's going to be a very rough situation because at that time I didn't explain it to her because I just realized that something like this could not go on indefinitely. And at one point, I reached the end of the line and just decided that I couldn't uh, uh, continue it. I just didn't have the, uh, the constitution internally to proceed with what was going on. And so I decided to start swimming the other way. Do you have a peace of mind now about what you've done? Yes, sir. And in disclosing everything that you knew, do you have a peace of mind and a clear conscience? Well, I'm not here as a sinner seeking a confessional. 
but I have been asked to be here to tell the truth, and I had always planned at any time before any forum, when asked, to tell the truth. Well, what I'm trying to ask you, do you feel better now that you've told everything rather than hiding it? Indeed, I do, sir. It's a very difficult thing to, to, uh, to hide, and as I explained to the president, uh, it would take perjury upon perjury upon perjury if, I, if, if that were to be perpetuated. I wasn't capable of doing that, and I knew that my day of being called was not far off. That's all. Thank you, sir. The committee will stand in recess till 10 o'clock tomorrow. Well, that ends the second day of John Dean. After a full day of questioning, the members of the Irvin Committee seem as undecided as before about how much credibility the former White House counsel deserves. Chief Counsel Sam Dash has already said that he's looking forward to his chance to question Dean a second time, and Senators Irvin and Baker are still awaiting their turns. John Dean will be with us at least another day, and there's at least a chance he will be the only Watergate witness of the week a possibility that would put still more pressure on the committee's plan to finish this round of hearings by the beginning of August. Stephen Hess, a former advisor to President Nixon, and John Kramer, criminal law expert who's on the law faculty at the Georgetown University Law School here in Washington, are with us now. Gentlemen, uh, it did get a little tedious there toward the end, but would you uh, characterize this as a completely lost day? What do you think, Mr. Kramer? No, I don't think it was completely lost, but I think it could be uh, sifted down to about half an hour of worthwhile news. I think we did learn three things from Mr. Dean's testimony today, three things that changed or shaded a little bit what he had said yesterday. First of all, he did change, it seemed to me, what he had indicated about the president's knowledge or knowledge of the matter. He said before that the president wasn't fully aware of the implications, and today he said what he meant was the human implications, what might happen to the members of the White House staff around him. But he did indicate that he was pretty certain that the president was aware of the legal implications of the cover-up. The second matter that he did clarify today was that Mr. Ziegler, apparently, from his point of view, had no complicity whatsoever in the cover-up. He was just told things and did not know that they were untrue. In fact, he said that at one time he requested permission to brief Ziegler and was denied that permission from uh, John Ehrlichman. Yes, Mr. Ehrlichman wouldn't let him do it. That's right. Wouldn't yeah. let him bring him in on the matter. And the third bit of news with respect to the cover-up itself was that Mr. Peterson, whom yesterday seemed to be involved in seven or eight incidents of helping the White House throughout the process, was again not involved, not in complicity, and was seen to be doing his job appropriately. And yet, as a result of yesterday's testimony, that uh, implication was left uh, about Henry Peterson, right, that he had been more than cooperative. But yes, it was I think corrected that today. Mr. Thompson's questioning today seemed to clear up Mr. Ziegler and Mr. Peterson or put them in a much better light than they had been at the end of yesterday. Now that it's, that it's over, Mr. Hess, what's your assessment? Well, my assessment is that rarely has something that is so potentially dramatic been so quickly turned into instant boredom as the testimony of John Dean at the hands of the Senate's Irvin Committee. Those statements of Mr. Dean that were ambiguous yesterday remain ambiguous today. In my opinion, Mr. Dean's credibility has not been affected one way or the other by today's flabby cross-examination. Dean's allegations have no more and no, or no less weight than they had when he made them yesterday. I think that Dean's charges are highly serious, and they deserve more careful and more persistent scrutiny than the Senate gave them today. And I have high hopes, given statements by Senator Baker and in a way, uh, that tomorrow will be a much more successful day uh, in the Senate chamber. Gentlemen, of course, yesterday when uh, Mr. Dean was reading his very long uh, statement, over 240 pages, uh, it seemed, uh, you know, it went on for a long, long time. But did you find yourself today to pick up on your point, Mr. Hess, wishing that they had started at page one and gone all the way back through to ask their questions so there would have been some continuity to, to the cross-examination, if that's what you'd call it? Well, I, I certainly did. Uh, I was thrown off by each senator going off in his own direction. Senator Weicker seemed to be on an interesting tangent, but a tangent nevertheless. Uh, and uh, I was interested, uh, particularly in the questioning of Senator uh, Montoya, as John Kramer has, has pointed out earlier, uh, at how it was set up, virtually set up, for Mr. Dean to give a verbatim transcript, 
cut up into little sections of what he said yesterday. It was an amazing performance of repeating word to word for word a written statement that he had yesterday given to the committee. Okay, of course, uh, it's not all over yet, and uh, we'll see what happens tomorrow when the rest of the uh, committee uh, does cross-examine uh, Mr. Dane. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. NPAC correspondent Peter Kay got a close look at those secret papers from John Dean's safe. Most of them are now part of the committee's record, but were not read publicly. After examining the documents, Peter filed this report. The celebrated Dean papers were released today, and they proved to be something of a fizzle. First of all, because the best of them had been published in the New York Times last June 7th. They were published, and they related to suggestions by Tom Houston, then a very uh, excitable young aide of John Dean's, that the FBI and other agencies be gathered into sort of a super intelligence gathering uh, agency that wiretapping, mail surveillance, undercover activities on campus and in the military be stepped up by the federal government on behalf of the White House, and also quite a diatribe by Mr. Houston against then FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. The rest of them, or at least the rest of the ones I saw, were really rather uh, anticlimactic. They involved things like airplane hijacking and various other items of domestic security that hardly, at least in my opinion, warranted the top secret stamp that had been placed upon them. All of this is probably interesting only in the context of questionings by Senator Weicker today and others involving FBI involvement, wiretapping of private citizens and all. Perhaps the most interesting comment was made here on Capitol Hill, away from the committee room, was made by Senator Edward Kennedy at a Judiciary Subcommittee meeting. What the senator said was, we cannot eliminate Watergate mentality from our government until we eliminate the atmosphere of secrecy on which it is fed and the specific tools of evasion and dissembling on which it relies. Without venturing an opinion of my own, I suspect this view will become increasingly popular. Robin? Thank you. Finally, a note which puzzles me personally in human terms. You are among millions of Americans watching these hearings by day or with us by night. And according to the letters you've written, you're fascinated, addicted, losing your sleep, or some even claim spoiling your sex lives. There is one individual we would expect to be even more curious than all the rest of us, even more fascinated to hang on every word, and that is the man at the center of the drama, Richard Nixon. Yet, if we're to believe the White House spokesman, the president has not had the curiosity even once to turn on his television to watch the hearings. Deputy Press Secretary Gerald Warren repeated that today and said Mr. Nixon hadn't even watched the summaries on news programs. Instead, he's content with written summaries. The president is at San Clemente and plans to stay there through July the 4th. He's said to be conducting business as usual. It strains human credulity a little to believe that he is so busy or so indifferent or so disciplined that he can resist the spectacle of his former employees spinning a web of evidence that each day draws closer to him. It is mind-boggling to be told that Mr. Nixon didn't even watch John Dean charge him, in effect, with systematically lying to the American people. It's another strange piece of evidence about the personality of this most inscrutable of politicians. For Jim Lehrer, Peter Kay, and our guests, I'm Robert McNeil. Good night for NPACT. From Washington, you've been watching gavel-to-gavel videotape coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. This coverage is made possible by grants for special events coverage from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Ford Foundation, and has been a production of NPACT, a division of the Greater Washington Educational Telecommunications Association. <laughs>